Who knows with that guy? Good morning. I'm Uriel Bowser. I'm calling to order uh, a markup for the Committee on Economic Development. Today is Thursday, May the 29th, 2014, and it's 1010, and we're located in room 120 in the John A. Wilson building. i like to recognize the presence of a quorum with Councilmember Kenyon McDuffie for Ward 5, Councilmember Jack Evans for Ward 2, um, and myself. Uh, we are here to consider PR-20-6. To nine, the 3825-29 Georgia Avenue Northwest Disposition Approval Resolution of 2014. I recognize that we have a full house, um, and that uh, this this bill um, will adjourn this markup and then immediately convene um, a hearing on several uh, bills before the Committee on Economic Development. Um, let me say uh, a couple of things about um, the 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 resolution before us. It was introduced by council member, uh, by council chairman Phil Mendelson at the request of the mayor and referred to the committee on economic development. The resolution would approve the disposition of real property located at 3825 and um, 3829 Georgia Avenue uh, to Donatelli Development to be developed into mixed income residential housing. This property was previously surplused um, in 2009. Uh, the terms, however, of the disposition between the district and developer were not executed before that authority expired. Therefore, we have renewed a disposition resolution uh, today. The property is estimated at 5,700 square feet and is currently a vacant parcel. The proposed development would result in 22,000 square feet of multifamily mixed income residential housing with an estimate of 30, 31 apartments, um, including off-street parking. The project includes an affordable housing component uh, with uh, several units reserved for family with incomes at or below 60% of the median income, that's three of the units, and four of the units reserved for families with incomes at or below 30% of the area median income. This proposed project does have some differences um, from the 2009 resolution. For example, the 2009 resolution plan called for 3,000 square feet of retail and 12 12 condominiums. 15% of those units were to be reserved for families at or below 60% of AMI and 15% for below 30% um, of AMI. Uh, thus, in, in the present resolution, the district would receive a greater total number of affordable units at both 30% and 60% AMI levels. Further upon completion of the proposed development, the district expects to receive annual property taxes in the amount of $52,000 and sales taxes in the amount of $55,000. The planned redevelopment of the property will allow the district to derive long-term tax revenue from the property in addition to the creation of new affordable units um, in, in D.C., particularly in Ward 4. For the above stated reasons the committee approves, uh, would uh, I, I would recommend that the committee approve the disposal of the property at 30, uh, 3825 and 29 Georgia Avenue. So with that, I would like to move the draft committee report and draft committee print for B for PR 20-629 with leave for staff to make technical and conforming amendments. And I would also like to recognize the presence of committee member and at-large council member Anita Bonds. Um, is there any discussion? Discussion? Um, discussion? Um, uh, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Um, so the committee will recommend a unanimous recommendation to the full council uh, to approve this uh, disposition. Um, is there any further business before the committee? Comments? Questions? Um, so hearing none, uh, we will adjourn um, this committee markup at 10.15.
Good morning. I'm Muriel Bowser. I am calling to order uh, a hearing of the Committee on Economic Development uh, to review several bills um, in the committee uh, uh, regarding affordable housing. Uh, let me name, uh, t it is now 1017 and it's Thursday, May the 29th, and we're located in room tw 120 in the John A. Wilson building. The committee will hear public testimony and testimony from the government today regarding Bill 20-594, the disposition of district land for affordable housing, Bill 20-604, the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act of 2013, Bill 20-622, the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013, Bill 20-708, the Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Funding Act of 2014, and Bill 20 713 the District of Columbia Affordable Housing Act of 2014 um, let me uh, just briefly say uh, a couple of things um, that everybody assembled here recognizes as the challenges we face in the district um, the district faces a severe shortage of affordable housing units um, that we must address in order to close our wealth gap in homelessness and sustain a growing economy and a growing middle class. One in five district households, that's over 50,000 families, have a severe housing burden, uh, meaning that they spend more than 50% of their income on housing. We have a waiting list in the district for public housing of 70,000 people who want um, public housing assistance. We have 7,700 homeless families in the district, uh, which is up um, double digits from last year. The district um, has set a goal of creating 10,000 new affordable housing units by 2020, um, and we're well on our way to meeting that goal ahead of schedule, thanks to considerable funding increases in recent years for the Housing Production Trust Fund administered by DHCD. But that's just a start given uh, the needs uh, that we have in the district. More resources in the trust fund are, of course, critical, uh, which several of the bills before us addressed. The Council just passed a budget uh, for fiscal 2015, which will provide about $85 million in the trust fund, when the goal um, that we, we are considering today to commit to uh, in writing um, in the law would be $100 million per year. We also need to be more creative in addressing our housing challenges. Uh, my approach, of course, is that we, we focus on production, um, but we also focus on preservation, um, and we continue to stay focused on how we empower more district residents with uh, quality education, job training, um, and sustainable employment that will allow them um, to afford um, the, the housing costs in the District of Columbia. So some of the legislation we are considering today um, will uh, will focus on, on each of those areas. Let me say something about um, Bill 20-5. The disposition of district land for affordable housing. It establishes affordable housing set aside requirements when district owned land is being disposed of for development of multifamily residential projects with 10 or more units. I'm pleased to co-introduce this legislation uh, with Council Member Kenya McDuffie. Um, it, uh, the set aside would be a 30% affordable housing um, requirement for projects that qualify as transit orient developments and a 20% set aside for all of the projects. Affordability is defined as 25% set aside for households earning 30% of the area median income and 75% of the units earning up to 50% of the median income. For ownership units, affordability is defined as a set aside of 50% of the units for households at 50% of AMI and 50% of units for households at 80% AMI. The legislation would allow the mayor to waive set aside requirements when the CFO certifies that it would not be feasible for the project. 
The next bill, 20-604, the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act of 2013, uh, would reduce the resale restriction time periods for which affordable units located in distressed neighborhoods and produced with district government subsidies from the Housing Production Trust Fund must remain affordable from 15 years, which is the status quo, to five years. It also requires affordable housing subsidies to be repaid to the Housing Production Trust Fund at the time an affordable unit is sold. Um, Council Member Anita Bonds um, introduced this bill. Bill 20-622, the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013. Um, would establish a rental housing assistance program for low-income senior citizens to be administered by the D.C. Housing Authority, and it would appropriate $5 million annually to fund the program. To be eligible, the senior citizen must be a D.C. resident at least 62 years of age, earn no more than twenty-two to $37,000 per year for a one-person household, or up to $37,000 per year for a two-person household. And finally, the senior must pay no more, must pay more than 35% of his or her income in housing cost. This bill was introduced by council member, was authored by council member Tommy Wells, and I believe introduced by council member McDuffie as well. The Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Funding Act of 2014, Bill 20-708, will amend Title 42 of the District of Columbia Official Code to require that the Housing Production Trust Fund be funded at a minimum of $100 million on an annual basis. And I was um, pleased to author this bill. Bill 20-713, the District of Columbia Affordable Housing Act of 2014, uh, would develop a 10 year $1 billion affordable housing plan that provides for $100 million per year to increase, build, and modernize affordable housing with $25 million per year allocated to targeted populations, um, including seniors and the homeless. The bill would authorize the issuance of bonds with lottery revenue to finance the re reconstruction, renovation, and emergency maintenance of affordable housing facilities. So those are the, the bills before us. Um, in we have many witnesses signed up to testify. I have 63 um, people um, on the list. And once we hear from those um, public witnesses, we will hear from the government. And the government will be represented by Victor Hoskins, who's a deputy mayor for planning and economic Deve development, Jeffrey Barnett um, from the CFO's office, and John Ross from the CFO's office. Um, the practice of the committee is to recognize all members of the council with a priority, of course, uh, afforded to members uh, of the committee. Um, each member of the committee will um, be recognized for an opening round and also for um, to, to ask any questions of the witnesses. So i first like to turn to, in, in the order of their appearance today, um, Council Member Kenya McDuffie um, from Ward 5 for an opening statement, and we'll recognize you for three minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I won't take up the entire three minutes. Hopefully, I want to keep it brief. I know we have a lot of witnesses uh, who have come down today to testify, and we really appreciate you all taking the time to do so. I want to just thank you, Madam Chair, for holding a hearing on these really important bills and take this opportunity just to, to highlight, again, the importance of Bill 20-594, the Disposition of District Land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013, which requires affordable housing set aside to whenever district-owned land is disposed of uh, and developed as private multifamily residential buildings of 10 units or more. I, I won't go into the details because you did a good job of covering that in your opening, uh, Madam Chair. I do want to say, though, that I think that most of the people in this room today would agree that the district is becoming an increasingly unaffordable place to live, uh, with housing costs rising faster than wages over the past decade, with one in five D.C. households who spend more than half uh, their income on housing, uh, which is considered a severe housing burden. Nearly all renters with the severe housing cost burden earn less than half of the area median income. Uh, the need for affordable housing has never been more extreme, and we must utilize all the tools at our disposal uh, to create and preserve affordable units in the district. Uh, I've only been in the council for about two years, and I think we've made some great strides. We've made significant investments in affordable housing uh, during my tenure on the council. Uh, but with this bill, I think that 
Uh, we have a real opportunity to build on the city's investment in affordable housing by dedicating a portion of our publicly sold land to develop uh, additional affordable housing units. So I'm really pleased that we're having this hearing today. I'm really pleased that we have a packed hearing room, and I look forward to hearing a lot of the testimony from people who I've worked with uh, on a number of measures in affordable housing uh, that I've introduced over the last couple of years. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Council Member Bonds. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chairman, um, for holding this hearing. And thanks to everyone who came out this morning to discuss the efforts to provide affordable housing um, across the city in a more um, gen generous way. Um, the benefits of owning your own home um, need to be mentioned, I think because it provides a sense of belonging, stability, security, and it helps residents to build assets. Moreover, the Housing Production uh, Trust Fund is widely acknowledged by housing advocates as the premier program to make ownership a reality for low and middle income working families. I just want to highlight a little bit about one of the bills that was mentioned or will be discussed and you will of course provide us with testimony on um, this morning and that was my proposal bill number 2604 the ownership preservation equity accumulation um, amendment act um, and that is really designed one to help the Housing Production Trust Fund work better for residents of neighborhoods that have been left by the wayside in the housing boom. To encourage development in those areas that need it most and to ensure long-term solvency. One of the things that we have found is that in developing distressed areas, you can see that um, from the developer's perspective, we've been told that they find it most risky to invest in those neighborhoods. However, we're in and through this bill attempting to remove that um, issue and give individuals an opportunity to have ownership in those neighborhoods and to have developers invest in those neighborhoods um, with everyone getting a return um, sooner as opposed to later. And that is why we have attempting to remove the 15-year restriction and move it to uh, five years. We felt it necessary to provide an incentive to build and purchase in these areas and decreasing the resale restrictions to five years in distressed neighborhoods we feel is one of the best ways to do that. Secondly, having met with many residents, I know that it is very, very important for a family to feel that they can move forward and not be in one place for 15 years. In fact, you could have a child three years old and still be in the same place, um, restricted to the same place really, uh, same residence when the child is actually um, leaving, um, leaving school. Um, so that is one of the main reasons that we thought it was important to look at how monies can be spent from the trust fund to provide ownership opportunities in distressed neighborhoods. And we want to build up our distressed neighborhoods um, as quickly as possible. So the part of the bill that has gotten considerably less coverage, I guess, is really that we understand that the production fund is not an unlimited resource. And it helps, we feel that this bill will help in um, utilizing that money a little faster so that more people across the city will have an opportunity to um, home ownership. And further, sellers who are unable to turn a profit upon sale of the house are exempt from repaying the subsidy. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we hope we'll be able to do in this bill. Um, the goal being to give more people an opportunity to home ownership where they can build equity and that they can see a return on their dollar and at the same time to make sure that we increase the supply of affordable housing across the city. So that is one of the goals. Um, just, just so um, you know, I am the co-introducer of, of three of the other bills, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. 
thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your testimony. Um, we have some tough issues before us um, as we try to figure out how we can increase the um, supply of affordable housing. And we think ownership is one of the best ways. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Bond. So l let me uh, turn to our first uh, panel of witnesses. The committee will recognize uh, public witnesses for three minutes. Uh, I would just ask everybody to kind of review your written testimony. Um, usually you can get through reading it if it's a page, a page and a half. If it's five pages, you won't have enough time. Um, and so I'm going to ask um, that, that we be mindful of the clock so everybody will have the opportunity um, to speak. And I will ask you to stop um, at three minutes. Um, so with that, Adrian Buena Vista, Aaron Courier, Rob P Pentangolo, And if you have written um, testimony, it is helpful to the committee, and I just ask you to share it with my clerk, who will get it up to the members of the council. Okay, Ms. Buena Vista. Okay, I'll hear from you now. Uh, good morning, Council Member Bowser and members of the committee. My name is Adrian Buena Vista. My name is Adrian Buena Vista, and I'm a staff attorney and board chair fellow at the Legal Council for the Elderly. I'm not sure if you're on, Adrian. If you're, if the light is green, I'm just going to ask you to maybe to raise the microphone and lean into it a little bit more. Okay. I st um, let's check and see if we've got you on. Is it How's green? that? That's better. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Adrienne Buena Vista, and I'm a staff attorney and board chart fellow at Legal Counsel for the Elderly at AARP. Legal Counsel for the Elderly provides free legal services to low-income seniors in D.C. I work in the Alternatives Project, which combines social work, legal, and volunteer coordination to help prevent eviction of D.C. seniors. There are a number of pieces of housing legislation before you today, and I'll focus my testimony on 2622, the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013. LCE fully supports this bill. As you well know, in the coming decades, the number and proportion of aging adults will increase dramatically. The aging population presents many challenges, including where seniors will live as they age while retaining as much independence as possible. For elderly renters, housing issues are particularly serious as many of them are forced to live on fa small fixed incomes. For many seniors, their only source of income is Social Security, and with the average amount of Social Security being $1,1294 per month, that makes the uh, fair, market housing, or fair market rent for a one-bedroom apartment in D.C. at $1,239 per month very hard to afford. This means that for many seniors, rent depletes money that would be available for other necessities such as health care costs, transportation, and food. At LCE, the Alternatives Project is often contacted by seniors facing eviction because their rent exceeds their income. A few months ago, one of my clients, who I'll call, I'll call her Miss Smith, um, she was sued by her housing provider for unpaid rent. She had lived in her apartment for over 30 years, but when she was re forced to retire a couple years ago, paying rent became impossible. Her income was only $720 per month in SSI, but her rent was over $800 per month. By the time I met Ms. Smith, she was over $7,000 behind in her rent. Unfortunately, Ms. Smith's situation isn't unique. The Alternatives Project sees many seniors who do not have stable housing. I see clients who reluctantly live with family members, clients who rent room in subpar boarding houses, and clients who couch hop at friends' apartments all because they can't afford to rent their own unit. Washington, D.C. has some housing options for seniors with limited financial resources. However, these affordable options are insufficient and demand surpasses supply. The waitlist for subsidized housing can be decades, especially since the closure of D.C. Housing Authority's waitlist. Given the need for affordable senior housing, LCE supports Bill 2622. The increased availability of affordable housing will enable more seniors to remain independent for as long as possible 
and delay or eliminate the need for Medicaid funded care in a facility such as a nursing home. Thank you for supporting affordable housing by promising by uh, proposing the Senior Rental Housing Assistance Program. Low income seniors are the most vulnerable of our population and they need your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Courier. Chairman Bowser and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. My name is Erin Courier and I oversee the Pew Charitable Trust's work on economic mobility and financial security. Our research shows a mixed picture of what drives Americans up the economic ladder and what propels them down. And today, what I'd like to do is talk about two interrelated factors, post-secondary education and home ownership. Post-secondary education is extremely powerful. It promotes upward economic mobility from the bottom and protects against downward mobility from the top and the middle. College graduates are five times more likely to leave the bottom of the income ladder than non-graduates. However, many young people from the bottom and middle of the income ladder never enroll in some form of post-secondary education or do not graduate if they do. There are two primary explanations at the individual level for why this occurs, the ability to afford college and academic preparation. The two drivers are not mutually exclusive. Families who have less money to send their children to college also have fewer resources to invest in pre-college education. But in a time of rising college costs and increased financial hardship, it's, under, it's important to understand how family wealth, independent of un other factors, affects students' decisions about higher education. Pew released research investigating this question using the recent housing boom and bust as a natural experiment. Housing is the primary source of wealth for most low and middle income families, so changes in home equity have a significant influence on total family assets. Additionally, the housing boom occurred at different locations across the country at different times, providing an opportunity to explore whether changes in family wealth, as represented by gains in home equity, affected college decisions. The research found that low and middle income students whose families experienced increases in housing wealth just before reaching college age were more likely to attend college, more likely to attend four year colleges, and more likely to graduate. In fact, the wealth generated by rising home values increased college enrollment by 24% among low and middle income youth during the housing boom. For every $10,000 in home equity gains, the likelihood of enrolling in college increased by six percentage points among families making less than $70,000 annually. An increased housing wealth raised the likelihood of college graduation by 9%. Notably, there's little evidence that wealth gains affected college enrollment among families with incomes of $70,000 or more, or that they affected families of any income in earlier decades when housing equity was less liquid. These results demonstrate that financial constraints play a significant role in college enrollment and completion. And because home equity is the main source of wealth for many of these families, this research has important implications for housing policy. There's additional information and reports included in folders I provided to you on the relationship between housing wealth and higher education. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I hope this research is helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Pizzangolo. Good morning. My name is Rob Tinglo, and I'm a researcher at the Urban Institute. The Urban Institute is a nonprofit research organization dedicated to providing evidence to inform and elevate the debate on social and economic policy. The views I'm presenting this morning, however, are my own. They do not represent the views of the Urban Institute. I appreciate the opportunity to provide this testimony highlighting data and research conducted by my colleagues on shared equity home ownership. The debate over affordable housing in Washington often leads to the question about how to balance affordability with asset and wealth building. We have conducted considerable research on this topic and demonstrated that there are trade-offs that uh, while there are trade-offs between the two it is possible to achieve a solution that enables both home ownership is critical to wealth creation for low and middle income families home equity represents most of low income households wealth while appreciation on the value of the home is helpful it is too often forgotten that the most important way that homeowners build equity is not through appreciation but by paying down their mortgage this form of forced savings allows low-income families to accumulate assets more efficiently than through other vehicles like retirement accounts and investment accounts. Preserving the affordability of homes is vital as well. In a world of financial constraint, it becomes critical to ensure that public subsidies are spent wisely and equitably. As well as, ho as home prices in D.C. continue to rise, building new affordable housing without sufficiently preserving the subsidy invested means we're falling further and further behind and needing to invest more and more subsidy for each home. 
Empirical evidence has shown that homes with long-term affordability preservations can indeed efficiently balance goals of asset building and long-term affordability. Our study was one of the first of its kind and examined shared equity programs with long-term affordability restrictions across the country to observe the outcome for home buyers. Of the seven programs we examined, upon resale buyers earned an average internal rate of return of 26% each and every year they owned their unit. This calculation only measures the return from appreciation. Savings gained through paying down their mortgage is another sizable gain. The returns under these equity restrictions were so sizable that they exceeded, in almost all cases, the returns available had the same person invested their down payment in the stock or bond market. Of course, were there no equity restrictions, these home buyers could have earned even greater returns, but the affordability component would have been lost. In a scenario like this, another round of public subsidy would have been needed to make the home affordable again. Of the seven programs we studied, the returns vary depending in part on what resale formula the program adopted. The program could adopt a formula more generous to the first buyer, supporting the wealth creation goal, or more generous um, subsidy to the, the second buyer, supporting the affordability preservation goal. Either way, the point is that the resale formulas can be flexible and can achieve the desired balance between wealth creation and affordability preservation. In no circumstances is it necessary to simply have the restrictions expire in order to promote wealth creation as is being proposed. Instead, if the goal is more wealth creation, the resale formula can be adjusted. In sum, then, our research has shown that it is not the case that long-term equity restrictions mean that wealth creation is not possible. Participants in long-term equity restriction programs we studied still earn sizable returns. I appreciate your consideration of this research, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your testimony. Um, I'm going to go on a three-minute clock. And um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So let me let me start with you, Ms. Buena Vista, um, on the, the senior renters program, HAPIS, which I, I know that the authors refer to the program as. Um, the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors would be a new program um, to help seniors that don't typically qualify for other affordable housing programs. Would you do characterize it as that? It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in your view, from working with your clients, what um, would be the most practical way to implement something like that? One. Two, do you have any idea um, about the demand? And I'll start with the demand. Okay. Um, um, in terms of the demand, every every client who walks in our door would actually probably fall into the, the category. Most of our clients don't receive subsidies. Some do have public housing, some do have vouchers, but many don't. Um, so for us, the demand is high. In terms of implementation, um, a lot of our, our clients resp respond well to um, I'm not sure if I'm on. A lot of our clients respond well to um, senior residences using like some of the um, some of the 202 programs or where the housing would be sort of in in one one space. Um, and then other people prefer vouchers. Okay. So you know, currently we there there are local rent supplement programs that the the housing authority administers for us. There are proposals to, um, and the housing authority would go through their list, and as I understand that they have a sub-list, uh, or a list within a list of only seniors. Um, and so those are people who would have gone and say, sign me up for, um, for housing. Um, in what I will tell you, we've had these conversations, and what uh, I'm considering is if there's a way to carve out um, a, a portion of, of those subsidies um, that would um, that would meet these criteria. So we'll we'll be interested to to talk a little bit more about that specifically. Are you saying carving out using the list that DCHA already has to try to pull people from that? Well, it would be a list. It has to obviously yeah. have to be a list because I think we estimated that the five million dollars um, that is contemplated in this bill could help up to six hundred families or six hundred seniors. And, and you know, I, I I'm sorry, we, I can't be heard in here. We can't. Okay, I'm right. I'm, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get this fixed. Okay, is that a little bit better? Yes. Yeah. It's not dramatically better though. Um, well, no. This is a lot of us here, and if we cut it off, you're not going to like it in here very much. Uh, so we'll we'll monitor it. Okay, we're going to monitor the air. Um, I can take a vote. 
I know we don't want that. Are you under a vent? I'm gonna sit and come right here and get a little warm. Here. Okay. All right. Well, we'll try to monitor it. It is a it is a balance when we when the room is full um, that everybody can be comfortable. Um, so, and if there is a vent in an area where there is an event, uh, that that might be a good place. Okay. Um, so. Those are my, my questions. I'll come back. I do have a question for you, but I'm, I'm over time. Um, let me turn to Council Member McDuffie. Um, I, I don't have any questions for the panel. I want to thank them for their testimony. Um, I guess I will probably take a little bit more time to look at the research that you all provided, Mr. Uh, Patingalo Durbin Institute. I know you were sort of trying to stay within your time limit and you kind of rushed through it, but I was heard a couple of nuggets in there that I wanted to probably review. Um, uh, when I get a little bit more time. I am interested in what Councilmember Bowser was discussing with you, Mr. Ms. Uh, Buenavista, about some of the other programs that currently exist in the city. Um, and I guess trying to figure out whether or not there's a way to uh, address the needs with that population of seniors through those existing programs or whether or not we need to pass this legislation to address what obviously is a, is a, a real concern. Uh, I know for a number of residents in Ward 5 because I work with uh, some of them uh, along with Councilman Wells' office when we crafted this. So I'd be interested to hear your perspective and discuss this with the chair of the committee going forward. So thank you for your testimony. Response. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to um, just explore a little more of this um, unsubsidized um, voucher program that we were proposing for seniors. Just wondered if, um, can you give me some indication of the number of clients that you see and uh, whether or not the majority have a status of needing housing or, or just what? Um, so, so I don't have the number that Alternatives Project sees in a year, but I know I personally deal with about 50, 50 per year clients. Um, most of my clients are on the wait list for the voucher program or on the wait list for public housing, and limited numbers actually are receiving those subsidies. Like they're still waiting on the wait list, and um, like one one client. She came in and she said, I'll be dead before I get to the top of the list. She's been on it for 10 plus years. So I think using the framework that DCHA already has in place, and I like the idea of potentially drawing off of that list and putting them in a special sort of program using this funding, I think that using the existing framework is key. Yeah. I, I was just wondering because it seems to me that one of the things that uh, would be useful is to have an indication as to how many people are in the universe that are in in need of housing that are our elderly population so that we can be a little more responsive mm -hmm. um, because the wait list of 70,000 um, tends to be more families than um, um, in, individuals or at least that's the that's the impression we have from 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 years and um, of course we're going through that list now to uh, do some updating yeah. Um, but I don't know what what we'll find. We'll probably find out that people who were uh, 50 when they got on the list are now 65 or something like that. I don't know. I'm I'm happy to go through LCE's stats and figure out maybe what the percents are. Um, I'm also I'm a little curious if maybe DCHA has the numbers of of the seniors that are on the list, and I and I don't know that. Um, yeah. But I'm I'm more than happy to look at LCE. Okay. I, I, well, I was just curious. I, mm -hmm. I would appreciate yeah. hearing back from you on that sure. if you could. Thank yeah. you Thank very you. much. And Ms. Courier, um, I am um, very um, intrigued by this equation that you have given us this morning. I, I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly that housing source is a source of wealth, but low-income residents usually have low education attainment and have few opportunities for ownership. I mean, that's what I gather from your testimony. Am I on target with that? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And I think that um, you, sir, were really pointing out the fact that um, ownership is a, um, there's an opportunity irrespective of how many years you have ownership, but for you to acquire some equity. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. And I'm happy to deliver that research to the council members. 
I would love to see that. Thank you. I would really love to see that. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. And please feel free to distribute um, some some of the, the specificity that your your testimony summarizes. Of course. Because I think that would be helpful. Of course. Um, helpful to us. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Angie Rogers, Cheryl Court, and Jenny Reed. Rogers. Okay. Yes. We'll hear from you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about uh, Bill 20-604, the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Act of 2013. My name is Angie Rogers and I am Principal of People's Consulting. Uh, we do research and policy on affordable housing uh, as well as help nonprofits build affordable housing in other community spaces. Uh, I'm also a co-convener of the DC Affordable Housing Alliance. Uh, first, let me say that I'm concerned about any bill that proposes to limit affordability, uh, particularly in the, in the district where we struggle to create and preserve that affordability. Um, I think this is exactly what the uh, Bill 2604 does in lowering the affordability period in distressed areas from 15 to 5 years and in expanding the definition for distress so that it covers roughly a third of the city. I agree with my colleagues from the Affordable Housing Alliance and others that the bill should be amended chiefly to change the definition of distress so that it more closely defines neighborhoods that truly have a problem getting potential homeowners to buy in. The 20% of poverty definition captures neighborhoods like Columbia Heights and Bloomingdale where we do not think this is the case. That data also can be as much as five years old by the time we get access to it and as a result can miss neighborhoods that are beginning to transition into places where we need to protect affordability, not further limit it. I support using Office of Tax and Revenue data about sales price, appreciation, and volume that can be as little as a few months old by the time it is available in order to determine distress. I also want to address a number of things briefly that I think you might hear today during testimony about this bill, which I think are myths about long-term affordability and equity sharing. You might hear that any policies or programs that push long-term affordability and equity sharing do not allow low-income homeowners to build wealth or otherwise use their homes in the same way unsubsidized homeowners do, do not allow for programs that value wealth building at all, and stifle affordable homeownership development in different parts of D.C. None of these things are true. Owners in long-term and even permanently affordable homes get to build equity and use it when they refinance or sell. How much, it, how much of it depends on what the equity sharing ratio is. You might hear that subsidy recapture and first right of refusal mitigate any negative effects of shortening the affordability period. Because the 20% of poverty definition lowers affordability in areas of the city where home prices are known to escalate aggressively, the subsidy recapture when the homeowner sells at the end of five years will not be enough to make that home affordable to the next low-income buyer. That buyer will need additional subsidy, as will the original developer if they seek to exercise their first right of refusal to buy back into the property. I uh, submit the remainder of my testimony for the record. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you, and I have um, your testimony here, and I'll have some questions for you. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Reed. Okay. Chairperson Bowser, Councilmember McDuffie, and Councilmember Bonds, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jenny Reed, and I'm the Policy Director at the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. I'm going to testify on three of the bills, so I'm going to go really fast, but there's a lot more detail um, in my testimony that I've submitted. Um, first, I'd like to testify strongly in favor of the disposition of district land for Affordable Housing Act of 2014. By leveraging the value of our public land, D.C. can help create new affordable housing for both low and moderate income residents throughout the district. Furthermore, requiring affordable housing on public land will allow the district to use an off-budget asset to maximize affordable housing production. 
Such a tool is particularly important given the district's limited resources and ability to incur debt. It will also help preserve mixed income inclusive neighborhoods in DC and help ensure that a broad array of DC residents benefit from new development. Um, since you've already gone through the specifics of the bill, I just want to present an example of why I think this bill is so important. The district recently disposed of land at 5th and I Streets Northwest in the hot Mount Vernon Square neighborhood. Um, the, when the district put out the request for proposals, the land was valued at over $19 million, which DC could have leveraged into supporting a substantial number of low-cost housing units. However, the city awarded the um, land to a developer that offered to build 100 units of affordable housing, which is a substantial number, but in a neighborhood outside of Mount Vernon Square that's to be determined. This means that residents in need of affordable housing would not enjoy the benefits of the development occurring at Mount Vernon Square. That's not maximizing our public resources to achieve our goal of mixed income development and inclusive neighborhoods. And that's why we should set clear rules to ensure that all public land sales deliver a significant share of affordable housing, which is exactly what this bill would do. Um, so now I want to switch quickly to um, the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Act of 2013. Um, and I want to associate myself with a lot of comments that um, Angie Rogers made. Um, we have some concerns with the bill um, shortening affordability periods to five years, um, especially because the definition of distressed would capture so many neighborhoods in DC. I've included a map in my testimony that shows that this would um, capture roughly 40% of the census tracts in the district, including many neighborhoods that we do not necessarily feel have distressed housing markets. Um, so we ask that the committee look at amending the definition of distressed. Included in my testimony is um, research where we analyzed OTR data to look at proper or neighborhoods that had low value and low appreciation in homes um, and feel like that be might better capture a distressed neighborhood. Um, and then just very quickly on the um, baseline uh, affordability bill for, I'm sorry, the Housing Production Baseline Funding Act of 2014, we wholeheartedly support this bill. I feel like this is a no-brainer. Um, we know the Housing Production Trust Fund's our most critical source for affordable housing production and development, and we wholeheartedly support the council um, funding $100 million annually. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Court? Thank you, Chairman Bowser and council members. Uh, my name is Cheryl Court. I'm the policy director of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. And we are here to enthusiastically support the bill um, to, for the disposition of district land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013, because affordable housing built on site, especially in high cost, high cost and rising value neighborhoods, should be a top priority in land dispositions. While DEP has produced a significant amount of affordable housing through land public land dispositions, it's been highly unpredictable. The priority given to affordable housing in solicitations has become more opaque over time, leaving the public and the developer to guess what DEMPAD has in mind. The, the proposed bill would set a standard for affordable housing um, as a part of a broader public land disposition to accomplish other things um, and sets a clear priority for the 20 to 30 percent set aside reaching on the rental side down to deeply affordable levels. The bill also offers important flexibility and through a transparent and accountable process where the CFO certifies that the standards, affordable, affordability standards cannot be met um, but has maximized affordability. Secondly, I want to talk about the um, home, Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Am Amendment Act, um, which uh, is uh, something with a number of concerns that um, could uh, lead to um, a loss of, um, of affordable housing over time and um, is, is definitely in need of a more accurate measure of distressed neighborhoods. I want to associate my myself with the comments of my colleagues Angie Rogers and Jenny Reed regarding this bill. Um, there, We do have progress in terms of um, within the affordable housing community around the debate on this bill and we appreciate that CNHED has agreed to change language which maybe was inadvertent that was um, cutting off long term affordability or cutting off any uh, affordability term longer than either 5 or 15 years by t 
taking out the clause at least 15 years. Um, and so we need to reinsert the at least 50, 5 or 15 years um, rather than um, setting that the term, the affordability terms terminates at 5 or 15 years. We're grateful to CNHED to allow this and to um, uh, recognize that other um, approaches to affordable home ownership should be supported through the Housing Production Trust Fund, like Community Land Trust and other long term affordability approaches. Um, I suggest that we also add to this the, the Housing Production law, um, an alternative um, that uh, supports and um, encourages a shared equity approach that retrains affordability in the unit for the next home buyer while also sharing equity gains with the seller. Uh, we have a lot of good research showing that this is very beneficial and that assisted home buyers move on and graduate into the market rate market for their next home purchase, meaning that we are stretching these limited dollars and helping more home buyers become home buyers benefit from that and sharing and passing that on to um, the next person in line. I've submitted um, uh, detailed um, amendments um, for that bill and also maps um, related to the things we discussed here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so your testimony, let me let me be clear, and I'm not sure if, um, well, let me just be clear about what each of you said about the, the willingness, or you agree that the um, that the restriction of 15 years should be reduced. Do you all agree that with that? Cheryl, you, you sound like uh, I, I can accept the five, going from the, it's actually, for the current law states it's 10 years for distressed areas defined at 30% poverty rate um, to be rolled, and so the proposal is to roll back the uh, distressed uh, affordability term to five years and then to expand the area covered in the city for distress to lowering it to a 20% poverty rate. And DC's poverty rate is 18%, so it's going to be a lot of the city. So um, we can accept the rolling back of the five year for truly distressed neighborhoods if we get the definition right for distressed. And that's where we think we should be looking at OTR and having a, a more targeted approach. Okay. And Ms. Reed? And I would agree with that and also add that, I mean, I think that this bill is trying to address a real problem where we are having difficulty getting buyers in, in certain neighborhoods to buy some of these restricted units. I just feel like this is a very blunt tool to solve a very specific problem. And so I wonder if we want to think about given the, the difficulty in really capturing a housing market and all of the intricacies that go into that, if we want to really think about what's the right way to address this problem. And so you think the rollback is to five years in the distressed area is um, appropriate? I think it's problematic. I think that if, I think that on the whole the district should be moving towards a more shared equity model where there's permanent affordability and then we can just have that uh, discussion about what's the right balance between preservation and equity. But um, trying to recognize that there are folks um, on the ground that are having a hard time selling these units. Um, and so they're trying to come up with a solution for that. So if we're going to use the rollback of affordability, we need to limit it to just those really distressed neighborhoods. Okay, so you see the problem as people who have lived there for the required amount of time and who now want to sell? <coughs> no, no, it's it's the developers getting people interested because the unit with the restrictions is the same price as a market unit. And if you're a buyer and you can buy a unit at the same price and one is restricted and one is not, you're going to go for the unrestricted one. That's my understanding of okay. the problem. Okay. And so I'm just not sure this is a way. I'm just not sure that maybe it's the best way since it's just so, it's kind of blunt okay. as a tool. Okay. Ms. Rogers? Uh, I think that you will see uh, once you look more deep in more detail at some of the research that the um, Urban Institute has done, um, I think one of the arguments that they make is um, that you know, whether it's five years or 10 years or 15 years, you know, if we've got the right balance in terms of equity sharing, it really should not, it could be, you know, permanently affordable. It's really the equity sharing um, formula that is uh, the most important thing here. Um, but, you know, that's not exactly what we're talking about here. You know, this, and so this bill is, 
you know, sort of putting a solution out there that I think, frankly, is not the conversation that we think we should be having about our housing production trust fund. I think, you know, we value as much as a, as much affordability um, as we can possibly get. And so the reaction, that's, I think that's what you're seeing in the reaction to this bill. Let's not limit affordability even further in a vast majority of the city um, when the conversation that we really should be having is, you know, what's the right equity sharing balance that okay. will allow people to both build wealth and allow us to preserve affordability. Okay. Okay. Let me turn to Councilmember McDuffie for any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank each of the witnesses. I really appreciate you all coming out and testify. And I know that each of you have been in my office and we've had pretty extensive conversations about these measures and other, other things that we can do to, to produce more affordable housing and preserve existing affordable housing in this city. Um, I, and I appreciate your vigorous support of the Disposition of District Land and Affordable Housing Amendment Act. I do want to sort of pick up where Councilmember Bowser left off with the Affordable Housing Homeownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act, which I co-introduced with Councilmember Bonds, but as you all know from conversation that we've had, I, I too have some concerns with it. I'm pleased to hear that there's been some progress uh, amongst the advocates and the organizations that work so hard in this area. I do want to sort of hone in on that area where there still seems to be some level of disagreement. And, and with you, Ms. Rogers, if you could sort of give us an example that makes the issue that still exists between you and some of your colleagues mm -hmm. come to light? Because I don't know that a sure. lot of people in the room fully appreciate what the issue is, whether it's an issue of going from 10 to 5, or it's an issue of the definition of distress, or whether it's an issue of equity in the home. And so if you could try to break it down for us, if possible, and perhaps use a neighborhood. Because, I mean, Bloomingdale, Trinidad, which are both in Ward 5, I mean, I don't, I don't I mean, these are pretty hot markets over there, and, and homes are. are selling pretty rapidly at a really high cost. Yeah. So if you could do that, that would be helpful. So I think the issue at its core, there are a lot of issues that sort of touch this, but the issue at its core with this particular piece of legislation is the way that distress is defined. Defining it as uh, a neighborhood with 20% of poverty or more, um, as we said, captures um, as, as Jenny said, 40% of the census tracts um, in the district. And so you end up, you know, with a neighborhood uh, like Bloomingdale, uh, where someone could uh, buy into uh, this neighborhood, um, get subsidy, get subsidized to buy in, and then five years later sell and not leave enough money behind to get the next low income buyer in. And so, so, so let's just so let's just eliminate that. Let's eliminate that. So what does that mean? You buy in, and five years later, you've got a home that probably is appreciated fairly significantly, which right. means you have some additional equity that you could take with you. Right. But you don't leave enough money in the trust fund or, or in the home to allow the next person come along to be able to afford it. That's right. So you know, it's assuming you know that in neighborhoods, because this legislation. Uh, sort of captures neighborhoods where values tend to escalate aggressively. Um, we know that when that person sells five years from now, that home is going to be worth a lot more than it's worth today. And somebody's going to need a lot more money to buy in than they would need today. And so if the original buyer doesn't leave enough subsidy behind, leave enough money behind to get that next low income buyer in, that person is either going to have to come back to the city to get more subsidy, or if it's the original developer, uh, because this uh, also puts in a first right of refusal for the original developer, the original developer is going to have to come back to the city with their hand out to say, can we have more subsidy to make this affordable um, to the next buyer? And so I think what we're saying in this is that, you know, for that definition of distressed, you know, in my opinion, if we are going to lower affordability anywhere in this city, it should be a difficult threshold to meet because we have a hard time preserving it in the city as a whole. And so this 20% of poverty definition just captures a whole bunch of neighborhoods where you don't need it, and frankly, we should be protecting and maybe lengthening affordability as opposed to limiting. And, and my time has expired, but I want to just ask one more quick question, if I could, Madam Chair, yes. about, um, and perhaps Ms. Reed and Ms. Court, you could weigh in on this. I, I think the key is, is you know, you highlighted a, a great example, Ms. Reed, with the Mount Vernon Square. 
All right, so uh, my concern is whether in, in doing some of the things we want to do through this legislation that we permanently lose the affordability in some of these neighborhoods that are rapidly gentrifying, where home costs are skyrocketing. Uh, I live across the street from the Bloomingdale neighborhood in Stronghold, and, and the prices in Stronghold are going up uh, to the extent that if I had to try to purchase today, my wife and I, we probably couldn't afford it. And if we are, I know this is a different bill, but, but speak to the issue as to, I mean, could we possibly through this legislation lose some of those homes that we're currently subsidizing if the money isn't there or if there's trouble with the organizations like uh, MANA, like Mikasa, like Habitat, who are helping to fund some of these programs and build some of the housing. I'm concerned that we might permanently lose the affordability in some of these homes in neighborhoods where we want to maintain income diversity, economic diversity, cultural diversity uh, in a city. I mean, I think that's an, an additional concern is not only that you would need additional subsidy, but it might be harder to find units to subsidize in the first place, especially in a neighborhood that's rapidly developing. There's probably going to be less land or, you know, fewer units that you can even acquire. So. I think it's another concern is the turnover and then the ability to go back in that neighborhood and find a unit. So I think that's why we, you know, look towards the long-term affordability restrictions that really do allow us the preservation over time. <laughs> in Council Member, um, we've learned that, uh, you know, on the one hand, this, this broadening of areas that would be covered by, covered as quote unquote distressed like Bloomingdale and Columbia Heights, we, you know, we see that that's not a very good measure, right, it, with your own experience. And a five year period means that we would pretty much be guaranteeing that the first person would, would, would make a, a, a big profit on that unit after five years, but then the next person in line would have very little. You would have um, the the bill proposes to to um, recapture the original subsidy, but um, price. You know, you know how appreciation is so rapid in these neighborhoods. It would it would be no way that that would be able to replace that unit on site, and um, you know that would just. Um, further, you know, using our investments to go to neighborhoods that are lower value today while losing the preservation of those affordable home ownership opportunities in rising neighborhoods. So we think that we need to tailor this, um, that we need to target this so that we don't lose. Um, in areas that aren't appreciating, it doesn't really matter what the, what the restrict, you know, what the time period is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Ms. Bonds? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would just like to continue this discussion about um, the definition of distressed areas. Um, what what is what is Ms. Rogers? What would be your definition of distressed areas? Because I know that's a big issue for everyone. How do we define it with a changing a community, a neighborhood, a city in transition? So, what would you see as being appropriate? Um, I would, you know, so we, uh, the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute um, has done a little bit of work to look at um, this data that we've been talking about that's available from the Office of Tax and Revenue um, that pulls uh, sales prices, um, appreciation, number of sales, and I think, you know, we really should be looking at sort of the convergence of, of those things. So looking at sales, sales prices, if we find an area where the sales price is, let's say, you know, 50 or 60 percent percent below uh, the median uh, that exists for the rest of the city. If we find that, you know, appreciation is, you know, half as slow in a certain area as it is in the rest of the city, then we know that these are really areas that are struggling. Um, and those might be areas where, okay, you may need to relax some of the restrictions in order to get people to buy in. Um, the, so looking at a definition like that, um, that allows you to more narrowly tailor uh, what you're talking about here. Okay, I, I thank you. Um. Cheryl, you have any uh, uh, to add Robert, to that? <laughs> yes, um, I was actually able to um, get DC Office of Planning to map um, the 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 proposal of basically low value, low appreciation, or, or really just focus on the low price um, of census tracts that are below sixty percent of the DC right. median sales price. And as you'll see. Um, a few uh, neighborhoods like um, Brentwood and, and Ivy City um, and Soldier's Home areas show up uh, and an anomalous near uh, the White House. Uh, but basically the vast majority of these um, below 60% sales price are um, east of the Anacostia River. Correct. Um, and 
this seems like a more targeted approach. Um, it requires some interpretation still because I don't know what's going on west of the uh, White House um, that delivers those, those low values. But basically, I think this is a more um, a nuanced approach to make sure that we're, we're, we're putting our dollars to work in the neighborhoods that really need them. Yes. Um, the, the map you're showing now is the map that I'm more familiar with as um, being the defining uh, elements for this bill. Um, also, I think you can appreciate that one of the difficulties we would have, even if we looked at a census tract, we then have to go street by street in order to uh, refine the data. Um, and I'm not sure how we do that. Uh, it is a difficult bill, but it is designed to help us get more people um, in affordable housing and ownership <coughs> opportunities and to have an opportunity to build equity. But thank you very much, and I hope that uh, the team that's been working on this um, for some time will continue to work on this because we sincerely are hoping that we can come away from the table with something that is usable here in the District of Columbia, again, in our transitioning communities. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank you all uh, for your for your testimony in this. And I just want to say this: we've had this bill, and I know even before I had the committee, there was this bill was being discussed. Um, and it does it does pose a, a, a kind of a, something that seems an, a counterintuitive, right? So we say we want a housing production trust fund, and the housing production trust fund is going to invest in certain units. And so when you talk about subsidy, what that means is the government has said that we're going to reduce the cost, or we're going to pay a developer, we're going to pay down the cost of constructing a building. And in exchange for paying down that cost, we want certain units to be offered below the market value. Um, and so now we go out to sell those units um, and people will take advantage of and be able to benefit from the fact that they have this, this unit, that they have um, paid less than what they might have paid, um, and what happens after that. Um, the ability for somebody then to be able to make some life decisions. People have kids, so they need more space. People get a new job, they might want to sell. Um, all manners of things. It could be death, illness, marriage, divorce, all these things happen to people. Um, and their ability to make decisions about um, where they live um, is an important consideration there. So that's kind of, I, I, as I understand it, the, the, the nature of the problem that we're trying to solve. Now, let's, we will want to talk about this shared equity model and what, um, and how we get to that so that the district benefits from maintaining affordability um, and that nobody is really entitled to a windfall either based on the investment that the city has made. Uh, people are entitled to be able to make an, and, and grow wealth based on their home ownership decisions. Um, and that's the balance um, that we're trying to strike. So I want to thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next panel is Lisa Mallory. Jenny Kresge, and, uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny Campbell. Is Miss Campbell here? You may you may be seated. And if we can get copies of your testimony, okay. Okay, Ms. Mallory, we'll hear from you. Wonderful. Good morning, Chairwoman Bowser. I'm Lisa Mallory, and I'm the CEO of the District of Columbia's Building Industry Association. The purpose of my testimony is to provide um, is to provide DCBIA's viewpoint on various of the bills on today's agenda. As you know, DCBIA represents nearly 500 organizations that, and thousands of real estate development professionals. And we continue to offer our expertise as a resource for the district to find meaningful and workable solutions on such an important subject as affordable housing. Bill 2594, which is a disposition of um, district land for affordable housing, would impose affordable housing 
including set-asides and increase the documentation required for land dispositions. We are concerned that this legislation is well intended, but it will add additional and unnecessary layers to the de development of affordable housing. The Council has considered this type of legislation before and determined that minimum set-asides are not appropriate as part of the land disposition process. These requirements would, be, would impose avoidable conflicts with other affordable housing programs in the district and will place the affordable housing industry um, and some of our mandatory inclusionary zoning, housing production tasks, uh, production trust fund payments, and bond deal requirements um, in peril. Uh, further, Bill 2594 would institute additional arbitrary minimums for the Deputy Mayor, and, uh, Mayor for Planning and Economic Development to use in conflict with these existing programs. Current agreements allow the flexibility to include affordable housing units based on needs of the individual development. For example, a specific project may have a land value that is significantly more than the revenue that would be recouped from the sale of a minimum 20% affordable units. Especially in light of existing requirements, simply, the project would not be worth the cost unless the price of the land is reduced. We note that this legislation does allow the mayor to reduce the disposition cost or provide a waiver, but we are concerned with the extra time and expense that will come from the process of determining what reduction or waiver would occur. Instead of creating an exception, we would like the council to refrain from moving forward with the legislation and instead focus on existing affordable housing requirements. For example, the district already uses inclusionary zoning as a baseline for affordable housing. Uh, Chairwoman Bowser, as you know, DCBIA has been intimately involved in the process of refining this program. We are wary of adding an additional layer of requirements that conflict with the existing and imperfect IZ process and instead respectfully request that the Council focus on existing programs and improving them. In addition to the inclusionary zoning program, tax credits, public-private partnerships and the like all come with their own affordable housing components, which ensure that the district's long-term residents and low-income families are able to take part in the revitalization of our neighborhoods. As more projects from the last five years come online, the district will see the number of affordable housing units increase, specifically creating prime opportunities to create um, opportunities to use existing programs. Finally, on Bill 2594, we like to point out that the requirement that all multifamily developments with 10 or more for sale units must remain affordable in perpetuity is concerning. We're concerned with the value of affordable units being restricted, as existing programs have shown that borrowers never gain equity in these, in these homes. Value restrictions effectively force borrowers to lose any savings that were used to purchase the home. DCB, DCBIA believes that our hardworking and responsible residents that want to obtain the dream of home ownership should also be able to recoup their investment and gain equity just like all the other homeowners. With such a strong housing market in the district, we would like to work with the council to determine an appropriate methodology. The topic is also addressed in Bill 2604, which is the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act of 2013. We would like to work with all stakeholders to get this important public policy issue right. Simply put, participants felt that the district promoted the American dream, enticing residents to move away from affordable rental housing, and as a result, residents purchased units um, in purchase units are left with no equity, leaving families trapped in their homes. Further, for affordable housing financing, the current recapture rule is 15 years. This has proven unworkable, as, we, as we've discussed today. We ask the Council to consider alternatives, maybe even a graduated schedule of appreciation, meaning the longer an individual stays in the property, the more value slash equity the owner gets. We think equity is extremely important in preparing low-income families uh, to own affordable units to gain greater economic security. Now I shift to Bill 2713. It is encouraging that the district government as a whole is in a financial position to consider a bill that provides such significant funding. Uh, DCBIA continues to be supportive of significant and adequate funding for affordable housing. However, we are not in a position to specify any specific dollar amount, nor do we believe the district is ready to state a hard dollar amount without a comprehensive economic analysis. Okay, Ms. And Mallory, I will have some questions for you. I have uh, okay. the remainder uh, of your testimony here, and we'll have some questions. Um, let me move on to Ms. Kresge. Good morning, Chair Bowser and Council Members. Um, I'm Jenny Kresge with the Cornerstone Partnership. 
and I'm here mainly to talk about Bill 2604. Uh, as a program officer for the Cornerstone Partnership, I work with affordable home ownership programs across the country that seek to help more hardworking people buy homes today, maintain those homes, and keep them affordable in the future. Cornerstone Partnership believes that this that because so much community effort and public subsidy goes into creating affordable homeownership units, we should work to ensure that those homes can help as many generations of home buyers as possible. Cornerstone Partnerships membership includes over 900 individuals representing homeownership programs across the country who implement shared equity or long-term affordable homeownership programs in their communities every day. Homeownership has long been the main opportunity for lower and middle income families to build wealth. Shared equity homeownership programs are designed to preserve affordability so that a one-time investment can help one family after another access this wealth building opportunity. In exchange for significant public support in the form of subsidy to purchase a home, the homeowners agree to pass that benefit along to another low-income family by reselling their home at an affordable price. Shared equity pro homeownership programs do not force residents to remain in their homes for the length of their resale restrictions, but rather they create a system where not just one family but many families can benefit from the city's investment. Shared equity homeownership programs allow homeowners to build wealth in two different ways. First, they build wealth by paying down their mortgage, creating equity that they will take with them if and when they choose to sell their home. Second, they build wealth through sharing in a portion of the home's appreciation upon resale. The amount of appreciation the homeowner receives is based on a formula that's set in advance, providing the owner with a clear understanding of their opportunity to build wealth while they're passing these benefits along to another family. The homeowners who purchase through a shared equity program do typically earn less through market appreciation than someone purchasing a market rate home. However, studies have found that most owners purchase, purchase market rate homes for their next home purchase. They also typically earned a return better than if they had rented a comparable unit and invested their down payment in stock markets or treasury bonds. While selling affordable homeownership units in distressed neighborhoods and weak housing markets can be challenging, the importance of preserving long-term affordability has been proven repeatedly. In other cities across the country, once distressed neighborhoods have gentrified at alarming rates, we also see that here in DC. Today, the homes with long-term affordability restrictions are often the only affordable homes in those communities. Weak markets provide an opportunity. When values are low, limited subsidy dollars stretch further. Over time, this investment increases in value as the neighborhood develops and overall property values rise. When the neighborhood begins to boom, these long-term affordable units become more important than ever. I hope this reinforces the opportunity available for Washington, D.C. to balance its approach to building wealth for low-income homeowners while preserving public investments. Cornerstone Partnership <laughs> has a wealth of resources. Um, we have a website that's available to all, and we'd be happy to offer any additional information. Thank you. Ms. Campbell. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Ms. Campbell, let's just make sure you turned on there. Good morning, Good morning. everybody. Good morning. My name is Jamie Campbell, and I live at 3400 C.J. Barney Drive at the Wesley House in Washington, D.C. I need a voucher or some financial assistance to help me pay my rent. I do realize that I'm not alone in this request. We have racked our brains on how to increase our income because we know that our fixed retirement salaries are not going to change to help meet today's escalated rental housing cost. Our rent is exceeding our income. I have exhausted my savings. My energy level is low. My eyesight and other aging issues are present. My adjusted, adjusted income is $1,760. My present rent is $1,112, which will go up uh, $20 in July. 
My cable bill and internet is $126. My telephone bill is $60. And my Pepco ranges from $25 to $75. That doesn't leave very much for other necessities. I don't want to complain because God has been good to me and I have been independent all of my adult life. I have a great faith that God will make a way for me and others somehow and that way will be your decision to help us. I retired on disability from the Department of State and also part-time jobs that earn the 40 quarters that affords me Social Security. I have numerous outstanding awards and references. I have a high school certificate from George P. Phoenix High School <coughs> in Hampton, Virginia, and I have an AD de uh, AA degree from the Cortez W. Peters Business College majoring in business administration. I have worked hard and contributed much to make my neighborhood and Washington, D.C. a better community. I have been a homeowner, a voter, a taxpayer who is still paying, a good citizen for the last 50 years, and I deserve some help to help me pay this rent just a little bit so that I can stay in Washington, D.C., near my family, my hospital, my doctors, and above all, my church, so that I may continue to worship God in a fashion that I have been accustomed to. The main reason I accepted this invitation to speak today is to stay in Washington, D.C. I don't want to live in Florida or Mississippi. I want to survive here. I pray that something good would happen for us today. So please sirs, please madams, make it happen for us. Your sensational seniors who made it possible for you to be where you are. We are your mothers and your fathers. We don't have long now on our life's journey. It's almost over. So give us the vouchers so that we may stay in our homes to enjoy the remainder of our days here on earth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And may God bless America. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Thank you for your excellent testimony. Um, so you're here uh, to testify in support of HAPIS, yes, um, and this is the, the bill that I described a little bit earlier, um, and I want to thank you and others for the kind invitation to, to talk in um, some detail about uh, what some seniors are facing. And uh, often they're seniors just like you um, who have a good retirement income. Uh, you worked and in, in, in were able to retire uh, in the many cases from the federal government and get a, a decent um, uh, pension. Um, but as you also note, it is you're not like you're not rich, right? No, and so you don't not you're not uh, you are not having the type of income at seventeen hundred and sixty dollars that that you describe, which includes it sounds like your pension and your social security um, to deal with just the basics of of your life. Um, and so you describe um, perfectly what a lot of people in the district are experiencing, where more than half of your income um, is being used for your housing costs. And I didn't even hear you describe transportation. No. Or entertainment. No. Or, you know, food and clothes um, in, in, in that description. Right. Um, but those are the things that um, people who have worked their whole lives deserve and expect uh, to be able to cover in the District of Columbia. So you also heard me describe um, a little bit earlier, and I, I waited till you came up to, to read it, um, something that, if I can find it now, we are going to 
um, start talking to the members of the council about. Um, and I know there, there are some very kind of specific things that are described in the bill. Um, and I think there, there may be eventually a way to get to the bill, but I think there could be some incremental steps as well. So I'm going to put this out here, and I, I had the opportunity to mention it to Chairman Mendelson yesterday, um, but I thought it, we, uh, it would be best if we talked about it here um, and then um, bring it up at okay. some point soon with the council. But what this, um, what, the, what I'm contemplating, of course, I want to talk to the bill's authors who were council member um, um, Bonds and McDuffie and Wells to also and to hear um, some public feedback as well, um, because I think that sooner rather than later we may be able to move in this direction. Um, and so what what this would do is is amend uh, the budget that's before the council now to give the housing authority um, the ability or require that the housing authority dedicate no less than a million dollars in fiscal year 2014 of new or unfulfilled project-based, sponsor-based, and tenant-based vouchers to benefit very low-income um, seniors who are individuals 62 years or older who are paying more than 35 percent of their income and housing costs. The authority would then make uh, the rules to accept referrals of eligible individuals in consultation with um, district agencies, including the Department on Aging and the Department on, on Human Services. Now, I just throw it out there because I want to put it on the record because there's going to be, I'm sure, um, some public discussion about that. The second thing that I promised on Saturday that we would have, and I'm, I'm waiting now for the Housing Authority to get it over, and I am, um, I'm sure that they're going to do it before we conclude today, uh, was to see what the real context is, and these questions came up earlier, how many seniors are we talking about? So if, um, if we anticipate, as this bill um, contemplates, $5 million, um, I, and I, I got the estimate from, from the, um, the advocates for the bill, six, up to 600 seniors could be helped. Um, and so what, what then we, we estimate, uh, obviously, many lower than that if a million dollars um, would, would start um, a program that w is within the Housing Authority's um, current program of, of giving out vouchers. So I, I, don't wanna, I don't necessarily want you to respond to that today, um, but I, I want to say I recognize the very significant problem that we have. Um, and we talk a lot about how we're going to address our homeless situation. And part of our, our addressing our homeless situation is not allowing people to become homeless. Right. And um, if you are in a safe um, housing, and we, we have to recognize that we, we, we have programs that keep people um, in safe housing. Um, now, as much as what you've described today is, I know, concerning to a lot of people, we actually met somebody else on that same day um, who was almost paying 100% of his income um, for housing. And so we know that that is, that is critically un unsustainable. So the last thing I'll say, and I'll turn to, my, to Mr. McDuffie, um, it, we, we have to look at all the agencies of our government because you described some, some of your costs. And immediately I was thinking, um, and I know that um, your, your ABLE leadership in your building has already brought out the utility companies so that every senior who qualifies, and I think some, actually some changes were made yes. to allow more people to qualify for low-income assistance. I heard you say about your phone bill, um, and I hope everybody knows um, that Verizon has a program if you have limited uh, a need to, to make a lot of regional calls, you can get your phone bill down to about $5. I actually, I'm out actually on that program because I'm not okay. there. I use okay. the phone. Ms. Redmond right. has my number though. Um, and so those are some <coughs> things to do. Comcast also has um, some programs that will uh, uh, allow a, a reduced um, payment rate given a number of criteria and we might even look to them to, to change that. So that's not enough. But I, I want people to take advantage as much as possible of the existing programs. Um, if, I know I said finally, but this is really finally. Um, 
we also at the council, as you know, moved yesterday uh, to have some to make some income tax changes, and that we're hoping that uh, many people um, in the room will be able to benefit from for, from paying reduced taxes. So you'll keep um, more of your money um, at the end of the day. So um, I know there was a lot of testimony, and I, I may give myself a second round, but I want to turn to Mr. McDuffie right now. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. Chairman Bowser, and uh, I want to thank each of the witnesses for coming down to testify. Uh, particularly you, uh, Ms. Campbell, I really appreciate your testimony and, and you sharing the story with us. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I've heard some of the stories. I have a represented Ward 5, which has uh, a high population of senior citizens, as does Ward 4 uh, and Ward 3. Um, th these are stories that I hear pretty frequently. And, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Redman, who is here today, for being a fierce advocate for the seniors over in Wesley House. There are a number of Wesley House uh, seniors who have contacted my office. I come there to visit and I speak with you all. So I've heard the concerns. And quite frankly, this bill could be deemed the Wesley House uh, a bill because of all the advocacy that's come out of uh, that building. So I do appreciate your contributions. And something you said it, it really impacts me is that you all have worked so hard over all these years to make the district uh, what it is today. And, and, and while we are flush with, with uh, cash in our coffers today is it's, it's on the backs of a lot of hard-working residents like yourselves and so it's only right that we uh, make sure that uh, as you all sort of reach an age where you're trying to make sure that you, you aren't uh, pinching pennies and, and, and you don't have to live check to check given all that you've contributed uh, to the fabric of the District of Columbia over those years so I appreciate your testimony uh, a lot. Uh, I do want to ask and it's important to note, you know, we've got folks on this council, like Councilmember Bowser, who's done a lot in the area of, of affordable housing. Uh, Ms. Bonds, who just recently, I mean, she's been fighting for a while for the bill that she has to provide some relief to senior citizen uh, homeowners. But there are also renters who have challenges as well. So we want to make sure we're addressing the needs of those uh, in that population as well. I want to turn, uh, with the time I had left, to um, uh, the testimony of Ms. Mallory. You mentioned... Um, uh, concerns that you raise uh, with the uh, land disposition uh, bill uh, and I guess I want to explore a little bit. I guess my concern is you mentioned the inclusionary zoning uh, is a baseline right now for affordable housing. I appreciate all the work that's been went into the inclusionary zoning program. Uh, I know it's, it was put in place I think back in maybe 2006. My concern is, is the, the slow pace at which it's actually produced affordable units. Agreed. And I know we reference it a lot, mm -hmm. um, but the bills that I've introduced and work with my colleagues to introduce as a result of, of sort of the snail space that we've seen the affordable housing produce, but at the same time we've seen the cost of housing skyrocket mm -hmm. uh, in dramatic fashion without rents keeping pace. And so that's a concern. So if you could talk a little bit about the refinements that you mentioned that you all have worked on for inclusionary <coughs> zoning, because, you know, in my Estimation. I haven't looked at the most recent numbers, but the bulk of the units being produced uh, pursuant to inclusionary zoning, I believe, are at the 80% AMI mm -hmm. rate. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and that's, I mean, it's, it's about 78000 I think, for a family of three, and that's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. And and I think the sweet spot, most advocates will tell you, if we can get it housing produced at 50% of AMI or lower, uh, is where you really begin to address the critical needs of, of individuals who, who require and really need affordable housing in the city. Absolutely. Councilmember McDuffie, what I was referring to in my testimony, and there's much more um, in the written testimony that you can peruse, um, is the concern the inclusionary zoning program has not worked as effectively. And we certainly have been at the table with Councilwoman Bowser and with others um, to offer our expertise in trying to assist in refining it and helping it. What we're concerned about is adding yet something else without fixing the inclusionary zoning program, which is something that is some, that we are, are working to abide with. And and is a big concern because it's nobody's winning here um, with the current structure that we have. So that's where we're offering our tremendous resources of our members um, to come forward and to continue to engage in these discussions to find a viable solution that is not as time consuming. This is a very critical issue for DCBIA affordable housing um, as it is for all of us in this room. Okay, and and I, I want to. Obviously, I know you all have done a lot, DCBIA has, uh, on these issues, and I want to continue to work with you all just like I've worked with you all in the past and worked with advocates in the past. It's important to make sure that we have all interested parties at the table when we're making these very important decisions 
they're going to impact thousands of people across the district. Um, but I want to explore that, but also some of the other things that you mentioned in your testimony about the requirements would impose a avoidable conflicts with other affordable housing programs and the district already has in place. Uh, and so, you know, if there are programs in particular that you, you want to talk about, I, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Absolutely. What I don't want to happen is us to pass a law that then doesn't really, it's not effective and it doesn't uh, allow the market to produce the sort of affordable housing that we'd like to see. Uh, but I think that when you talk about the land that we have in the district, mm -hmm. uh, what I want to avoid is, is sort of disposing of publicly owned land for private developments that has very little affordable housing in it. Because I think you'll find that, particularly when we dispose of land in areas that are, <clears throat> um, that are, that are where housing prices are increasing rapidly, mm -hmm. if, if we're only requiring affordable housing in areas where the, the land is a little bit more depressed, then I think we create or contribute to the sort of stratification that, that sometimes occurs in the District of Columbia where you've got places where housing expenses, housing costs are rising and it's really attractive to a lot of people, but then the affordability of those neighborhoods gets lost in everything. And so that, that's what I'm trying to shoot for, Absolutely. That, 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 that balance. So, okay. so we can have those conversations to figure out how we strike that balance, that's where I'd like to meet you all, sort of halfway somewhere. We would certainly like to do that, sir. We have, as we have visited with your office, our new president, Sean Cahill, and myself and others have gone to all the members uh, of this council to have those discussions. There are existing programs, and I'm sure um, Deputy Mayor Hoskins will be talking about that um, during his testimony that are, are some, that could be somewhat conflicting with what's going on, with what is proposed here. So we are happy to delineate all of those um, those programs, the impact, and how those those you know challenges will occur, and it's it's it can be somewhat counterproductive um, to to put some of these requirements on top of that. So we're happy to have that to engage um, with our members and um, and your staff on that discussion. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bonds. Thank you, Chairman Bowser. Um, thank you all very very much, um, Ms. Camel. Um, very nice to see you. And um, I, I see Ms. Redmond there. And um, when we started this, um, you guys had me over to Wesley Heights. You yes. made it very clear uh, what your need were, just as you did before this audience today. So, um, and we do understand and uh, certainly appreciate what has been given by you and many other seniors in the city and I, I especially appreciate that and I'd like to ask the audience if they feel the same way to give you a round of applause because you are truly deserving. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard journey uh, being in the District of Columbia today for many of our seniors on very, very limited um, incomes and, and watching all the newness and the transformation and um, having very few resources to take advantage of it all. But we want you to stay and we work every day to try to figure out how we can help in that. And uh, to Ms. Mallory, um, we're not trying to uh, reinvent the wheel, but we are really sincerely looking for ways to um, increase the affordability of housing in the District of Columbia. So I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned um, uh, this, this issue of the inclusionary zoning not working and we kind of get, we get that. I'm just wondering um, if you could talk for a minute about how we might, as a community, get to 30% of AMI. Just some ideas as it relates to our rental units. As it relates to our rental units, how yeah. we would that. Well, you know, one of the things that we've been doing, our members have been engaged in for quite some time, is thinking about some, even some pilot projects. And we actually have a proposal um, that we uh, are happy to share with you, some ideas of how we would work with our developers and nonprofit developers and the government to do some pilot projects that are a little above and beyond, or do, are not conflicting with the existing um, regulations that would allow us to even you know, to, to tackle that issue and that, that, that medium, that um, income bracket and to engage in um, increasing the, um, the availability of, of, of these units in some of the projects that we're doing. So we do have some, some very innovative um, thoughts that we have been um, expanding upon. We've um, shared those with um, 
uh, Council Member Bowser, and we're happy to um, to share that with you as well. So, you know, I think what we need is to come together, and specifically addressing your question, is coming together to think about some creative solutions that will happen um, in short order. I mean, I think we've been taught, many of us have been talking about these issues for decades. I myself have been doing that. We have participated in many of um, the um, the District of Columbia's um, task forces to um, to pursue these issues, and we want to continue to be present at the table. But I think now is the time to take some leadership and do some courageous pilots and moving forward on ways where we can make sure that we're addressing some of these challenges to um, to address some of our um, our, um, our our uh, residents' uh, challenges, as you're going to hear uh, more about today. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank, thank you all you, for your testimony. <clears throat> God bless America. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> A Kurt Runge, Holly Donaldson, and Reverend Jim. Where's the blue shirt? I know, I know. You need, 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 need to do laundry. That's yeah. <laughs> true. Oh, Mr. Runch. Chairwoman Bowser and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kurt Runge and I'm the advocacy director at Miriam's Kitchen. Our mission is to end chronic homelessness in the district and we are proud supporters of the Way Home campaign to end chronic homelessness in DC by 2017. Miriam's Kitchen strongly supports the disposition of district land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act and the Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Funding Act. We will be focusing our comments today on these two bills. The district is rapidly changing and, and in need of stronger, stronger policies to ensure that our city creates and preserves affordable housing. This need is most apparent to our neighbors who do not have a home, such as the guests at Miriam's Kitchen. One gentleman has been working at a local fast food chain 30 hours a week for about a year now. He makes $8.25 an hour, which comes out to about $900 a month. He's homeless because he cannot afford housing. Many of our guests have severe disabilities which inhibit their ability to work. Some of these individuals receive only 710 a month uh, in Social Security income. For these individuals, finding affordable housing is nearly impossible. The need is not only apparent but urgent and costly for our guests who have been homeless for years and have a serious illness. People who are chronically homeless often cycle in and out of emergency services only to end up back on the street. This was true for a gentleman I met when I worked as a homeless outreach worker for the downtown bid. He had untreated schizophrenia, slept outside, and was not taking care of himself. No matter what the season, he wore a snowsuit, which became da dangerous in the sweltering D.C. heat. He sometimes was admitted to the emergency psychiatric hospital, where he'd stay for 48 hours, only to be discharged to the street. However, through the DHS Permanent Supportive Housing Program, he was identified as extremely vulnerable and got the housing and supportive services he needed to thrive. He now takes medication, he's doing really well, and he actually lives in my neighborhood. DC can end chronic homelessness if creative solutions are explored to increase permanent supportive housing in our community. Although Miriam's Kitchen strongly supports the disposition of district land legislation, we encourage the committee to explore ways to leverage public land to create permanent supportive housing. We also urge the committee to explore ways to strengthen the legislation so that there, that some housing created is affordable to people living significantly below 30% of the area median income. We also recommend that the committee consider adding language to the legislation that would ensure that when public land occupying a homeless shelter is developed, affordable housing that is produced is prioritized for people who are homeless. We also strongly support the Housing Reduction Trust Fund Baseline Funding Act uh, and see the trust fund as a, a strong tool to produce affordable housing. But we want to specifically urge the mayor and council to ensure a baseline of funding to meet the goals of the Interagency Council on Homelessness plan to end chronic homelessness, which includes the trust fund, but also project and sponsor-based local and supplement program 
vouchers and lease-based permits part of housing through the DHS program. And then just uh, one final comment just uh, on the issue of seniors who are homeless. I uh, did want to mention when it comes to the need for individuals, DHS reported that in the last year uh, about 1,300 people over the age of 60 used our, our homeless shelters. So there's a lot of seniors, uh, there's a lot of seniors who need affordable housing, including seniors who are actually homeless, um, and many who stay in CC and B and have to sleep in bunk beds. So I think that uh, it's a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Runge, I'll get that right at one, some point. Um, Polly, uh, Ms. Donaldson. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Bowser, for convening this hearing, and to Council Members McDuffie and Bonds, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Polly Donaldson, a resident of Mount Pleasant in Ward 1, and Executive Director of Transitional Housing Corporation that's based in Ward 4. I serve on the District's Interagency Council on Homelessness, and also as Board Chair of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development, CNHED. Currently, THC provides housing and services across the continuum of transitional and permanent housing for over 500 homeless, at-risk, and low-income families in the district. And this year, we will break new ground on mixed-income affordable housing developments in wards 4 and 7 in order to add more than 80 homes to the city's stock of affordable and senior affordable housing. Affordable housing and economic development is integral to our ability to to house and serve the homeless, at-risk, and very low-income families. I would like to highlight and comment on three of the bills under consideration um, today by this committee. First, the Disposition of District Land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act. We believe that land is the most valuable asset that the district government has in support of building more affordable housing. We support the establishment of affordable housing set-aside requirements for when district-owned land is being disposed for the development of multifamily residential projects with 10 or more units. THC in Somerset's Fort View Mixed Income Development Award 4 is an example of successfully preserving affordable housing for low and moderate income families with residence services in a mixed income community. This community houses families with up to 60% of the AMI, with one third of the units set aside for families at 30% of the AMI using in part the local rent supplement program subsidy. It's stable, attractive, safe housing where families of different income levels live in community together. We urge the district to expand the opportunities for that kind of development as has been done in the planning for the disposition of Walter Reed and which should be done we believe with all public lands in the district and surplus property that the district owns. Second, on the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Bill, we, um, we support um, what the coalition uh, including CNHED has put together in terms of the bifurcation option to promote home ownership to accomplish the dual goal of maintaining affordability as well as providing opportunity for economic advancement. We support the recapturing of subsidies for the trust fund and we also believe that obviously the definition of distressed neighborhoods is something that does have to be determined but with flexibility and very careful annual monitoring to make sure that we're capturing market trends as well. Um, finally, the baseline uh, funding act for the trust fund, um, your leadership on this has been uh, very important and we find that um, that is really the key for affordable housing across all income levels for all income families and individuals. Um, we know the importance of the trust fund. I do hope and I know that there's a, a final um, uh, consideration of the FY15 budget through the Budget Support Act. I hope there is some way that we can actually get to that $100 million. We're so close this year and it really would be helpful going forward and would obviously set a mark and a mark that, that uh, should be the floor, the minimum standard for uh, resources to this. Thank you. Reverend Jim. Uh, thank you. I'm Jim Dickerson with MANA. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm, I just want to just stop you there because I know that you've been principally <coughs> involved in one of the bills before, so I want to extend you a little bit more time to go through it. Um, so we'll give you a five. Well, minutes. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to personally uh, just associate myself with uh, the coalition's position and uh, Ms. Donaldson's position here. And I want to speak specifically then to the bill uh, 20 uh, 64, which, 604, which we have been involved in directly, and to testify in its support. Uh, if it was, uh, this is a compromise bill that we went through years of 
working with all of the different elements, uh, uh, all the different groups, and we came up with this bill. If it was up to me, and I support this, the compromise bill, but if it was up to me, of course, I'd have five years and a recapture recycle model in every neighborhood for lower income people for ownership. Because I want to incentivize the social system so that lower income, low wealth, no wealth people will have opportunity and motivation to move out of poverty and the no, the no, the no wealth and low wealth status. I'm outraged by the fact that low income people are being characterized by some of the opponents of this bill as greedy speculators who only want to flip their properties and get a windfall profit. This is completely unfounded and false. We have proof. 80% of MANA and Habitat, of humanity, uh, uh, Habitat for Humanities buyers are still in their homes. MANA has produced over 1,500 homes in 32 years, and we know our buyers. They want to live here. They want to benefit from all the positive changes they have helped to create here and not be displaced, which homeownership enables them, and many of them are here today to testify. Keep in mind that only 6% of the Housing Production Trust Fund is used for homeownership. And now with this uh, poverty areas, it's even less, it'll be even less than that out of the Production Trust Fund. The statement that we will not have any affordable housing if this bill is passed is false. It's also false that, low income, that the low-income buyer gets a windfall. In this bill, there is a recapture, recycle model that they pay back. All of the government funds, including the windfall, which is the difference in the market value and the value of what they pay for at the time when they purchase their homes. And with this model, more affordable units are created with the recapture recycle model. We're not losing units. We're creating more and sometimes twice as much. Um, I'm also dismayed, frankly, and angered that City First Homes and others want to turn seemingly every organization and nonprofit housing developer into a shared equity organization like they are, their model. We worked with them on this compromise. They were a part of it. And there is a provision in the legislation that will allow them to continue their model. This is part of the continuum. And they agreed to it in, in the discussions. And for them to come out against it publicly now is disingenuous. From your personal experience, Madam Chair, and other council members here, you know the importance of having access to equity while living in your home. Affordable owners like Donna Morris and Elaine Hart, who submitted their testimony, have used their equity for education for themselves and their children, <coughs> start small businesses, help their children with down payment in their first homes. And we want more of this type of empowerment, helping people move from a background of being in Section 8 renter to temporary homelessness to home ownership that moves family off the government subsidy and into generational home ownership and equity and economic mobility. The city and the society gets a huge return this way. Lastly, uh, what we have in the city net right now, as far as I'm concerned, is a social support model by and large for lower income folks that maintains and traps them in their lower income and low wealth status. The bill will help change that, giving the few home, the Housing Production Trust Fund homeowners, 6% in poverty areas, the incentive and opportunity to move up the economic ladder and end generational poverty and be witnesses to others like them. We cannot treat these people like second-class citizens, as is the case now. People are choosing policies for them that they, that they think is, are best for them, but they are not choosing them for themselves. Everyone in this city who owns a home has benefited from development that has been fueled by investment of government funds, like the metro, land discount, or, given away to, or land given away to developers for market rate development, and development by nonprofits in the 80s and 90s that paved the way for market rate development and investment of millions and millions. Market rate owners are beneficiaries of these government subsidies. They have enabled significant equ equity gains in their homes and businesses, yet they do not have to share their equity with any one, and the wealth gap continues to grow. We all, under, we all know that. Jesus said to the wealthy and the powerful of his day, you put heavy loads on poor people that you yourselves are unwilling to bear. The existing housing policies is fundamentally an unfair policy that treats lower income people one way and wealthy people another and makes affordable home ownership development extremely difficult. I know because we're doing it. This bill helps reverse that and helps us move in a new direction with much more promise, hope, fairness, and possibility for lower income people yearning for a better life and future. Thank you.
Thank you for your testimony. And what I'm just going to start with, Go uh, Reverend Jim. Now you work with this all yes. day, every day for 32 years. But I would like you to describe, kind of in as much detail, from the, the time the government gets involved <coughs> to the time Mana or a similar organization produces the unit to the time you go out and recruit a buyer. <coughs> till the time your buyer says this is our issue and resale. Can you just talk um, quickly about what that cycle looks like? Well, most of our buyers do not resale. They're living in a great no, city. No, so start, I'm just, start, I'll start from this. the forest, yes. the beginning. They come to us. No, start start with this. Mana wants to produce some affordable housing. Mana comes to the city to okay. say, city, help me with the housing production trust fund. Okay, Ivy City is a good example. We okay. go to them, they come to us. We have a, uh, we create a, uh, Coalition of nonprofits. Another one is the Buxton that we're doing right now. We take, we get the property, we get a loan from the production trust fund and other sources to renovate those houses. We we began to have pre-sales of people and we train them. They're already in our home buyers clubs. Okay, let's talk about your Ivy City project. Okay. So it was this city land. Uh, this is the land that the city bought through government funds to amass 75 units that are divided between three, Mikasa human uh, habitat and us, that we produce for home ownership. Okay. And to try to spur development in a very depressed area. Okay, so we, the city, owned the land. The city bought the land and they sold it to us or gave and it to us. We reproduced it. Okay, and you used housing production trust, trust fund dollars to, to, do that, um, we to renovate it? Yes, and we paid them back. Okay. And so then you own a, you own a portion of those seventy five units. And then we did, and you, we sold them. And you sold them. Yes, ma'am. So you went out, and what were the requirements, um, or what were the prices of, of those units? Uh, market. No, 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 below A1. market. Okay. Below market, you know, in the mid one hundreds, low one hundreds to two hundred, depending on the, the side, depending on the size. Okay, and what would the market have been? at that time? Not much more, sometimes less. The appraisals were less because of that depressed neighborhood. Okay. And so, and on top of that, they have to deal with 15-year restrictions on top of that. Okay, so actually you produced it as affordable <coughs> housing, yes. but the market were was was less than what you did. Yes, and we're be. creating the market. You're creating the market. Yes. And so it's, a, it's about revitalizing it. Other people are beginning to take care of their homes and whatnot. And so all of the units produced had this affordability covenant? The affordability restrictions? Restriction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So this was, this kind of points to what Ms. Reed pointed out earlier, and I was trying to figure out what she meant by that, but now I, I think I see. So people here have this restriction, this 15-year yes. restriction, um, because what you ended up producing the, the properties for are actually similar than is what the market prices yes. are in the area. Yes. Okay. So somebody who's not in your in your project um, is buying um, at one price at, at, with this restriction, and somebody who might live across the street could buy at a similar price with no restrictions. No, no restrictions. So your potential buyer has a choice. They can go on your, your, there are probably other benefits to bu buying at your location. Yes. It's new, it's newly constructed. Yes, but people aren't buying a lot there. Okay, okay? All right. They are owning. Now let me just say this. They cannot get a home equity loan because of these restrictions. They cannot sell to anybody except somebody in their own income category. Okay, and let me ask you this about money. those 75 so, units. When did they come online? Well, I mean, we worked with the city over two or three years, four years to help that happen. To they, the city helped to you know, buy up some property there to try to, inst to stimulate that. But when, we did, when were they finished? Oh, uh, they were finished. We've had our last settlement um, about a, uh, a month ago, a week or so, several okay. weeks ago. And so your concern there, um, and I, I'm not as familiar with sure. how they've sold or anything like that, so that's why I'm asking you these questions. <coughs> so tell me what the, the, the sales experience has been with those sales. It was very sales. hard. Okay. It's very hard. You're attracting pioneers into a neighborhood that people don't want to move into. There's still crime. Uh, Councilmember McDuffie will tell tell you there's still. I it, call them emerging. I well, never they're, say they're the greatest people in the world. They're the greatest buyers. They create the value there, and they raise their families there. They're not interested in moving. What they are, tr they cannot. They're really limited and restricted here. Okay, so you believe if we tell you to that prospective buyer. Um, you can buy one of these units, which the city bought the land, so that's one 
area of subsidy. We we'll used our housing production trust fund to help you renovate the the, the units. That's another investment that we've made. Um, and if we and and they are, if we call them affordable, but really they're the same as what. Um, what the market is what, in what the market is. Um, the existing market is when they delivered. Um, and, and so some of these definitions get weird because when sure. we say affordable, I think most people think that it's below the market value. But the market value okay. is, is what mm -hmm. the projected prices was, uh, were, I, I would guess. So um, <coughs> you believe if we remove this restriction, then you're on the buyer is, has a level decision to make between your, um, your project mm -hmm. and, the, and what's existing in the neighborhood. It makes it better. It makes it a lot better for them, yes, mm -hmm. if they have a five-year restriction. Uh, that's, so you, they, you they say can, that's their chief impediment to buying that's there? One. There's one. That's just one. Now, if you have to resell to someone that's in your income category or below, that's another one. That's a very difficult thing to do. But they're there. They're there to be homeowners and to be a part of the community and to be there long term. All right. So give me the profile of the person who knows all those barriers. She's here. And she she's going to testify. Okay. She's All right, well, here. then we'll ask her directly. Yes, ask her those questions okay. and tell her why why she wants to be a homeowner and why she wants to be there and help change that neighborhood and grow her family there, etc. Okay, very well. Let me turn to Councilmember McDuffie for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I want to thank each of the, the uh, witnesses for their testimony. Uh, Reverend Dirkison, I know you've been working in this. Uh, area for long enough, I've probably been on this earth, um, <laughs> and we appreciate all the work. Please, I'm a part of the seniors, the Wesley House group. Yeah. When, when, when I was riding with you uh, a couple of weeks ago, you told me how long you've been doing I've this. Been it was, it was yeah. before I was there. Um, but I also had the opportunity to see a lot of the work that Mana has uh, achieved uh, over the years, uh, and I'm really appreciative for that. And, and, and I'm going to be in and out of this this hearing. That I might miss uh, Maria's uh, testimony, but I'm, I'm pleased to see her uh, here today, and I really appreciate her opening up her home for me to see, uh, obviously, some of the work that you all have done, but how people benefit from uh, that work is, is really the key. I'm trying to get to a point where, and because I've worked with all of you, you know, I've worked with Man, I see uh, Susan Slater in the room from Habitat, and I know they've done some work in Ivy City as well as uh, Mikasa. Uh, I know that there are a number of other. Uh, organizations, some of whom have already testified, uh, uh, with whom I've worked on these types of issues. Help me reconcile this issue around the definition of distressed neighborhoods and the concern that I have with uh, having a definition that includes neighborhoods like Bloomingdale. And I know you have done a lot of work in Trinidad. Trinidad, uh, we did a lot of work in Bloomingdale too. Uh, on uh, on Hobart Place, for example. Yes. Uh, but we also know that Trinidad has homes that are selling for five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars now. And Bloomingdale right. have homes that are sold for upwards of seven, eight, yeah. nine hundred thousand dollars. Do we want to have a <coughs> definition of a stretch neighborhoods that includes areas like that, where people you know benefit from the subsidy, get the home sale, uh, and then perhaps um, uh, the affordability isn't quite there for the person who comes behind them who also wants to live in that neighborhood. Do you see that as an issue? I understand that. That's why we have the recapture recycle model where the whole subsidy, this, the whole subsidy, the thing that's called the windfall and all is recaptured, that everything that's in it is recaptured and recycled and more housing is built. <coughs> Somebody's leaving? So more housing is built. So you don't, you lose maybe that if that person leaves. Uh, in 25 years or 30 years, you lose that unit, but you don't, you have captured the subsidy, all of it, and you have developed in other places as well. Now, if you, so want, to keep the, if you want to keep the unit and not penalize the buyer, okay, mm -hmm. and now we've looked at the shared equity uh, 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 programs. There's no data about shared equity programs in high uh, market high price markets for low income people that needs to be investigated okay but the recapture recycle does produce more units in other places you don't you you may not have it right there at that particular unit but you would you would have it in another place the people on Holbrook none of them have ch have moved they have no intention of moving they are there long term they see the future there 
They're raising their families there. This is their this is their homes, like everybody else. So they, but they need, but they need the option to be able to get their equity, to be able to move, to use it in certain ways, like anybody else, and especially them because they're low income. Why are we positioning them? So, so by doing this, reducing some of the restrictions on the periods of affordability, that allows them to be able to tap yes sooner, equity. yes okay. sooner, and you get an equity loan sooner. And you're not you're not trapped with so, that. So the recapture recycle model that you mentioned, you said that they, the, these residents don't get uh, the windfall. They do not. Um, so let's let's sort of take me through an example. Let's say a person buys a home for um, let's talk, take Trinidad. What homes are going for what in Trinidad? How much would you all two, say at my two home? Two or three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, okay, and they want to sell a few years later, and the home is is it for four hundred? Four hundred. Okay. Let's say four hundred. Make the math okay. a little easier. So they buy they buy it uh, what? Uh, two hundred thousand or one hundred fifty thousand, whatever it is, mm -hmm. the home's worth four hundred. Okay, all of that subsidy, everything, the HBAP program, everything they got from the city, everything that we use from the city to develop that is paid back. Okay, and that that difference in what they bought it at, at the hundred fifty and the four hundred, also comes back to the city. Okay, so they get the whole, uh, the whole, you call it subsidy, they get the whole amount, and then. The buyer gets any equity that goes above the 400. That's their, the, that the market creates that. That's their home ownership. That's what home ownership is. So is it like the difference between, I guess, what is it, the appraised value or in the actual <coughs> sale price? Or? The actual sale price and appraised value at the time comes back to the city. That's what they call the windfall. Oh, so what, what actually, I guess I got confused. What actually does the buy? What actually does the um, the homeowner get? What, what's any the, equity, any growth in the appraised value from the market price gotcha. above at the time that of comes, sale that come or not? That's uh -huh. the risk that comes to the homeowner. Okay, the low income homeowner. Okay, but yeah. everything else comes back. They're not getting anything free. That's a that's a misperception, and it's terrible. So if my house appraises for uh, let's say four hundred thousand dollars that I purchased at one hundred fifty. Um, but it sells for 450. I get that 50. You get the 50. Gotcha. Okay. And the city gets the rest. As, I mean, what the city puts into it sometimes it's two and three, four times as much more. It's a, you know that the city gets back. Okay. So it's not like the, the city's not losing money. They're not, and these people do not flip their properties. They're not. They are not speculators. Okay. These are these are our, our solid citizens that we need to invest in. Really quickly, because I'm over my time. But in terms of the definition of distress, I don't know that I don't know that you respond to that. Do you? Do you twenty percent. It's twenty percent of the poverty area throughout the city. On the Mount Pleasant Strip, where I live, I've lived there forty three years. We still have low income people there. That's a pocket. Those are folks that are part of the city. So we're going to exclude them, right? Mm -hmm. No. And there's affordable housing being built there now. And so that it's 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 based on the poverty uh, rate, and we went through that over and over again with all these groups and came up with this, and we compromised. Okay, so so you all are still there. You, you think twenty percent is fine? As far yes, as uh, throughout the city, most of it is in seven and eight. That and we, you know we've got to recapture this. Let these people be owners over there, so they cannot be pushed out when gentrification comes. Ownership means that you have a long-term commitment to this, and you will not be pushed out. Can I just, if I could, Madam Chair, because I'm going to have to leave shortly. Ask one more question. Um, I don't, did anybody speak to uh, Bill um, uh, 20 594 the disposition of district land on this panel? She did. I did. Okay. Yes. How, how do you respond to the concerns raised by DC Building Industry Association? Mm -hmm. Um, that you know we have a baseline program like the inclusionary zoning, mm -hmm. um, but we also, I think she mentioned in her testimony, uh, Ms. Mallory, that these requirements would impose avoidable conflicts with other affordable housing programs in the district. I'd like to hear some more of the specifics of that, quite frankly. But my position as a, a nonprofit affordable housing developer is that the greatest cost, the one that, that increases what the per unit costs are for the affordable developers um, are the land or the or the acquisition of the land and that piece uh, and the, of course because of the supply and demand there is not as much land as uh, I mean, there was a limit on that and to, to those of us who are developing 
in the public interest who are intentionally serving across all income levels and will work in any neighborhood, but also know that, you know, if, if, the, if we can in some way um, have it that that's a responsibility of the district um, that owns the public land or has the surplus property and is able to contribute that to reducing the actual unit cost of developing the affordable housing, we think that's a good thing. We think that will help create more affordable housing. I think that if it's, um, it is saying though that um, um, as with the, the Walter Reed community planning process where there are multiple forms of housing that are going in there, market rate, single family home, affordable senior, affordable rental, homeless, permanent supportive housing, you can have a mix of that if you intentionally plan it and, and, and make the land resources available for that. I, I'm, I, I actually think that having participated in that process over the last four years, that is something that can be done with other tracts of public land and surplus property. Okay. Now, I appreciate your comments, and thank you for indulging me, Madam Chair. I'll just say really briefly, though, that that's been one of the criti criticisms of this bill, is that, mm -hmm. you know, the folks in the affordable housing advocacy community, and, and, and myself, and in introducing it, we have these laudable goals of a percentage of uh, affordable housing with publicly disposed of land, but we aren't considering affordable considering developers and how they finance their deals to be able to produce these units that we're requiring them to do so. So I just wanted to put that out there and hear mm -hmm. uh, how you all respond to that. But thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bonds. Um, thank you. Um, I have no questions of the uh, panel. I think you've done more than an adequate job of helping us to understand this mystery, which is how do we reach affordability of housing in D.C. and to learn that it is more than just what we consider the poor people needing housing. It's everyone who needs housing and should have the option for um, housing across the city. I thank you very, very much. Thank you well, very thank much. thank you all. And uh, Reverend Jim, you uh, alluded to this as well, and uh, the reason why we're so committed to making sure that the district, in, in part of our affordable housing discussion, um, we're always talking about um, home ownership. Um, I, our committee was pleased to add an additional $300,000 to Thank you. Um, HFAP, and the Committee of the Whole found another $700,000 right. to add. Thank you. Um, so that actually gets us back to where we were a couple of years ago. Great. Um, and the committee also expanded um, the amount of the loan right. um, from $40,000 right. to $50,000, which will, which will help a little bit. Um, and I frequently share the story that one of the best decisions I ever made in my life was to find a good neighborhood. I was able to buy a house for $125,000 um, using a first-time home buyers yes. program. It's, it's NACA. And so I'm right. trying to bring my mind to figure out, to remember what the requirements were right. at the time. I, I can't. Um, but I know that I qualified, um, and I wasn't making a lot of money at the time, for a, a loan that was below what was the, the market rates at the time. And so that, the existence of that program um, and first-time home buyer support that talked about how people save, how you save right. for the repairs that your home will need along the way um, has, has made all the difference to me. And like it sounds like many of your clients, yes. I'm there 14 years later. Yes. Um, and so we know that that is how people in the District of Columbia can grow wealth, um, can afford to stay um, in their homes. And as I, I look out, and hopefully can, can make, um, can become a, what was it, a sensational senior, mm -hmm. that that house, um, I'll own it by then, um, it's, it's, it's will make up a tremendous amount of what I have. So they can aspire to be mayor too. Yes, everybody. <laughs> can aspire to be mayor too. Yes, Great it's model. True. It's true. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Frank Damaris, Ted Baldwin, and Sharon Becton. Sharon Becton here. Okay. Matthew Yo or Yeo? Is Matthew here? Okay, Matthew. Okay, Mr. Damaris. 
Thank you and good afternoon. Um, and uh, Council Chairman uh, Bowser and Council Member uh, Bonds, we very much appreciate the attention to the uh, Amendment Act to the Housing Production Trust Fund 20-604. Uh, I work with MANA and I've worked there working with affordable dwelling unit, affordable home ownership issues for 11 years. There are two significant enhancements to the Housing Production Trust Fund approach, the length of resale restriction and the recapture. They've been discussed significantly this morning. The resale restrictions have been a material deterrent to the sales of properties that MANA develops. The five-year restriction will dramatically improve the ability to invest our funds, our effort into neighborhoods and count on sales. The resale restricted home buyers realize they really must stay through the end of the restriction period to realize true home ownership benefits and allowing them to remain a future homeowner. There are very specific attributes of home ownership that people expect and having the ability to become a future homeowner is a big part of that. The formulas that are used in the affordable dwelling unit uh, structures with the Housing Productive Trust Fund, the shared equity models, mirror income percentage increases which lag significantly behind home price appreciation, which is the whole purpose for the resale restrictions. Mathematically, the resale restricted price caps the amount of equity well below what would be necessary for that homeowner to move to a new home ownership unit. This is just specifically the math that goes with compounding the increase in home prices relative to the allowed increase in the resale price. That means that sellers of resale restricted property will be one-time home buyers. They will be temporary homeowners. They will not be homeowners in the future. Uh, when they sell that, they return to being a renter. Homeowners realize that, you know, they think they've started climbing the ladder, but when they sell during a restriction period, you get a step back off the ladder to create a space for the next person to step on the ladder temporarily. The only ones who truly realize the full benefits of ownership are those that are there at the end of the period. The Amendment Act addresses this challenge by reducing the restriction period to five years. Developers and home buyers take these risks in these neighborhoods and they are needing to expect that they will be treated reasonably and uh, they will have the opportunities that they associate with home ownership. We fully support the current definition of the distressed neighborhoods. 20% uh, poverty is a, a significant poverty rate in a, in a relatively small neighborhood. It has to find the neighborhoods where it's been the most difficult to work with. Um, and we believe that the amendment has some language for mm -hmm. the executive office to manage that appropriately. Secondly, the Amendment Act introduces a recapture. This existing equity recapture replenishes the Housing Production Trust Fund. As was mentioned, this takes out any windfall discussion. This is not money given to the, to the home buyer that the city does not get back. So equity earned after the day they move in belongs to the homeowner. They have to invest in the property, they have to maintain the property, they have to invest in their neighborhood in order to earn anything on the property. So with this act, the developer can more aggressively commit to the distressed neighborhoods. The families can more comfortably commit to the distressed neighborhood investment and the district to look at it, the Housing Production Trust Fund as a revolving fund, which it has not been in the past and will allow the creation of additional home ownership and other housing in the future. And this is the opportunity for financial security that home ownership has always presented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Baldwin? <coughs> Yes, good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Person Bowser, for letting me testify, and thank you for uh, co-sponsoring this uh, uh, disposition of district land for affordable housing amendment, which I think is really uh, a step forward for the district. Um, it's as an affordable housing developer for more than 30 years, it's encouraging to have a bill that standardizes income serving requirements for public land at reasonable levels and acknowledges that the federal government will not be the source of new funding to serve these income levels, and so local governments must begin to fill the gap, and could encourage the most proficient nonprofit and profit-oriented developers to compete for prime city-owned sites. Uh, there's no doubt that the rents from the under 30 percent of median income levels will not fully support the unit construction and operating costs. At uh, five to seven and a half percent of the unit total, I believe these units can be absorbed within a total development budget. There's always relief provision available through the district's CFO 
if adequate subsidy and land value or additional funding sources are not available to bridge the gap. The cost gap this will also be faced with the 30 to 50 percent of median units, especially in high-rise settings. The bill's main benefit is that enough of these required units could be produced on higher value sites to encourage significant production levels. Uh, returning, uh, shifting over briefly to the Affordable Housing Preservation and Equity Accumulation Act, um, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the short affordable housing time frames really are, are fairly frightening. I worked in Montgomery County, we saw 15,000 affordable units produced in the first 30 years of our inclusionary zoning bill out there all lost to affordability, and uh, the, the windfalls were tremendous, uh, need, I, need I say, and those units never replaced. Um, specifically, I request the bill be amended to eliminate the cap at 15 years of affordability and restore at least 15 years of the bill. I'd eliminate the five-year cap within distressed neighborhoods and keep the distress designation at 30 percent for those below the poverty level not reducing it to 20 percent and thereby including more gentrifying neighborhoods. Also, we had consideration of a more relevant indicator of distress in the homeownership market by using low sales price as a measure and that that data can be gotten from the OTR of Office of Tax and Revenue. Uh, making these changes will permit the continuation of promising approaches to long-term affordability, such as community land trusts and other deed-restricted homeownership models that share equity. An important part of the competition for awarding limited public subsidy funds could be the longest term of affordability, especially in an era of increasing gentrification in so many areas of the district. Thank you. Thank you. Is it Yo? Yeah. Yo. Yo. Okay, Mr. Yo. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Bowser and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Matthew Yo. Uh, I am a partner at the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson and a member of the board of directors of the D.C. Appleseed Center for Law and Justice. D.C. Appleseed is a nonprofit public interest organization that addresses important issues facing residents of the national capital area. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to present testimony in support of Bill 2594, the Disposition of District Land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013. For several years, uh, D.C. Appleseed has worked to ensure that the district benefits appropriately when it uses public land to subsidize private development along the Anacostia waterfront in connection with the AWI project. Uh, through that work, we have come to view, uh, we've come to the view that the value of public lands should be used to address important public needs, including producing and preserving affordable housing. That is why we are pleased that Councilmember Council McDuffie and his colleagues uh, introduced this act. Our experiences working to uh, ensure affordable housing over the past few years uh, suggested to us the need for the legislation that is now before you. This act guarantees that whenever the district subsidize private, subsidizes private development with public land, the district will achieve an important benefit, namely increased affordable housing. At the same time, it also recognizes the need for flexibility uh, in cases where fulfilling the requirements is not feasible. And it does so by providing a transparent mechanism to ensure that affordable housing is realized to the maximum extent possible. The proposed legislation would make affordable housing a priority whenever the district disposes of public land for less than its appraised value for multifamily development of 10 or more residential units. In other words, it commits the value of the land subsidy received by the developer to support affordable units. In such dispositions, at least 30% of new units must be affordable if the property is near transit access, and at least 20% of new units must be affordable in all other cases. The reason for this distinction is that property near transit is more valuable and therefore is a greater subsidy uh, to the developer. This act targets households uh, which have the greatest need for affordable housing. In the district, one in five households has a severe housing cost burden meaning that they spend more than half of their income on housing. And more than 90% of those households with a severe housing cost burden are those earning less than 50% of AMI. Accordingly, under this act, three-fourths of affordable rental units must be priced so that low-income house, uh, households, those at 50% AMI, will spend no more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Uh, One-fourth of rental units will be priced affordably for very low-income houses. Uh, the other key aspect of this legislation is that it provides a flexible, 
transparent process for cases where it may not be feasible for a developer to meet the affordable housing requirements. And this really comes out of our experience. Uh, in such instances, the mayor may waive the requirements if the CFO certifies that the property's value is not sufficient to uh, support the affordable housing provisions, uh, but nonetheless uh, to ensure that uh, the affordable housing is maximized under the terms of the disposition. This, in our view, is an important innovation in light of the uh, experiences that we've had over the years with a lack of kind of transparency and insight uh, into the, the, the process by which these types of uh, decisions are made. Uh, so cutting it short there, I see I'm out of time. Uh, thank you for your, your consideration of my uh, testimony this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for each of you coming down to testify, and I have copies of your written testimony. Uh, Mr. Yo, let me just um, pose a couple of questions to you, and I recognize the D.C. Appleseed has have been involved in these issues for a number of years. Um, and talk to you about the different goals that the city might have when we are involved in a development project. Um, in some neighborhoods we go in, people are starved for retail, um, and they want to have retail on the site. Um, or there's, or what they, another thing that they talk about is a, a certain kind of building construction um, as, a, as an amenity that, that could be offered on the site. In other words, uh, different communities argue for different um, amenities offered on, on public sites. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience with that in, in oh, stop there. We, we do. Okay. Uh, and this, this is an issue that came up in connection with the Anacostia Waterfront Project, where there were a number of public amenities that were meant to be uh, subsidized, at least in part, from the transfer price of the land. Right. Uh, and then the question becomes, how do you allocate uh, the portions of public subsidy from the land to each of those different public uses? And what we discovered is that that is a very difficult uh, bit of financial analysis, even for people who are very sophisticated in, in this field, uh, to break down that subsidy value into different streams. And the reason why this is relevant here in part is because, as I suggested in my testimony, we're familiar with situations where developers have come back and said, you know what, the, the public, the land value isn't sufficient to um, support the public goals that you want us to achieve. And short of coming up with a very complicated formula, which, which we've looked at other jurisdictions, we're not aware of any other jurisdiction that has managed to do this, we think, at a minimum, the involvement of the CFO's office ensures a, a degree of financial sophistication and independent analysis of how those different subsidy streams are being utilized. Okay, because in the, the, the category that I was searching for and didn't, couldn't find um, just a second ago was uh, parks mm -hmm. and green space. Um, and so the, the, the question that comes to us when we're looking at these economic development projects is, yes, we want affordability, um, but we also don't want to build units where we've taken so much of the subsidy out that we've built the concrete jungle. Um, and so we want parks and green space, and we want it to be programmed and managed at, at a very high level. Um, and in many corridors, what, what people are really starving for, and I hear this sometimes, is uh, we, we don't want any more housing. We have enough housing. There's enough people here already, enough traffic. What we need is a grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that sometimes those, those things go hand in hand. Uh, but then the, the development community come back and they'll say, we, in order to make these projects work, um, we're going to need the city to help with the retail. Or we're going to need, if we, can't, if we can't build on that acre or that six acres um, of, of land, in order to make this project work, if this is a high um, priority for the city and a high priority for the community, what are we going to do um, about parks? about the park space, you know, and this is a very real example of a proposal that's been going around in the community that there are many people who want a big, a large park space, and then I had the development team come back and show, well, we had to get rid of that senior building right. because we had to add more park space. 
Um, and so this, this is the balance. There is so much subsidy um, or land value on, on public lands that, that can be transferred. And so the balance that we'll have to create, and that's, that's one thing that we need to look at in, in this legislation, is making sure um, that there is a, a way to also include um, the other priorities that we have in the district including hiring, including small business mm -hmm. involvement. There, there are so many things that we can leverage our public land and procurement to achieve um, in our city. And affordability is uh, high on the list. Uh, but I just want to state for the record that there are other things um, that the community will want us to achieve as well. Mm -hmm. But thank you for your testimony. Thank you all. Uh, oh, actually, I'm going to need to turn to my council member, Anita Bonds. I Thank you, Chairman. I have no questions. I thank you very, very much. All thank understood. You. Thank you. Okay, Michael Winchek. Oh, I'm sorry. Who's who am I name? Sharon. Okay, Sharon Beckton. Okay, Miss Beckton. Okay. Is Michael Winchek here? Okay. Why not check? Winchek. Winchek. Okay. And Jeremy Greer. Okay, Ms. Becton, we'll hear from you. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the opportunity, giving me this opportunity to speak on Bill 2604. My name is Sharon Becton, and I purchased an affordable home in 1990, which I still live in at 13th and S Northwest. I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to have something to call my own in the city. Um, during when I purchased my home, I had a two-year-old son at the time and now and had a daughter shortly after. I found out about my home from a woman I used to carpool with, and I saw the properties before it was completed. <coughs> and I went through um, Manor and HPAP, and my process and everything was smooth. My credit was in good condition, and I received my keys to my place several months later. When I purchased, I was thinking long term, something for myself and my children. But back in 1990, if you know anything about 14th and S, we had a lot of issues. We had a lot of drugs and prostitutes. I actually thought about leaving the area, but I said, well, you know, let me hang on in here. And as you all know, that area has changed, which I'm glad I stuck it out. Um, and when I purchased my property, we had a, a short, um, restriction period, but I was able to um, refinance and get money back and pay HPAP, and UDAG paid my closing costs, and I had to pay them back as well. Um, it was good to be able to have, um, have access to my equity. Um, one of, I have put one child through college. He's now working on his master's. My daughter is at UDC. And the way that my home is, this is going to be my retirement home. I do not plan on moving. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Winsack? Winsack. Winsack. Yes. Okay, Mr. Winsack, we'll hear from you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bowser and members of the council. Um, I'm here to uh, speak in support of the Public Lands Disposition Bill. I'm uh, Michael Winsack, President of Winsack and Associates Architects and Planners. We are uh, architects who specialize in affordable and mixed income uh, development, and I want to talk about the cost of construction that everybody, uh, a lot of developers will tell you, make this unachievable. We've done over 50,000 units in the last 20 um, some years, and over the last four years, 70% of that has been mixed income, mixed demographic. Um, this bill would make the city a forerunner in the creation and advocacy for true affordability and mixed income um, and recognizes the lower income targets that otherwise would never be proffered. And, and it, it creates the mixed income, mixed demographic without displacing people from their communities. Um, the, one of the uh, 
programs that the city already has is the new communities initiative, which unfortunately hasn't really taken off, um, but really recognizes similar issues here. And when they were all bid, a lot of developers came in and showed that they could make this work. Um, I hope that something like Park Morton can go forward quickly. Private developers, smart private developers, are already looking into this because they've started to realize that the high-end market's overbuilt already, and we've got to start making buildings that are affordable for everybody. So this is an example of a booklet that we've created for one of the large for-profit developers that shows them how to do things more affordably so that they can achieve this kind of mix within their communities. Um, and still create award-winning design and a place that people are proud to live in. Um, and then we get a mix throughout the entire project, not within specific buildings as we did for the first 20 years of my career, but in single buildings where we've got everybody mixed together. Smart design, such as the stuff shown in here, and, and smart financing can keep the subsidy that the, the city would have to put into the land much lower. And so recognizing that and giving uh, points to teams that recognize that I think would be very important. And then finally, um, these formal guidelines that this puts in place will attract actually smarter developing and design participation and teams who otherwise have never participated in the public land disposition um, area. Um, and so I think that this bill actually uh, should be the precursor to changing IZ because IZ doesn't recognize, IZ at, at the percentage that it has today doesn't recognize what this bill recognizes and this could be a a demonstration project to show how IZ could be changed in the future to meet the needs. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Greer. Thank you, Chairwoman Bowser, um, Councilwoman Bonds. Um, I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Corporation for Enterprise Development, um, also known as CFED. Um, CFED is a nonprofit national organization that focuses in on empowering low and moderate income people to build wealth and assets. Um, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today to talk about the importance of home ownership and how it's become the leading way in which low and moderate income um, individuals build wealth um, and pursue economic mobility. Simply put, um, communities, communities of color across the country and in the District of Columbia aren't building wealth. <laughs> the, large, the racial wealth gap that exists in this country has been a place for millions of families and has put them in a persistent state of financial insecurity. At CFED, we recently released our annual Assets and Opportunities Scorecard, which profiles state data on household financial security. The data shows that two out of every three families of color are liquid asset poor, meaning they have less than three months' worth of savings. The absence of savings directly corresponds with the lack of assets and wealth accumulation for communities of color. And currently, white households have nine times more net worth than um, families of color. This trend is on, and this trend has only begun to get worse. A recent study by the Urban Institute found that in 1983, the average wealth of white families was $230,000 higher than the average wealth for African American and Hispanic families. In 2010, that wealth gap increased to over 500,000. In other groundbreaking um, research, Thomas Shapiro from Brandeis University and tracing um, the same families for over 25 years found the total wealth gap between white and African American families nearly tripled between 1984 and 2009. Council members, home ownership has been mentioned many times today is very important in the development of wealth. It is a cornerstone of the American dream. It provides many families with the safety net as well as the stability to invest in their futures. Unfortunately, this dream is largely inaccessible to many households of color. Nationally, only 46% of households of color own their home, um, compared to 72% of white households. Here in the District of Columbia, 36% of households own their home, as compared to 48% of white households. Further, for those who are able to achieve the dream of home ownership, a disproportionate share of their wealth is invested in their home. Home ownership accounts for about 53% of wealth for black households nationally, and compared to 39% of wealth owned by white households. 
Home ownership is made possible in large part by public dollars invested at this local, state, and federal level and has significantly enhanced the wealth of communities of color and low-income individuals. I'll close with saying with something that we say at CPD often, um, income helps families get by, but savings and investments help families get ahead. Wealth provides families with the access and to opportunity and to security to invest in their dreams. There's a significant lack of wealth in minority communities in, across the country and in the city, and home ownership can really change that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and I, I want to thank all of you for, for coming down. Um, Ms. Becton, uh, you put a, a face to why we're working um, here every day to uh, continue to invest in first-time home buyer programs, um, and you made a very smart investment, um, and uh, we're all proud of the progress that certainly has been made in, uh, in that corridor. But you also put a face to why it's important to maintain affordability, <laughs> right there, because if um, um, where we are concerned about um, how people will be able to buy into that neighborhood. And so um, thank you for, for, for doing both. Thank you thank all for you your time. testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Fine. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you. Very, very interesting. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Leslie Steen. Good to see you, Ms. Steen. Um, Kelsey Colley. Oh, we heard from Ms. Campbell already. Um, Cheryl DeHaven. Cheryl DeHaven here? Okay. Ms. Stan, it's a pleasure to see you again. Please, nice to you. see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Council Member Bowser, for chairing this, this hearing and um, fellow council members. Um, I'm pleased to be here. I'm a longtime resident of the District of Columbia, former housing chief under Mayor Fenty, and for over the last 40 years, I've been a housing developer. Um, I've developed approximately 4,500 units in my career, and it's ranged from market rate condos to affordable housing. I specialize in pre preservation of affordable housing and mixed income housing for revitalization of communities. Um, I'm, today I'm pleased to be here about three of your bills, um, and in particular I want to address uh, noting the short time, I want to address um, Bill 594. Um, as the district's population grows and real estate becomes more and more expensive, the statistics are more compelling. I, I applaud the strong response of the Council in considering today's um, bills to provide affordable housing for our residents. In particular, um, Bill 594, um, provides an opportunity to create new affordable housing. If you review the housing production report, you will see the vast majority of our affordable housing efforts are concentrated on the preservation of existing affordable housing stock. And this is housing largely located in the less affluent parts of the district. Affordable housing is is reliant on government resources, moves slowly, and has difficulty attracting risk capital. As such, controlling land and receiving entitlements to create new affordable housing is extremely difficult to achieve. The use of government-owned land is one of the few mechanisms that can assist in creating new affordable housing stock in locations rich in resources, such as good transportation and jobs. We need to use this precious resource for the extremely important social and economic goal of creating new affordable housing. Once the government parcels are developed, the opportunity will be gone. 
we we have to get it right the first time one change i would like to make in the bill is that it needs to be clearer and more explicit that the mayor is required to provide to include affordable housing and transfer the ground at less than for, full market value in order to accomplish the goal um, with reviewing the bill with a number of people that didn't come across as clearly as I thought the bill was intended on page 4 line 16 the word may should be changed to shall this law needs to be clear in its intent that the cost of affordable housing must be the first public good that is paid for by the value of the land if the value of the land cannot be reduced um, far enough to accomplish the housing called for other sources of public funding such as rent subsidy tax exempt bonds housing production trust fund resources can be considered to accomplish the goal before it's abandoned while the develop while development every development is unique if the housing goal is to be funded first it can be achieved the loss of revenue rents or sales proceeds is offset by the reduced land cost under this bill the numbers will work in the vast majority of locations and where it doesn't there's a relief valve if some extreme circumstance were to occur the bill provides for the CFO to review and a waiver if necessary Cer and finally the certainty of the law will allow developers a level playing field so that they can compete effectively this bill makes good public policy sense and will be economically feasible you'll have to read my written remarks on the other two bills thank you okay thank you miss Dean Ms. Colley, are you Ms. Colley? No, okay. uh, Professor Colley could not attend. I will be testifying in his stead. What's your name? Barbara Sterling. Okay. Are you presenting your own testimony? His testimony. Okay. Um, I, I don't typically allow that because I, you won't be able to answer questions about it. Well, he had a medical appointment which didn't allow him to attend. It was the last minute. Okay. Um, well, I'll make an exception. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And tell me your name again. Barbara Sterling. Okay, Ms. Sterling. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the council. I'm representing Professor Kali. Um, I am a member of the Ward 5 Steering Committee of the Senior Advisory Council appointed by Council Member Kenyon McDuffie and a resident of the Wesley House Senior Apartment. I'm keenly aware of the financial difficulties experienced by several District of Columbia seniors who have expressed their inability to pay their rent and to make ends meet while living on a fixed income that barely covers their expenses. Many of these seniors receive less than $35,000 annually and pay approximately one-third of this for rent. Utilities, food, clothing, transportation, and medical expenses account for more than half of the remaining two-thirds. Seniors are a growing population in this country and especially in the District of Columbia. They are living longer, contributing far beyond the expectancy of those in this age bracket. They have made contributions to the workforce of this city, have helped to make it a beautiful, viable, healthy community in which to live. The passage of this legislation will make it possible for many low-income seniors to live a dignified existence in affordable housing. I am not I do not support this legislation on my behalf, but on behalf of those less fortunate than I. I believe the impact of this legislation, though minimal, will go far in assisting many people who have given much to the development, maintenance, and solidarity of their beloved city. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for um, presenting that testimony. Mr. Mm -hmm. Haven? Thank you. 
Um, good afternoon. You just make sure your microphone is on. It should be green at the bottom. It just is. Push it's up. on. It's on. Okay. If you just sit a little bit closer, okay. maybe. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. My name is Cheryl DeHaven, and I live at the Wesley House Senior Apartments in Fort Lincoln. I am here to address the urgent need to have the Hapus Bill passed. For many seniors living in the city, it is becoming increasingly difficult to find real decent affordable housing. I have spoken with several seniors saying that because of the high cost of rent, they need another living in their apartment to share the cost of rent. No one should have to live out their senior years this way. I am 66 years old, living on Social Security and a small retirement, but I still need a part-time job just to keep a roof over my head. And I am getting very tired and weary. With a recent increase in my rent of $40 per month, I have exhausted almost all of my income. My wish is to be fully and comfortably retired and not stressed out over the high cost of housing. This city is rapidly becoming a place for the very rich with no room for renters with a household income under $80,000 per year if nothing is done for the rest of us. I have worked in this city for more than 42 years, with the last 14 years serving those with mental and physical challenges. I work from my heart as my job for me is a labor of love. This is a very needed service in D.C., but unfortunately, not a well-paying job in this field of work, which makes it hard to find an affordable, comfortable, and secure place to live. This is why I am pleading with you for your help. Times have changed and so has the cost of living so drastically that seniors on fixed income, such as me, are finding it really nearly impossible to continue to live in D.C. We need the city in which we have worked and served for many years to support us, recognize the input we have had in making the city as great as it is, and show us the re respect we deserve. Um, I turn to you, our elected officials, and plead with you to hear my cry and pass this bill to alleviate the housing crisis in this city for seniors needing this support so badly. We are D.C. Please don't dismiss, dismiss us. Help us. Please pass the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Senior Act of 2013 now. And I thank you for your time and thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haven, and thank you for coming down. Um, and uh, I know that we're going to hear from a number of your neighbors, but you, you represent a lot of people across the District of Columbia um, that fall into the category that you're not in um, uh, public housing or have a, a, any type of voucher. Um, you live in a senior building, um, which is a beautiful senior building and is well maintained. And um, I know that people are, are very happy to have safe um, housing, but now the affordability issue um, for your housing uh, is, is causing a lot of concern. Um, so we talked about one possible incremental step that we can can make in, in getting um, HAPIS enacted, um, but we're going to continue to, to think of, of ways um, to help. So thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Steen, uh, thank you for your service uh, in this field and certainly to the District of Columbia. Um, and we have um, your, um, and I appreciate the, your testimony on the land disposition bill. How, you heard my earlier question to, the, to Appleseed about achieving other goals that the district has in the use of its public land. Do you have any concerns that putting these requirements in place would hinder us and also um, incentivizing retail or park space? I think, I think as an elected official, you have a difficult balancing act. Um, you, you have to make choices. Um, but I think when housing is going to be built on public land, affordable housing should be there and should be part of it. Um, and maybe I need to read the bill, but I don't think it's saying that all public land has to be housing. No. And so if you are, if you are saying there's going to be public, uh, going to be land, I'm sorry, housing on public land, 
then a percentage of it needs to be affordable. Um, if, if there are other demands, uh, the East End Library, I saw costs that went for operating the library. Um, that can come from other budgets. Um, uh, we need affordable housing throughout the city. The demand is huge, the need is huge, and if we don't use public land, we, we, won't, have, we won't have another opportunity. Um, retail, retail can grow up as housing comes in. As new development happens, the demand for retail will come. If you look at the Shaw and the Logan Circle area, the housing happened first. The retail came after it followed. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if it were my choice, I wouldn't prioritize retail over, over housing. Um, parkland, I, you know, I think maybe the city should study where parks should be, look at it on an overall basis, and plan that out. Um, there are some city-owned parcels where parkland should be part of it. Um, and hopefully there's enough land value to accomplish all the goods. But there's so many sites that have been public land where we have lost the affordable housing that was intended that something has to be done to, to make sure that it does happen. It becomes the last priority, and then it doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bonds? Thank you very much, um, uh, Wesley House. Um, members <laughs> having been there and understood your, your issue. Ms. Dean, I just wanted, if you could just sort of elaborate a little more on this whole issue of affordability. You're mentioning that as it relates to public land, you, you feel very strongly that um, it should be a clause in all of the laws that stipulate affordability should be considered and therefore we should have affordable units. <laughs> Are you thinking the units that are at the 30% AMI or 50% or 80% because many of them will say we're at 80% or even 120% of AMI and therefore qualify as affordability um, units. So I was just wondering what that means to you. Well, I think that I think the income levels proposed in the law are, are good and valid um, and should be addressed. We, we don't have many mechanisms that can reach down um, to below the 50 or 60 percent of AMI which the tax credits address and so we have tools. Uh, there, are, there are neighborhoods where 100 percent or 80 percent of AMI is market. Um, and so it, the, the lower income levels need to be addressed and government resources are needed for them. There may be times that additional money might be needed, a rent subsidy might need to come in. Um, but we, we need tools to reach to lower income levels and there are just so few of them. The federal government's basically given up on it. It's on our shoulders to do it, and if we don't do it, we won't address it. Thank you very much. I, I needed that on the record. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much, team. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Phyllis. Phyllis Wynn. I'm sorry? Phyllis Wynn is not here. Okay. And I know you said I can't read hers for her. I would, so I would, I you can submit it. Are you also okay. on the list? Yes, I am. Okay. And what's your name, ma'am? Violet Harris. Violet. Okay, Ms. Harris, you may have a seat. Um, Phyllis is not here. Is Priscilla Bragg here? Priscilla Bragg is not here. Okay. Um, Violet Maddox. Linda Smith. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Ms. Smith. Ms. <coughs> Audrey Jewell. Audrey Jewell. Okay. And Ms. Redman. Oh, Ms. Jewell, is that you? Hi, how are you, ma'am? Thank you. 
Come come again. This is Miss. Okay, that's fine. So that's okay. Yes, that's so fine. Don't you don't need to, and we'll have it for the record. Um, and Miss Redman, you would be next. I'm sorry. Oh, that's one. That's one. Okay, um, Ms. Redman, would you like to go first, mm -hmm. or is there any order that's preferred? Um, I prefer to go in the order that's on the list. Okay, that's, okay. that's perfect. Um, so let me make sure I know who's here. Ms. Harris. Yes. Okay, Ms. Harris, I'll hear from you. Good afternoon. My name is Violet Harris, and I'm representing the residents, some of the residents of the Wesley House, and um, and myself. We as seniors hope to live at a decent place at a decent rate that allows us, allow us to um, purchase our med medications, fresh vegetables and fruit other foods and pay our bills. Uh, personally, I fall in that category as well. My monthly, my, I'm sorry, my yearly salary is about $26,000. Monthly, I bring home uh, $2,200. Once I pay my rent, rent which is nine fifteen, and then I have transportation costs, I don't have very much left. And it's, it's a thing of do you pay, when I pay my other bills, it's that do you pay your rent? I mean, do you pay your, do you buy food? Do you buy your medication? I I don't mind I know I have to pay up a place to live but I want to have to be able to do some other things it's not a whole lot that I want to do but I just want to be able to to live comfortably but I want to be able to once in a while go to a movie, buy a, a pair of shoes, buy a dress, just once in a while. Just the little things, not much. So for us seniors that are living where we are now, we don't want to have to move somewhere else. A lot of us are a paycheck away from being homeless. We don't want to be homeless. We would ask that you pass this Havis bill so that we can stay where we are and not have to go somewhere else. And a lot of times when we go to look for something else, it's higher than what we're paying now. If it's not higher, you don't want to live there. Because it's worse than where we're, a lot worse than where we're living now. And it's just not presentable at all. So please pass this Havis bill and help us out. Thank you for your testimony, ma'am. We appreciate your testimony. I'll have some questions for you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Smith? Yes. Okay, we'll hear from you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Council Member Muriel Bowser and Council Member Anita Bonds. My name is Linda Smith. I am 66 years old, a native Washingtonian, and I live at the Wesley House Senior Apartments. I have lived there for almost five years. I am here to show my support for Bill 20-622, the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013. <coughs> 
I presently do not receive any type of rental assistance. I receive Social Security retirement benefits and I am self-employed part-time as a tutor. I am a recipient of Medicare benefits as well. My rent is $915 per month. When I moved in in 2009, my rent was $850. My rent has increased 65% or almost 1% of the original value. Of my Social Security benefits, I spend 59.92% each month for rent. This has occurred since September 2013. In August 2014, my rent will be increased and I will probably spend over 61% of my Social Security benefit for rent from August 2014 through August 2015. And so the rent continues to increase each year. As seniors mature, their health seems to need more care. Preventive medicine seems to be the medicine of the day and with that goes seeing physicians in order to keep a body well. I have five physicians who look after me on a continual basis. Four of them are paid through Medicare. Another expense is a 20% copay that the Medicare benefit does not cover. This can mount up and never seem to end. It is very important to look after one's health. Prescribed medication and proper healthy foods are other expenses which are vital to healthy living. The Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013 will assist seniors in many ways, some of which are rent, medical bills, prescribed medication, and food. Financial health is also important to seniors primarily for emergency situations which can occur at any time. Seniors may be more prone to emergencies. Also, I would like to say that spending only 35% of one's monthly income on rent seems to be a very, very good solution to the problem so that seniors may be able to live a sound life. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Redmond, I also want to extend to you uh, extended time as I know you've been uh, one well, of the principal you much. proposers of thank you. Uh, what's before us. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Bowser and Council Member Anita Bonds. I, uh, I'm going to do some paraphrasing here because I think we've pretty much a lot of things have been covered. But uh, uh, I'm the founder of Seniors Organized for Solutions Now Still Emerging, uh, a group of seniors throughout the District of Columbia. You've met a lot of my neighbors because I live at the Wesley House. And this issue, uh, well, we started out three budget seasons ago. We came down, we asked for $100 per household for 43 people uh, from the local rent supplement program and weren't able to get it because you just can't do that for a group of people. We were uh, uh, told by Council Member uh, Yvette Alexander she says, who wouldn't want to help seniors, but we can't do that just for your building. Y'all need to go back and do some work, and we did. And so uh, uh, three years later, we're sitting here, and I just cannot tell you, I know that you're up against it. I do. Uh, but I just can't tell you just how grateful I am that somebody finally heard us and that somebody had the courage Somebody had the courage to introduce a bill that was actually put together by us. And so um, uh, I'm so sorry that Councilmember Wells is not here. And forgive me if I be, uh, become a little emotional, but these are my friends. They're my neighbors. And while I don't need the subsidy that this program will give them, I don't want them to end up where I did, which was at CCNB for 18 months. <laughs> Okay, excuse me. These are not bad tears, these are happy tears. And so first of all, I just want to, uh, Councilmember Bonds uh, and Councilmember Wells, if you're listening, Councilmember McDuffie, I just want you to know how grateful we are that you had the courage to introduce this bill. I want to thank Councilmember Alexander, 
Council Member Grasso, Council Member Graham, and Council Member Orange for having the courage to co-sponsor it. And so I wonder why we felt a little reticence coming down here today because actually that is the majority needed to pass this bill into law. Um, and so after conferring, uh, especially with you, Councilmember Bowser, I know how busy your schedule is. And I'm so glad that you took the time out on Saturday to come and sit down and listen to my neighbors about why they need this program, about why it needs to be a standalone program as time progresses, but how their needs are so dire and sometimes that they will take exactly whatever you have to give. Senior citizens are a proud group of people. Many seniors have never had to ask for anything in their lives. And so it becomes more and more difficult when they come down here and sit before the council or write the mayor or invite you out. Thank you very much for coming out, Council Member uh, Bonds. And it seems like to them that they're not being heard. And so what we try to do with our, in our collective wisdom, and you know, it's a lot of years among us, what we tried to do was to make it as easy as possible for you to address this issue. Sometimes I think the district needs to create an, uh, an entity that will build and rent housing in this town. It would strip out a third of the cost and uh, uh, the federal government did it. We can do it too. I mean, you know, if, if Hope Six projects are going to eliminate some of our public housing units, and not all the time, I know that it's supposed to be a unit, you know, unit to use replacement, but sometimes that just doesn't happen. And sometimes if it does happen, it doesn't have the level of affordability that the public housing, the traditional public housing unit did. And so, not to stray too much away from the subject, that uh, uh, this hearing to me is one of the best hearings I've witnessed or come to in a very long time because it has, it has on the table four, four or five pieces of legislation that's dealing with affordable housing. And what we did years ago, Ms. Bonds, is that while we were out there taking care of everybody else, we were out there taking care of everybody else. We took care of the young folk, we took care of the middle folk, we took care of the old folk, but now that we have become old ourselves, and the uh, federal resources that used to be there to help us, they're not there, and it just seems like the young folk don't care. And I, I, I hope I'm wrong. But I'm going to go to just a couple of paragraphs of my uh, testimony, if you don't mind. Um, let me figure out where that's going to be. Because that, there's something that we did back in the day, Council Member Bonds, that I really don't think we realized what we were doing. We thought we were doing the right thing, and I think this is the perfect time to go back and visit it. I hope you won't mind that I bring it up, but we've been listening to it for three years. Every time we've come here or talked to anybody about creating a subsidy program for seniors, or when we first came looking for local rent supplement support, we can't do anything. We gotta take care of the homeless, okay? We gotta take care of the homeless, and we wanna take care of the homeless if they belong to us. But back in the day, we, I don't know how much council member Bonds did, but I know what I did. We worked very, very hard to get a law established to give the right to shelter to everybody in the district. We did that, and we were very proud of it. And I'm still proud of it. But what we didn't do was, we didn't have the foresight to know that the District of Columbia would become the panacea for Maryland, Virginia, Illinois, Australia. 
You know what I mean? And it, it would be different. I know if, 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 if we had hostels where we could give somebody coming through a night's sleep, a warm bath, a meal or something like that, that's one thing. But we have let this get out of hand. It's unmanageable. It's unmanageable. And I really feel for you. I really feel for you. But listen, it's time to put an end to this. It's time to stop it. Now, on May 15th, a Washington Post article pointed out that the district's homeless population was rising while our neighboring jurisdictions had declined. The same article said that Chairman Mendelson asked why. I was infuriated by that question. I was infuriated by it because we know that our numbers are climbing because theirs are dwindling. We're taking care of their homeless populations. And if we had the money to do it, wouldn't that be great? But we don't. The same article said that D.C. rents hit homeless families hardest. Well, we beg to differ because our experiences tell us that D.C. rents actually hit senior citizens hardest. Unfortunately, I fell victim to homelessness and took refuge at the CCMB shelter for, four, for 18 months. I was shocked and appalled by what I discovered there. Many people living in shelters are not really homeless. They simply choose to make the shelters their homes to escape the responsibilities for their lives. Now, are there individuals and families who truly need what we have to offer them through our shelter system? You betcha. But are there some people who are just plain taking advantage of our kind-hearted, ill-informed generosity? You gosh darn right there are. And you know what? This has got to stop because if for three years we've been coming down here, and we're very happy at where we are now, so I don't want that to get lost in, in, in what I'm saying to you. Each time we came down, we were told that we couldn't get local rent supplement vouchers because the vouchers had to go to, to the homeless population. And honestly, nobody wants anybody to be homeless. But honestly, I'm surprised Ms. Harris didn't say it. She usually says, maybe we should do what Hawaii does. And what Hawaii does is when, if we sent, or if I left right now and went to Hawaii, I'm gonna, I'm, went to Hawaii and I didn't have a place to live, they would give me a train ticket or a bus ticket back to D.C. <laughs> and so what I'm, what, Madam Chairman, I think what I uh, uh, am trying to say is, that uh, this has got to stop now. And I, I think that there's no more perfect time than right now as these bills that are for, before you are being deliberated <laughs> to really give some serious, serious, serious consideration to what are we going to do with our residents who cannot uh, afford the rents in this town. And so, I, but now, now in closing on bill, 20-622, uh, the Housing Assistance Program on, upsidi on unsubsidized, uh, for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013. Uh, we want this bill to pass, but now we understand, and, and, and we've toned it down a little bit. We, we understand that the funds are not there to fund the bill it passes into law. And so we're okay with that, uh, but we still want it to become law. And what, what, uh, uh, what, what we decided after talking to you Saturday and getting a broader understanding about some things and uh, some conversations that we've had in other places, we are more than willing to, in the interim, accept a carve out and the local rent supplement program so that my neighbors and seniors across the city, but 
And for everybody here, we're not just talking about the, West, the Wesley House, and I'll give copies of these to you all. I'm sitting here representing all these folk, and they live in every ward of the city except Ward 3, you know. And so I'll, I'll make copies available to you. This is very, very uh, 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 important to have. And, and the reason that it needs to be a standalone is so that as time goes on, that it doesn't get caught up in other people's agendas. We just simply want a, a, a subsidy, uh, a standalone subsidy program that people will be able to call upon when they need it. And with that, you have my written testimony. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Well, let I'll me just jump in here for a second, Mr. Okay. Redmond, because okay. I'll, I'll let you go over, um, okay. because I wanted to give you, I know you've been working on this, and yes, I know that as often as the case, uh, we heard earlier, a lot of um, uh, legislation that comes before the council is a uh, team effort. Um, and members of the community, advocacy community, come together with legislators to, to put um, issues before us. And um, this is one such case. I wanted to be sure that you, you could speak you. Um, for the people who couldn't be here um, and, and put your, your issues on the table. I also appreciate that you um, uh, have been extremely thoughtful about how you've come to the table um, with this issue. Um, and the legislation um, does that. And I, too, would acknowledge all of the co-author and co-introducers of the bill for um, saying and putting on the table so that we could have this conversation. Yes. I think everybody's sentiment um, that uh, the District of Columbia should uh, make sure that senior citizens aren't pushed out of the city, especially when you've um, dedicated and invested your, your lives um, in the District of Columbia. You also put on the table, um, very important, because you have a long history in, in D.C. and in policy, um, what, what we also have to be careful of. Um, and that is making sure that when we make a promise and we make that commitment, that not only this year, but 20 years from now, we're going to be able to pay for that commitment. Yes, ma'am. Um, you used the example of a right to shelter law. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so now what we have to come up is a way that we could put a program such as this in place that doesn't create that, that, mm -hmm. that, that same um, issue that we have. Because we know what, what happens. Um, when we have, and there are other programs that have been um, in the intervening years um, that would put so much pressure on our budget that we wouldn't be able to sustain them. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what we're faced with now, um, is making sure that we're able to do that. Now, the, what I promised, the number I promised to give to you, which I don't think I still have from the Housing Authority, okay. um, was looking at the list from the Housing Authority that's about 70,000, um, they're going through a process where they're scrubbing the list, uh, though the director says that she believes that it's not going to reduce much, um, that she thinks it's pretty um, up to date, which means at least 70,000 people in the District of Columbia have come forward and say they need housing assistance. Um, the Housing Authority is able to look at um, the number of senior citizens that are in that group and probably get down to all the criteria of, of people who have come forward to say they need help. Um, now, one thing you pointed out to me, and I think you're right to do that, um, that a lot of people who need this assistance, it never occurs to them that they should go to the housing authority. Right. Okay, because they never have. And so they may not, there may be some un, um, unmeasured need out there because they're senior citizens who never went to sign up for the list because they didn't, you know, they didn't know that they should. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a, just another um, whole group that we don't even know about. Um, so what we want to figure out and um, how the, the bill, the bill contemplates a $5 million fund. And at the end of that, and you know, one of the authors is here, so I'll let Ms. Bond speak to that. There's kind of we have to figure out who who could get it, right? Because if it's a five million dollar fund, you know, necessarily at some much. point it runs out. So how are we going to determine um, all the people who meet those criteria who are going to get it? Um, and so the the only as I was thinking through this way that I could could see doing it was to use an existing program mm -hmm. where there are people who have already signed up and been qualified and there's some subset at the housing authority who we know are seniors um, who would qualify um, for for that that subsidy when it became available um, so that's that's kind of where um, 
where, where I, I am with it now. Could please respond. Yes, I will respond. That's why we need to create hope. Hapus. Hapus doesn't have a waiting list. We could do a, we could do a pilot. We could. But what does that mean? Is it first what, come first served? No. What that means is that well, it is first come first, first served. But the people you see sitting with me and sitting behind me, they've been coming for three years. And and so I don't know if there are existing regulations that would allow them to be determined as pre applicants. But if not, then. Um, I don't know how, how it's still done down here, but perhaps we can um, we can do a pilot program, uh, or you know, to figure out a way because that that is the main reason that we're proposing a housing assistance program for unsubsidized seniors because okay. it's fresh out of the barn and and um, uh, it would be a shame. Let me just say this: it would be it would be more than a shame. It would be a sin that the people who've been coming down here have been working so hard to get this assistance because they need it. If it was put in place and they were not permitted to participate and yet go on a waiting list. Uh, I don't know, maybe we can pass a law to fix it. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's, that's good feedback. Yeah. Let me turn to Council Member Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. This is very tough, as um, been pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all very much. We we do understand and we know that the need is there. Mm -hmm. I guess um, my question is more in line of where um, Chairman Bowser was going, and how how do you propose we create a system where everyone who might be in need, such as you, would have an opportunity to participate in this without there being a wait list. Have I'm you really given any thought to that I sincerely? Have given, I have given thought to it and I would say that coming out of the barn, the cost to the district will be um, one half of one percent of, of the, our locally funded budget, which would be at around 30 to 35 million dollars coming out of the barn. Well, well, let's say we have thirty-five million dollars that we could devote to this. Mm -hmm. What criteria would we then use oh, in, the in order to make this workable and accessible to seniors on fixed incomes who find that their in their um, rent is escalating? At and at what level would would we be able to? Okay. I think the bill. Do I have to do? I think thirty-five. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, uh, senior would mean a District of Columbia resident that is sixty-two years of, of age or older, and uh, the program contemplates two levels of incomes for the provision of vouchers. One will be at or below fifty percent of median. And the next level will be at or below 30% of median. Uh, we have the numbers spelled out in the bill. Uh, Correct. And then, and then um, that senior would have to be able to demonstrate to the city that he or she or they have been residents of the District of Columbia 36 of the last 60 months. Um, uh, we try to answer all of your questions. Okay, I, I think your your bill does address um, the the categories to to some extent, but I guess what I'm more concerned with is how would we apply it, and how could we apply it so that a senior, not just at Wesley House, would have an opportunity. I mean, what kind of criteria should we be looking for in order to um, make the application? Um, and pretty much and how would we identify you? Okay, pretty much the same the same criteria that the local rent supplement program has. It's pretty much the same, except for the the residency requirement. Okay, so uh, you're speaking of perhaps a set aside with the similar requirements in the local rent supplement program, but the set aside would be specific for persons who are 62 years of age and older? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, and, but, and, and if it's a set aside, I don't, 
I don't, uh, we probably need to, to discuss it further because time won't permit it here. Mm -hmm. And that's for the, that's the only reason how we ensure that the people who are asking you for this program, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear. If we can do a carve out, and I want to be clear about something I thought I heard you say, uh, Council Member Bowser, that you had uh, been in discussions with the chairman and that there's, there may be the potential for <coughs> some carve out of a million dollars for FY14. Did I hear that right? And I'll share with you uh, okay. what we're going to, the reason okay. that I didn't, I, I want to make sure that we're going to be able to have the support that we need to move forward. Okay. Um, but what, what the amendment would do is the, the follows, and I, I want to be uh, fair to Chairman Mendelson. I, I okay, did to him in passing. So okay. he hasn't okay. sat down and read or studied this okay. or said anything okay. more about it. Um, but he, he did, he was aware of HAPIS and uh, the issue and was willing to <laughs> To, to entertain a further discussion about it. So let me say that. So the authority, this is what it would say chiefly, the authority, the housing authority shall dedicate no less than $1 million in fiscal 2015 of new or unfilled project-based, sponsored-based, and tenant-based vouchers to benefit very low-income seniors 62 years of age or older who are paying more than 30 five percent of their income um, in housing costs. So that's chiefly, I think, of the the population that your bill mm -hmm. um, seeks to um, seeks to identify. Now the second part of the, the bill would say that the authority should would develop rules to determine um, how those referrals, uh, how it, how mm -hmm. the program would operate. Mm -hmm. So how it would take referrals, um, which DC agencies prob probably okay. uh, the Office on Aging, okay. um, or the Department of Human Services, or its own list. Okay, okay. so that's how um, okay, the then. senior would would go. Now, what it what it doesn't do, um, and I know that you are. Um, have been uh, rightly persistent about this point, um, and I, I don't know that there is a way to carve out any particular seniors um, or any, living in any particular um, um, senior building, um, and because you know, as you can imagine, that that would. Be no, fair. we understand the legal okay. implications of that, um, um, and we, we've been very careful and prayerful, uh, but. So now that she's answered that question, I can finish uh, answering your question, Council, uh, Council Member Bonds. I, um, I guess roll it, rolling it out, maybe we really do need to look at it uh, in, a, in a demonstration mode. Um, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we can carve out some, uh, some vouchers, from the local rent supplement program specifically to place in a demonstration, then um, whom I, I, I would I would see a nonprofit provider teaming up with uh, a, a, a partnership being established to determine the uh, eligibility requirements. And please know this too, where we where where we started out with 43 households asking for this assistance. It's, it's been cut way, I mean, cut, it's not, well, I don't know if the need is still there now. I can just say that the persistence has dwindled down to about 50% of that number. Uh, and, and so I think that, that, that that's something that we would need to discuss and talk to, to your uh, legal staffs and, um, and things like that. But what I, what, what I want to say is that we truly do appreciate how far we've been able to come since December 17th on this issue because it's hard. I know it's hard for you. Uh, uh, we all know that it's hard for you, but we're counting on you to make something happen uh, for for us. For us. So um, this, you're right. This is very tough, and it's tough because. You know, government has to be open to everyone and give right. everyone an opportunity. And so that's the tough part. And that's what I was really asking. Mm -hmm. How do you see us being able to do this? And and I perhaps if we have a limited pot of money, which we will. I um, believe that, Council Member Barnes, I believe you can treat the people who've been actively working to get this done. It's not like they're saying, you know, will you put this or that together for me? They're saying, 
I need this. I believe that uh, I believe that 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 we can look at some construct where they actually can be treated as pre-applicants, and that pre-applicants become applicants in a demonstration project or in a pilot project or however. I just I just believe. I, that. I think your idea of a pilot project may have some validity, some usability. But um, again, there would be no guarantee that everyone at your you know, location would have the opportunity. We understand that. Because the criteria will be just that. It will be a criteria. There will yes. be some that may be. Yes. But, but I, think it's a, I think it's a great idea to figure out how we can help. And we, and we have to come up with something ultimately anyway to help. Um, our goal as government is to keep people in their homes yes. and not to move people out of their homes. And so with that being a basic uh, premise of, you know, housing affordability, uh, I think you can be assured that we'll do what we can, but it's just figuring out the nuances. These are not very easy issues, really and truly, <laughs> if we are going well, to open Barnes, it to if everyone. If I may, and then, and then I, I know you've got to move your, the witness list along, but if I may, what, what, uh, what vehicle did you use? when TAP became the local rent supplement program to make those to make those vouchers strictly available to homeless families. So I'm thinking that something along that framework could be established by this council to say that this we're gonna carve out this money and we're gonna make that money available. But we already know at the Wesley House that whatever level of funding, if any, that we're able to get into in any form to help with their with their rents that everybody that's been asking for it can't have it because of the limited resources but what, okay, but what let, let me jump in for a second because i think mm -hmm. that um we've we've gone over a we've couple gone, of rounds okay now. oh yeah um, and i wanted to say uh, thank you to 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 you all for your testimony i think that we've gotten some important questions answered thank you yes, very much mm -hmm. thank you very You're much welcome. thank you thank you Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Commissioner Young, did I? Um, I'll take a quick, uh, probably minute. But you're next. I'm okay. Oh, you're not. Well, we. I have the. Um, um, well, I'm going to proceed. Uh, but any people can feel free to come in and out of the room as they need. Uh, Ms. Pulse? Mr. Gregory? So the question was asked, and it's a legitimate one, if um, the committee is going to break um, for lunch. Um, during um, this hearing, now, it's usually my my practice to um, take maybe a 15 minute break at, at some point. Um, that but Council Member Bonds is here, so she may take the gavel um, for me at some point, so so that we can continue. But you should feel free at any point um, to to come and go from from the room. If uh, you you we have the witness list available, so you can kind of gauge um, where you are in the list. If for some reason you think I've called your name um, when you were out of the room, just let us know and we'll make sure you're added, um, added back as soon as you return. Okay, Commissioner Young? Yes, um, I was going to say good morning, but it's good afternoon. Councilmember Bowser and other members of the committee. First of all, I wish to thank Councilmember Wells, Bonds, and McDuffie for introducing this piece of legislation, as well as Council Members Alexander, Graham, Grosso, and Orange for co-sponsoring it. I truly think it would have been nice if all the members of the council signed on as co-sponsors because this is such a, an important issue of our seniors and um, being a senior in today's economy, and I am one of them, soon to be 74 years old, is more than a challenge. I thought that these would be carefree years. I've worked since I've been 16 years old and only recently retired, kind of retired as ANC Commissioner and Tenant Advocate, I'm quite busy. Thanks to a very generous boss in my later years, I had a good salary and a pension plan, which hopefully will see me into my 80s. However, I am fearful that I will not be able to live in this city, which I really love, in particular to the extremely high rents. I am currently paying 55% of my monthly income 
that's the severe category, to rent. And that percentage goes up every year. I have reached a point where when I go to the supermarket, I ask myself, can I afford $1.50 for one orange or almost $5 for half a gallon of milk? Clearance shelves with almost out-of-date items is looking more attractive every day. This is not how I or any senior should have to live our senior years in the District of Columbia. As an ANC commissioner representing only multi-unit buildings and the chair of my tenant association, I hear these same stories from many, many other people. This is a crisis about to unfold in our city and we need to get a handle on it now. As for the bill itself, I feel that the definition of very low income for one person is too low. I would suggest $40,000. This would line up with the Schedule H amount, which goes into effect this year, and the Schedule H increases to $50,000 at the beginning of 2016, and a two-person household up, from 40, up to $45,000. The same is uh, for the extremely low income. Why not make it $25,000 and $30,000? And the reason I say this is that there is a strata of people who just fall outside of that 3750. And I think we need to be concerned because they are the next group of people who are going to be in need of assistance. I have attached for your review the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities DC Federal Rental Assistance Facts for 2009 and 2011. If you compare these two studies, you will see the persons who have the highest increases in percentage are the elderly. If you look to the bottom portion, where it shows that in 2009, 14% of elderly people paid more than 50% of their income for housing, and in 2011, there were 21%, that's an increase in two years of 50%. If we extrapolate that out every two years, we, have a, uh, we are at critical mass at this point for homelessness for the elderly, and it's going to happen very soon. I have worked with other tenant advocates over the past 12 years or so, and on occasion we have also met with members of AOBA. When we meet with them and we point out to them the issues we face, they always respond that it is the city's responsibility to subsidize tenant shortfalls. In essence, we are taking taxpayer money and putting it into the pockets of landlords and management companies. I believe we need to engage them on the social responsibility that businesses have in order to be responsible partners with government and the people. Also, and this is something no one has yet to mention, we need rent control reform. Everything begins with the law. If the laws are not fixed, we can nibble around the edges forever and ever, but we will never fix the main problems. In listening to the folks from the Wesley House, I discovered that they are not under rent control, so everything is going to be out of control for them for the coming years. Even people in rent control can't afford to live in our city any longer. So I really would like to encourage you know, the legislative changes that need to be made. And you know what they are because we've met with you on many occasions to express our concerns to you. We need rent control reform. We need it now. We need to begin with the 2%, the hardship petitions the capital improvements, the voluntary agreements, all of these laws need to be looked at comprehensively. This is where our problems are stemming from, and this is the result of it, is what we're hearing today. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Gregory? Yeah. Oh, Ms. Poles, yeah. if either, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Cynthia Poles. I'm the president of a small tenant association in um, Adams Morgan and active in, the, in a coalition with uh, various tenant activists seeking reform of the, uh, the city's housing laws. Um, I, I think to an extent uh, today's hearing really underscores the dilemma, which there's a lot of focus on these great programs like the Housing Production Trust Fund and the like, all of which are designed to create new units. That's actually a really slow and arduous process to deal with our, our, our crisis in affordability. It will take forever to, to create new units, and of course new units only stay affordable just so long. So that's a little bit of a, an elusive response to the, to the problem that we have. Uh, so we'd, we'd like to repeat our, uh, our, 
uh, re request that this committee get, get serious about rent control reform. That's where most of us live in units that are subject to rent control. The laws are weak. As, as Mary pointed out, the... Uh, Can you the say most? Who are you referring to? Most of us? Tenants. Okay. Um, there's about 90,000 units that are under rent control. Uh, <clears throat> as Mary pointed out, the Wesley House is not subject to rent control because it's built in 2009. It's falls outside of the law. That's one of the issues that needs to be looked at is, is adding newer buildings to rent control. So, you know, you can start to subsidize them, but if the landlord's not subject to any controls, you're just sort of feeding the monster, in essence. Um, <coughs> turning to the particulars of, of, the, of a couple of the bills that are before you, the, I, I like the, the HAPIS uh, bill. Uh, I think the idea of a pilot project is probably the only way to go, given the limits on financial resources. Perhaps couple it with some kind of a lottery to get around the question of how do you uh, <laughs> decide who gets the, the limited funds initially. But I think a pilot would give you a, a, a better sense of the need and, and, and the administrative issues associated with running a program like that. There are a couple of obvious things about uh, the particulars of the bill. Uh, I wondered why you don't, don't just plug into the existing definitions uh, that are in the Housing Production Trust Fund for uh, extremely low income and very low income, as opposed to using particular numbers that are not dynamic and wouldn't adjust for inflation as it goes forward. Uh, I wondered why, why limit it to just one and two person households? That's sort of an artificial thing. Um, and, you know, long term, I, I think you would want to look maybe even to going beyond the, the very low income people, but recognizing the limits and resources, that's, that's not going to happen immediately, but that's something to think about. Um, then um, I just wanted to mention briefly the 20-713 the, uh, uh, that no one's talked about, the bill that would provide a billion dollars uh, to, uh, to uh, improve affordable housing. Uh, I, I like certain features of that bill, which was that it had a 10-year plan and had a guaranteed funding and the like. But when we, we looked into the details, um, there were a lot of flaws, relied on lottery proceeds, and lottery proceeds are only about $65 million a year. The bill needs $100 million a year, so you're sort of starting out, it doesn't work. So, so, so if there were a way to, you know, you probably have to shrink it if you're going to deal with lottery proceeds or, or find some other uh, funding source. But, but I, I did like the idea of 10 years and a systematic approach to developing affordable housing. So there, there were good, um, interesting uh, features there that, that I think are, are worth uh, working with. Um, but otherwise, it didn't define affordable housing. It had, just had a lot of, lot of flaws. But conceptually, there were a couple of, of good ideas there. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Gregory? Yes, thank you. My name is Tom Gregory. I rent my home and apartment here in D.C. Landlords continue to raise rent at rates much greater than inflation and continue to see themselves as a special class that gets special privileges at the expense of the rest of us and sadly have maneuvered the council and D.C. laws to help them do so. Some landlords are ethical and some are not. As a group, they have not been acting ethically. I think that you council members should stop favoring those landlords that are unconscionable. Tenants have long complained about landlord greed and about legislation that allows and promotes landlords to charge rent increases well above inflation year after year after year. DC laws still allow landlords annually to increase stabilized rents well above inflation and even compounded year after year after year. Still guarantee landlords 12% profit on their property equity when you and I get an average of one-tenth of one percent on money market savings accounts. That's a national average as of this month. That's a hundred to one difference. And still allow landlords to force us tenants to pay for major repairs and replacements to their property in addition to our paying rent fees. That's not leasing or renting. There used to be a myth that D.C. rent stabilization laws were generous to tenants. 
but the sky high rent rates in DC and the high landlord profits have exposed that fantasy for what it is. A group of tenants met with representatives of the Landlord Association. The tenants asked the landlords to act ethically. The landlords replied that they would if incentivized to do so. That's a direct quote. Now, reflect on this. How would you react to investment companies who are defrauding the public, or con artists, or bank robbers, who said that they would be good if we paid them enough? Much of the legislation being considered today includes some assistance to the needy. Yes, yes, bravo, needed. The need and desirability of, of affordable housing is, is obvious, I think, to all of us. But notice that in these bills, the taxpayers are required to subsidize the greedy who are still demanding that their income rise faster than inflation. We need to focus on the lack, on the causes of the lack of affordable housing. Not just put lotion on checking pox or give a pain, only give a pain pill for appendicitis. In these bills, let's ask some questions. How much correction of the greedy actions is there? And what remedies of the continuing cause of unaffordable housing are in these bills? Where is the promise and long delayed rent legislation that removes ridiculous and unethical policies that promote the income gap? And finally, and, and I think sadly, where is that rent reform legislation that a majority of the council favors but is perpetually postponed by this very committee? Uh, I, I'm not a, a familiar with a piece of legislation that says rent reform. When a group of us 30... Is there, is there a piece of legislation for rent reform in this when, committee? No, just answer that, Mr. Gregory. Is there? All of the makings and preparations that we gave to you when last year, when a group of 30 tenants, representative of tenants throughout the city, and when you were going to meet with six representatives, which we quickly got for you, mm -hmm. to write out that legislation. The preparations are there, the research is, my colleagues can tell you a lot about that. Uh, that's been ready and the, our meetings for that have been postponed and postponed and postponed, perpetual postponement and uh, I don't understand why. We've been ready, we've been offering, you saw the need to that when we, when we mentioned the 12% guaranteed income which is so ridiculous, when we talked about the 2% on top of 2% compounded so that the rent rates go up like this, inflation, inflation is natural, it's going to happen. And I think the owners of rental buildings deserve a fair response, a fair return. But when it's built into law that their returns go up like this and the, and the inflation goes like this, and it's built into law. I tell this to people in the district and people outside the district, they can't believe it. They say, no, 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 you can't possibly understand that law. It couldn't exist, but it does, and it continues. And no wonder we're struggling with affordable housing because look at the very basis that's built in the law. People try to get attorneys that in some way can fight against these landlords, but the landlords have the law on their side, and it's, it's not ethical law. Okay. All right. Do you have any questions, Ms. Bonds? No, I, I don't really have any questions, but I, I understand your testimony. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you your testimony. Very, very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Campbell? Oh, Mr. Campbell. Sorry, Mr. Campbell. Valerie Clark? Is Ms. Clark here? Farrah Fosse, David Bowers, <coughs> Megan uh, White de Vesquez, <coughs> Megan here. Edith Cromwell.
Dewan Mason. Yeah, Kayla Glick. <coughs> Kayla here. Right, right, right. That's right. Bua Benitier. Mr. Campbell, we'll hear from you. Madam Chairperson, a pleasure to be here to testify in support of Bill 2594, the Disposition of District Land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013. My name is Jim Campbell. I'm the principal of Somerset Development Company, a private real estate development company based in Washington, D.C., and specializing in market rate, mixed income, and affordable housing development. Somerset has nine properties in the district with approximately 1,300 apartments completed or under development. I've worked in the development and financing of housing for over 35 years, including investing several billion dollars uh, of union pension capital through the AFL-CIO investment trusts in new housing development around the country. Um, I will jump over the discussion of the need, um, which is so compelling, but others have articulated very well, and we know the, um, uh, the need and the, the importance of response uh, so well. Um, the district, like all cities and states, has limited resources to address the issue of affordable housing. Fortunately, the district, through the Housing Production Trust Fund, Local Rent Supplement Program, and other programs, has demonstrated a commitment to producing and preserving affordable housing. However, those resources are vastly outstripped by the need. Any additional resources that can be brought to bear and used to facilitate the production of additional affordable housing is extremely important. The disposition of public lands can be a substantial source of support for additional affordable housing. The key question is whether the set-aside percentages and the income targeting specified in the bill are economically feasible. Based on our recent experience acquiring properties for housing development in the district, we believe the percentages um, of the set-aside and the income targeting are feasible. In certain cases, unique site conditions, location, or other factors might make it infeasible. Those situations can be easily demonstrated and under the terms of the legislation, and they want the CFO to certify that it's not feasible to comply and the mayor to waive the requirement. In private market land transactions throughout the district, the land value can be as high as 40% of the total development cost per residential, for residential space with inclusionary zoning requirements incorporated into that value. In prime locations, land value can be as high as $200 per residential square foot. While this clearly varies across neighborhoods, much of the district commands land values that, if written down in the disposition process, would adequately compensate the private developer for the, for the set aside of 30% of the units for affordable housing. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate what Ms. Steen said, that the importance of the legislation to be clear, that that write down uh, of the land value and disposition process uh, is, is stated clearly as opposed to discretionary. Real estate investment decision making uh, is relatively straightforward. While well, the projections and all the variables are subject to an intense due diligence review, ultimately the decision uh, for the investment in a real estate development project is driven by the metrics of one, projected cash and cash return, two, the projected multiple at exit, or three, the projected internal rate of return, or some combination of these. While requiring the set aside of affordable housing reduces the income side of this equation, Allowing for land costs to be written down correspondingly reduces the other side of the equation. The loss of revenue is offset 
and the project economics can be calibrated to still hit those return benchmarks for the investment decision. In cases where there's not sufficient imputed land value to fully offset the loss of revenue uh, from meeting those investment benchmarks, a knowledgeable developer could access the entire menu of affordable housing funding programs to make up the difference or seek a waiver under the legislation if such resources are not available. Having a prescribed percentage of affordable housing required, as long as there's a waiver mechanism in place, has the advantage of allowing each prospective developer uh, in a land disposition RFP to evaluate the remaining land value with the same working assumptions. The developers would then have a known and level playing field, and the district can then compare responses to a solicitation on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. All right, thank you, Ms. Mr. Camp. I'll have some questions for you. Mr. Bowers? Good day, Chairman Bowser and members of the committee. My name is David Bowers. I'm a Ward 6 resident, and I am testifying today in my capacity as the Vice President and Market Leader for Enterprise Community Partners. And I also currently serve as the Chair of the Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board. I come in today to offer a few points of consideration as you consider the multiple bills. First, regarding Bill 20-708, I heartily applaud you, Chairwoman Bowser, for introducing this legislation and the co-sponsors for trying to identify a potentially larger stream of funding for the trust fund, which is necessary to enable developers to help the district meet the goals outlined by the Housing Task Force. The commitment of consistent, reliable public resources is vital. The Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board has been meeting monthly since the end of last summer. We've discussed with a number of key stakeholders various options to best leverage trust fund and other district government capital. There is real momentum with public and private sector stakeholders around various tables to leverage trust funds, housing production trust fund capital, and ensure they have the most impact in meeting the affordable housing needs of low-income district residents. This is an opportune time to enact legislation that will provide a stable flow of trust fund capital that can be used to leverage private capital from financial institutions and foundations. Uh, creating a steady, dedicated stream of funding for the trust fund, as mentioned, will be critical to hitting the 18,000 unit goal by 20 2020 outlined by the Housing Task Force. One recommendation for consideration that has been named before, uh, the named sources in this legislation would still be somewhat volatile and therefore I recommend using them in combination with the dedicated portion of the deed transfer and recordation tax that has been used for the trust fund historically and the surplus dollars identified for future years in the Budget Support Act in total to provide at least $100 million per year for affordable housing production. Uh, regarding Bill 2713, with similar 20-713 with some similar goals, I would uh, suffice it to say suggest that the council work off of Bill 20-708 um, and not go down the road of restricting the flexibility of the trust fund by having as many carve-outs that are listed in that bill. I will note that uh, there are eight council members this year that express support for investing $100 million annually in the trust fund. Uh, we have not seen as many of them as visible recently in the FY15 budget conversations. The most effective way for D.C. to ensure sufficient and stable levels of funding is to commit ongoing general revenue. We need to get to at least $100 million. Uh, in the spirit of time, I know the rest of my uh, uh, testimony will be in here for the record. Let me just say as it relates to the disposition of land, uh, Bill 20-594, um, would say that the district should treat the land price as an upfront capital subsidy, uh, point one. Point two, to the point that was just made, the legislation currently allows a mayor to waive set-aside requirements when the CFO certifies this would not be economically feasible. I uh, would suggest that this loophole, uh, potential loophole, actually be closed and that the exemption should more clearly require that maximum affordability shall be met uh, with all due diligence. Again, seeing that I've gone over time, I'll respect that and say that the rest of my uh, testimony testimony is has been submitted thank you mr. Bowers and I'll turn to mr. Benitez. I will say uh, the room has is about half full now and much cooler and so I have asked um, our staff to get the air down I, I guess you'll hear it click off in a second so just hold hold tight all right mr. Benitez. Uh, good afternoon madam chairwoman uh, I actually have two testimonies for two different bills so um, I would go to them very quickly um, the first one is on the Housing Production Trust Fund baseline funding. Again, good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Buru Benitez. I am the founder and managing principal of Dante's Partners, a real estate advisory and development firm 
that is that remain dedicated to preserving and creating affordable housing in the district to district residents of modest means. I'm here um, since 2006. My <coughs> company has helped create approximately a thousand units, mostly funded utilizing housing production trust fund. We love producing such units because it turns out that the pillars of our society need decent, safe, and affordable place to call home. Selfishly, it is the most gratifying thing I have ever done. Given where the red hot market is at the moment, rental rates, land, and property costs have risen beyond the point of comprehension. And sadly, I've read two recently published articles of landlords opting out of their project-based contracts with HUD, adding to the shortage of affordable HUD units. This bill creates a vehicle by which we can adequately compete with our market rate counterparts, creating our very own war chest that allows us to confidently execute and produce units quickly. In order to stem the market rate tide, we ought to be made a priority for everyone who cares about affordable housing. My most recent experience with market in the Hodge, our 90-unit active adult community located in Shaw, and another project in Columbia Heights, 28 luxury affordable apartments, we received a total of 545 inquiries for the former <coughs> and nearly 400 inquiries for the latter. That's over five to ten times the number of units we have available to rent. The issue we continue to face is not due to the lack of renters, but lack of available units. To think that a 90-unit senior facility will be listed up in less than six months is no doubt remarkable, but for the most part, sad. Sad because we've got another 400-plus seniors who are desperately and actively looking for similar accommodations. By setting the baseline limit on HPTF, we ensure the following. Predictability of knowing that a minimum number of units will be created each year. Same for the number of jobs created each year and help to create a diverse and vibrant community. However, with these funds, I also implore the council to also entertain the following. An automatic tax abatement for both for-profit and non-profit affordable housing developers. At the moment, this is only this, this benefit is, is only um, uh, made to nonprofits. Um, creating limits that will fund and produce housing for individuals earning between 80 and 100 percent of AMI. Investigate efficient ways to finance smaller size deals with taxes and bonds because currently such transactions make it cost prohibitive to finance as a standalone deal. Reevaluate taxes and bond deals from, from a cost standpoint. In the interest of time, I want to say if we truly care about the people we serve, we all need to collectively figure out a way to become more efficient at delivering these units because before affordable housing shortage reaches the level currently experienced in New York and San Francisco, the district is still a highly desirable place for lenders and equity investors alike, and this is evidenced by the very attractive rates we recently secured in our affordable transactions. For those of us experienced in this realm, we know how to maximize this opportunity and do so for the benefit of DC residents. I am extremely proud of the fact that my company has leveraged HPTF to private funds at a ratio of four to one. Thank you, Mr. Benitier. I know you have other testimony on the um, Affordable Housing Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act. Might I just ask you to turn to um, your recommendations sure. on um, the bill? Absolutely. Well, from, from I know everyone is in the room and anxiously. I think from my 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 standpoint is we need to first and foremost think about the buyer of the affordable unit, and that's the perspective in which I am coming from. And in order to make things smooth for the buyers, I think we need to establish a clearinghouse of some sort that clearly illustrates to potential buyers, with and without HPAP, the necessary steps needed in order to qualify and be approved for a unit. The fact that I have to work with different housing agents, housing counseling services each time I produce units make for a very unpredictable process for me and the buyers. Note that renters currently have RAD, I currently have the Rental Accommodation Division within DHCD to turn to for questions regarding rent controlled units. The same clearinghouse would also serve as an agency to buy and sell just the affordable units. This helps tremendously because there is a because there is because demand 
just because there is demand does not mean that we currently have qualified buyers waiting in the wings. Adopting the strategy ensures that the affordable units are preserved in the long term. Providing a fixed return on the sale of the units based on the length of stay in the home, hopefully this should satisfy those wanting to create some level of wealth for affordable homeowners, as well as the argument that folks are reaping huge rewards on the backs of taxpaying citizens. I know another concept that has been floated around is the whole concept around shared equity. Though a good concept, I still think that um, a shared equity of considerably higher than 25 percent should be should be revisited. Um, that's that. Those are my recommendations. However, again, like I want to say, my perspective is that of the buyers um, coming looking at that. So. Okay, <laughs> so let me ask you a few questions. Sure. So you've produced affordable housing using the Housing Production Trust Fund, yes. um, that uh, where the units are subject to this 15-year restriction. For sale. For sale. Yes. You have. Very few. Very few. Yes. Um, so tell me from your perspective, trying to sell those units, what is the problem the that problem, you face? The problem that I face constantly are twofold. Number one is being able to... You, the fact that these units are restricted is not a compelling enough of a reason for a buyer <coughs> to buy these units. There has to be additional incentives being put in place for someone to acquire a unit. And one of the one of the examples that I gave you is I recently just produced an affordable home ownership unit, and I had a buyer who was qualified to 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 buy the affordable unit, but she opted to buy the market rate unit because she did not want to jump through all the multiple hoops that she would have to in order to acquire the unit and dispose of the unit. What was the difference in price, though? Oh, um, you're talking about the difference between for the affordable unit, 171,000, and for the market rate unit, 250 thousand dollars. So it's a significant savings on a mortgage payment overall. <laughs> but she just she just didn't want to deal with the process because there isn't a clear path right now, and that's that's why I keep coming from the. It's it's an attractive vehicle. I don't want I want people to to understand me. Having affordable ownership is a good thing, but we don't have a clear process in place to acquire and dispose and qualify home buyers. Okay, so do you have any particular comment on eliminating that five, the, the 10 year to five year in distressed areas, removing that restriction? Do you think in the case of the buyer you reference or other buyers that that would, I don't know if your project was in a distressed area is, this, is, is defined by the bill or if you have any particular comment about it, that. It, it wasn't an emerging area. It, it, wasn't in, it wasn't in Red Hot, Columbia Heights, or Shaw. I mean, this property in particular was in Eckington. And, you know, we, I see my word, five council members mm -hmm. presented. Uh, we, 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 we've currently sold out our market rate units and we're still struggling with our affordable units, honestly. And so the issue is not to do with the neighborhood. Again, like I keep saying, I think the issue has to do with how we incentivize the buyers. So far, the buyers that have acquired affordable units are not as concerned about the fact that they have to be in the units for, and we have a covenant in place right now for 10 years. That's not the issue. The issue is it's taking them almost two to three months to actually move into their homes. Okay, yeah. I got it. Um, so let me uh, turn to the members of the council who are present. And I'll, I'll first go to Council Member McDuffie, who's a member of the um, committee, and recognize him um, for uh, five minutes. And then we, we've been joined by Council Member Tommy Wells, who's the principal author of one of the bills um, that we're considering today. And I'll, I'll turn to him um, after that. And Mr. McDuffie, can I just ask that when um, you complete your five minutes, you would turn to Mr. Wells, if I, if I haven't returned. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, thank each of the witnesses for their testimony. Um, I, I only have actually a couple of questions. I was in my office um, after the meeting and I heard just the tail end of your testimony, Mr. Bowers, and you mentioned you were talking about um, Bill 20 594, Disposition of District Land and Affordable Housing Amendment Act, and you mentioned the waiver uh, provision that is in that bill as being a loophole, and you made a comment about something that should happen. I just I couldn't catch that. If you don't mind repeating that. Sure. As, uh, thank you, uh, Council Member. So as I said in the, legis the testimony, legislation currently allows a mayor to waive the set-aside requirements when the CFO certifies it would not be economically feasible to comply. So this provides a, a loophole that could, could be exploited by developers and or government officials not fully committed to maximizing affordability 
the exemption should more clearly require that maximum affordability be met even if the CFO certifies that the appraised value of the property would not cover the cost of the affordability targets required by the legislation. As Jim said, and Jim is a real world developer, I mean, there needs to be the flexibility that could allow, um, you know, some flexibility to allow, but in our experience and conversations, that, that becomes a loophole because it, it's easy for, everyone's not going to work as hard. So someone can, it's easy for a developer to come in and say, to the, make a case, look, we can't get to those levels uh, of affordability and those numbers of units, and so we can't do it. And so we think that there ought to be more of a requirement and a push to say, we this is the target that the city has set forth, and to government officials as well as to the developers um, to work uh, really diligently uh, and not be so quick to kind of throw up the hands and say we can't do it. Okay. I mean, that's the last thing that, that as the author of the bill and, and having worked with a number of people in the community on this, last thing we wanted to have a, create a loophole um, and, and not to suggest that developers would want to exploit some opportunity to maximize their profits at the expense of creating affordable housing. Uh, I don't think anybody would want to do that. Uh, I'm hopeful. And, and I think I'm a little bit sarcastic, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, uh, um, <laughs> I think that you know we want to make sure the language is such that we can get the maximum benefit to what we're trying to do with 30% on public housing, uh, public land, or 20%. But if there's a genuine effort to try to get to uh, something that's required by the law, but they can't make it happen, then that's where the CFO comes in. And, and I do just want to add, it, it, sitting between these two gentlemen is a good example. So Somerset and Dante's partners are for-profit developers who do affordable housing. When you have large, particularly large public disposition, oftentimes the people who will come in and making bids are large for-profit developers who don't have a lot of experience doing affordable housing. So for them, who may have a more compelling bid because they can bring more to the table financially and win a bid, it'll be more, they're more inclined to throw up the hands quicker and say, we can't do that, as opposed to folks like these on both sides of me who do these every day, who may not have as large a balance sheet to win a deal, uh, but who can actually figure it out because that's what they do every day. Okay. And Mr. Campbell, did you testify or have a position on uh, Bill 20-594? The, uh, the disposition bill we were just referring to? Yes, I testified in support of it. Okay. Um, my well, does the committee have copies of your testimony? Or? Uh, I, no worries. I just wanted to make sure that I get a copy and I yeah. have an opportunity to read it later on. I just wanted to check. And, um, yeah, and, and to uh, um, discuss what David was saying, that I think the issue is the term waiver. I can very easily see a clever real estate attorney um, taking that to mean waive the entire requirement as opposed to because you can't hit 30% or 20%. But you might easily be able to hit 25%, 20%, 18% uh, using the resources you can bring to bear, using the land write down. Uh, and um, so I, I you know, encourage the consideration of David's point that that language should be adjusted to have the CFO certify that the maximum amount has been achieved and there's relief but not an outright, outright waiver of that provision. Okay. I appreciate it. And, and um, I don't know if I had any other questions. Um, I do uh, just want to recognize some of the work that we've seen um, of you, Mr. Beniti, in War 5. I know the project that you're talking about. I'm familiar with it. Um, and I'd be interested uh, perhaps at another time just to get a better sense of some of the concerns that you're raising about how you uh, how, how the affordable units are actually being sold. Uh, it's a really great project. It looks great. It's in a great neighborhood in Eckington. Um, so um, I just want to make sure what we're doing is, is actually going to the heart of the issues that we're experiencing with <coughs> affordable housing. I know I've talked to you, Mr. Bowers, about some of the things we've done. I'm pleased that the bill that I introduced um, that would have uh, uh, directed 25% uh, of uh, undedicated surplus funds to the Housing Production Trust Fund. And working with the mayor and the chair of the council, we were able to raise that to 50%, and it is in the BSA. Uh, and we voted on that just yesterday. Uh, I'm also pleased that there's a, a local low income housing tax credit bill that I introduced that was also incorporated uh, into the, 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 the budget and, and is funded at a million dollars. So I think we're making some strides, and obviously, we got some ways to go. I want to recognize uh, Councilmember Wells uh, for this round. Thank you very much, and thank you um, to everyone that's involved in trying to 
deal with the affordable housing crisis in Washington, D.C., which is growing, and it is a true crisis. It's a crisis for those just starting out and those that are at the end of their lives wanting to remain and be able to keep up with increasing rents and other costs. And so the bill that I had, of course, is to try to help subsidize seniors that have to make some very difficult choices as their costs go up. Mr. Bowers, you had some things to say about that. It, how could that be, um, you, you talked about how that bill could be improved, specifically what needs to happen. And Councilman, you're talking about Bill 2622? Yes. So a couple of things. One, um, I think there needs to be some detailed conversation around how exactly the housing authority would administer that um, with the developer is going to, who, who gets selected when and how is, is key. Um, I think there's also the issue around um, uh, long-term funding and the obligation of that would be a couple of the issues that I think the, the committee would want to make sure to have conversations with government as well as with developers. The other thing that you spoke about was, um, well, I can't remember if you spoke about this or not, but I'd be curious your opi opinion. Mr. Benete, not to put words in his, his mouth, but I believe that what he said is that the restriction on equity for a period of time is not a barrier to purchase. Um, the barrier is how to qualify and go through all the hoops in order to, to get in once you qualify. What is your opinion about restriction of equity? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in two things. One, we want to allow opportunities for low-income residents to have access to home ownership. That's one. Two, we ought to think in terms of how we can balance that with long-term affordability. I think that there ought to be the flexibility to have five-year minimums but not a requirement. Um, number two, that the 15-year uh, number should not be a cap. Uh, that there should be flexibility to actually go longer. Think so what, what are the, the factors of why you would go down to five years and versus when you'd go up to longer than, than 10 or 15? It, it seems like if in some neighborhoods that may be particularly distressed, uh, particularly distressed and just uh, having some inscrutable ability to, to, to make any headway in that neighborhood may be one factor. I would say, though, it must be balanced, though, with the notion, and I'm a big believer in the, the notion of the shared equity, and getting that, trying to work that formula right, not only in terms of shared equity, but so that five, whether it's two years from now or 15 years from now, when that unit, that house, is then sold, I'm a believer that there are mechanisms in place such that a person who is at still the extremely low, very low, or low income level at that point in time should be able to buy. So it's not just the issue of the shared equity and, and who gets how much, how much goes to trust fund, how much goes to the buyer. That's only part of it. The, uh, the issue is three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, who can buy that house? And if that house is no longer affordable, right, to someone at that income point, then we as a district have trouble. The chair mentioned earlier how she had bought her house for $120,000. I bought my house for $136,000 in 1999 on D Street, Northeast, right, in your ward, Ward 6. Buying on that block now, now is a, I'm sorry, six to eight hundred thousand dollars $600,000 to $800,000 to get on my block. So I joke with friends and say, don't even come down my block. If you, if you, if you can't afford $600,000, don't even come down. It's a running joke. So as a homeowner, I'm excited because I'm sitting on a bunch of equity. As someone in the industry and as a resident who cares about long-term affordability, the 29-year-old person or family who is today where I was then making $45,000 can't even sniff on my block. And so what we need to do is think long-term is to say, what can we do to ensure not just that the David Bowers of, 20, of 1999 can buy a house, but the David Bowers of 2014 could buy a house? That's the key. But aren't there other ways? I mean, what, what happens is that once we do that, <laughs> is that we severely restrict that person who tends to be a lower income to get them into that house. We restrict their access to the equity. Equity is a way that we get kids in college. Equity is a way that we get, you know, if there's a unforeseen bad exam, you know, your car gets stolen, totaled, whatever, and you need to access some capital. That's how folks that, that um, fully own their equity get access to that equity. So what you're saying is that 
that the the function is not whether they make a profit or not and have access to equity. You're saying that the function of restricting access to that equity is about maintaining affordability of that house for the next person, which is um, the other way to do that, of course, is to help the purchase for the next house and let that individual participate just like people that have you know wealthier incomes, just like you do now, in terms of having full access to your equity in a house that's appreciated greatly. Does restricting someone's equity in a house necessarily mean that that house will produce an affordable unit after the people that live there leave? I mean, yeah. Will it accomplish the goal that, that you're saying? Uh, it, that, yes, I think it's a short answer. In your neighborhood, or does it simply provide money to a pot? It doesn't restrict. Uh, to what degree does it restrict who can live there? I think, and let me just say, there are going to be folks who, will, who have testified and will testify who are much more expert on this. But as I understand it, working with folks like City First Homes and some other people who have done this kind of work, it will uh, allow for that actual housing unit, that home ownership unit, to be affordable if it is there and restricted. And I think there's a both in. There's a way to allow a homeowner to tap into a portion of the equity right and still keep that that unit affordable I think as long as is we're intentional and clear that both of those ends can be balanced out will be critical and I think one of the issues too as it relates to the accessing of equity and let, and let, me, let me be clear I always say too I, I'm a subsidized homeowner even though I didn't go through a traditional program when I when I take the mortgage interest deduction that's a public subsidy right so there's a lot of public subsidy for home ownership it's not just in the quote-unquote affordable space so I like to be clear about that but the second thing, though, is that the the or the ability to keep that unit affordable in the long term, it's not an either or. I think there are ways that it can be set up um, for for both. Well, th that was the main thing I want to get out. I figure because of your perspective, where you come from, I, I realize that that there's others that would be able to talk more about the financing and all that. But I I know that Mr. Benite talked about getting in. And then I know your concern is about maintaining the affordability. Last question, and thank you, Madam Chair, for, um, for letting me come in and ask questions. And I appreciate the attention that you're paying because I know how important the issue is about affordable housing as it being a citywide, probably our number one crisis. So thank you for um, holding this hearing. The last question I have would be for either the other two gentlemen that, or any of y'all, to what degree do we utilize and should we utilize more, or why don't we utilize more, the idea of, of um, co-ops as being a way to manage, maintain affordable housing in, frankly, in wealthier neighborhoods? I look at Capitol Hill, where we have Ellen Wilson townhomes. Those are the most, one of the most desirable places in the world to live. But those ha townhomes will be affordable for in perpetuity because they're limited equity co-ops. Why don't we use um, co-ops like I think other, um, other cities in Europe and elsewhere in order to address affordability? They often use the cooperative ownership model. Why don't we use more of that? Well, I, I, I think that if you, I, I think that there are, a, there are examples of co-ops in the District of Columbia, however, not um, not as much as as, um, as say New York or other jurisdictions. And I think a lot of that is just a factor of the fact that um, what you're speaking to, as far as the limited equity co-op, is no different than the example that the Bowers just mentioned, as far as being able to share equity with the next buyer coming in. Um, I think that it, there is some level of restriction with co-ops, and that's mm -hmm. why folks tend to go the condominium route because that provides a little bit more flexibility for that eventual buyer of the unit. In a cooperative, in a cooperative structure, you have to answer to a, to a board, you have to be approved to get in. There's a lot, a little bit more hoops that you would necessarily have to jump through in order to both get in and also be able to dispose of your unit, um, as opposed to what condominiums offer. But would that be an intentional way to keep affordable housing in our wealthier neighborhoods for generations? I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. 
that it will. And the reason why I say so is because my recent experience with cooperative is such that in the event that the units become, <coughs> in the event that they experience way more deferred maintenance than usual, and other co-op members live, because cooperatives essentially are glorified rentals. I mean, that's the way I look at it from a mathematical standpoint. So in the event that there is way more deferred maintenance and other co-op owners live, then the balance of the co-op owners end up bearing the brunt of the expenses to manage the building going forward, which eventually become unaffordable to those who stay and end up end up um, um, doing away with a, with a valuable piece of asset because they, no, they can no longer afford to maintain the property going forward. So that's that's my direct experience with corporate. And I think also just uh, our experience has been um, being approached by um, over the course of the 13 years that Somerset's been in business, probably a dozen or more failed limited equity co-ops from all neighborhoods in the district that were set up in the in the 80s for the most part. Um, and the dynamic uh, the board just mentioned is exactly what happened. Uh, they ran into some maintenance issues. They were targeted to very low income uh, folks for the most part. Uh, one or two uh, or three residents stopped making their co-op payments. Uh, and all of a sudden that increased the burden on the remainder and it was just a downward spiral. Uh, and so uh, I, I think there are cir circumstances where it can be very successful, um, but there's also, it has to be done extremely carefully. Uh, it was my understanding that back in the early 80s when a lot of those were set up, uh, DHCDs uh, had technical assistance programs and other funding programs to support them. Those got defunded over time or just sort of put aside, and the, they were sort of left to their own. So we have not uh, been actively involved at all in promoting or developing financing limited equity co-ops, in part because of having been approached by so many who were in desperate straits. Uh, and in some cases, they lost their properties um, in the marketplace uh, through foreclosure or otherwise. Uh, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's not as straightforward as one would hope. Thank you for your thoughtful answer. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and I think those are the questions. Those are all your questions for the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> are you Kayla Glick? Yes, she is. Okay, I'll, I'll see Ms. Glick. Oh, you're Edith Ms. Cromwell? Okay, is Kayla Glick here too? Okay, Ms. Cromwell and Ms. Glick. And Eleanor Hart. I'll take it, ma'am. Oh. Ms. Cromwell, I'll hear from you. Let's just, uh, if you sit up a little bit towards the microphone, I know we all can hear you and make sure it's turned on. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about affordable home ownership, specifically Bill 2604. My name is Edith Cromwell, and I am a homeowner in Anacostia and have been involved in economic development, housing, and economic development. My entire working life uh, at Anacosta Economic Development Corporation and at MANA. I was nominated and selected in 1935, I mean, sorry, 1985, by then Mayor Marion Berry to serve on the Community Advisory Committee in the planning process for the city. The Ward 8 plans reflect the full involvement of res re residents 
with an understanding of the community's needs, aspirations, and priorities. One of the top priorities then and now is home ownership. Home ownership was very important to people living in Anacostia, primarily because there was a sense of neighborhood and a sense of shared in interest. We recognized that a lot of things needed to be improved, and one of the things that did take place was that homeowners were hanging in there. They had been there 10, 15 years, and some longer than that. Some were born and raised there, and a lot of people that advanced were, and were able to leave the community did not. They stayed because they loved the area. Low and modern income homeowners need to have assets to their, their equity. Equity is important to send people to college, to start a small business, and the availability of cash if someone is in a situation or possibility of losing their home. Equity is a stopgap against foreclosure. This happened to a lot of people when we went through the last recession, not having access to e equity for long periods of time especially in distressed areas, it's almost like setting folks up to fail. Early on, we recognized that home ownership was truly an investment. You had to pay HPAP back, but your home was yours, and the owner could benefit from changes in the community, changes that the owner contributed to. The massive growth in the city is amazing. The low to moderate income families and their future generation stand to benefit greatly from purchasing a home. There need to be access to and though there need to be a way to pay back and increase the trust fund this legislation does both. I support the affordable home ownership preservation and economic equity act which reduce resale restriction in distressed areas to five years. Helping folks to invest and benefit. I am happy to see the transformation taking place throughout the city and want it to benefit all of us. Home ownership is often the only asset low to modern income families have. Let's make sure it remains an investment, especially in areas where we need more homeowners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cromwell. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Hart? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eleanor Hart, and I am testifying on Bills 20-594 and 20-604 for the League of Women Voters of the District of Columbia. The League strongly supports Bill 2594, the Disposition of District Land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013. And we want to thank Council Members Bowser and McDuffie for introducing the legislation and Council Member Bowser for holding this hearing. For 25 years, the League has advocated for the district to have a strong commitment to affordable housing and for promoting economically, culturally, and racially diverse neighborhoods in all areas of the city. The League has also advocated for including both subsidized and market rate units in the same multifamily buildings and for making affordable housing a priority when deciding on how public land will be used. The severity of the district's affordable housing crisis demands that we use public land as a resource, and your bill does it very effectively. We are particularly pleased that the legislation includes a requirement for housing where the need is the greatest, at or below 30% of the area median income. If the committee can see its way to increasing the amount of required housing at or below 30% of the AMI, we will be even more pleased. It is our hope that the next time the Committee on Economic Development meets, 
Marking up Bill 20-594 will be at the top of the agenda. I know, Councilmember Bowser, that you've uh, raised the issue of complete competing claims on public land, and I would like to speak to that. I think because of the severity of our affordable housing crisis, public land must be a priority. I mean, affordable housing must be a priority when we're deciding how we use the value of public land. The League does not support Bill 2604 as it is now written. In spite of the considerable effort that has gone into its development, the Affordable Homeownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation <laughs> Amendment Act of 2013 still needs work. It fails to strike the right balance between easing the burden on sellers of homes sub subsidized by the Housing Production Trust Fund and preserving affordable housing for future needs. The problem is the way the legislation defines distressed neighborhoods. The legislation's current divisions definition includes neighborhoods where it is very easy to sell a home. Since the purpose of the legislation is to provide relief to people who have difficulty reselling subsidized homes, the League concurs with the recommendation that the definition of a distressed neighborhood be based on home sales. During the development of this legislation, the focus has been on the problems that resale requirements create for sellers of subsidized homes and it's important to re reduce that burden. But think of the burden on thousands of district residents who have, who have to pay more than 50% of their household income for housing. It is just as important to preserve our affordable housing subsidies in order to ease the housing burden for as many of those residents as possible. Thank you. Oh, that concludes my testimony. Thank you. <laughs> I was looking at it. It looked like you were about, it sounded like you were going into another one, but I, I have I have your testimony here too. Uh, Ms. Glick. Thank you, Chairwoman Bowser, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kayla Glick, and I'm a community organizer at Jews United for Justice, a Washington-based volunteer-driven organization that represents thousands of people in the local Jewish community who are fighting for social and economic justice in the D.C. area. The JUFJ community strongly supports Bill 20-594. We are pleased to see that the bill proposes to set aside 30% of developments in an area with transit access and 20% of developments in all other areas when a private residential development is built on public land that the district has disposed of. And we support that this bill ensures that households will pay no more than 30% of their gross income on housing. In the short time since I moved to the district nine months ago, I've seen all around me how rapidly our city is changing and gentrifying. In the midst of this affordable housing crisis, where in 2010, one in five households spent more than half their income on housing, we urge our city to take measures that will bring us closer to reality where all DC residents can afford to live in safe housing in the city and afford all of their basic needs. That is why we are thrilled to see that the standards of this bill are ambitious. We need an ambitious standard in order to achieve a strong result, and the bill includes a relief clause that the mayor may waive affordable housing requirements if the CFO certifies that standards cannot be met while affordable housing has been maximized. Furthermore, we believe that the standards of this bill are reasonable by working with experienced affordable housing developers and designers. The JUFJ community has strongly supported and taken action for affordable housing and inclusionary zoning campaigns since our founding in 1998. Jewish text emphasizes that access to housing is one of the most important and fundamental human needs. Additionally, many Jewish immigrants to America, including the families of many JUFJ members, experienced firsthand the struggle to find safe and affordable housing. Our history demands that we speak out in support of strong bills like Bill 20-594 that will help the district better leverage its resources to provide more affordable housing to both renters and homeowners. Our members, many of whom are newcomers to the district and are privileged to be able to afford market rate housing, do not want to see racial and economic equality compromised as rising housing costs push hardworking DC residents out of their homes and neighborhoods. We stand firmly with those in need of affordable housing and urge this committee to pass 20 Bill 20-594. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you and thank you all uh, for your testimony. I have copies uh, here of each. And I don't think I have any uh, additional questions. Let me turn to Council Member Wells. I have no questions. Thank you very much for your compelling testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Suzanne Slater.
Taloria Green. A Miss Slater? Okay, we'll get we'll make way. Maria Martinez. Is Taloria Green here? Oh, you're Taloria, okay. Constance McClanahan. Ms. Green, we'll hear from you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Taloria Green, and I'm from Jubilee Housing. Seniors and persons with disabilities seem to be overlooked and their, their needs misunderstood. It's amazing how many people believe that because I and others are disabled seniors, we're living pretty good. It is surprising how folks had the very wrong perception that because we are receiving Social Security, we really have some money. And if you are disabled or a disabled senior on Social Security, we're thought to be close to being rich. How wrong is that? There is also the misconception that because we are seniors and are or disabled, that automatically gives us a ticket to get into one of the new senior complexes. They don't re realize how these places have very lengthy waiting lists. There are many new apartment complexes popping up all over the district. Most of them do not offer affordable housing. There are a few that entered into an agreement to set aside a number of units as affordable housing. However, the issue there is there were not enough units <coughs> excuse me, offered to make a difference. For example, the new Rhode Island Row Apartments located in the new commercial area at the Rhode Island Metro Station had only set aside 10 units. Many seniors and disabled individuals feel that they are being driven out of the district because there is no place they can afford to live and still be able to meet their needs. Something must be done, a solution found. Did you know that there are a large number of seniors and da disabled individuals who are active and vital, but are stuck in nursing homes because they have no place to go, no housing they can afford. While they are in the nursing homes, all of their retirement money, pensions, and or Social Security is taken from them, and they're given a $70 a month allowance. I know these things because I was in the nursing home at the United Medical Center for two years because I had nowhere to go. After being on the D.C. Housing Authority's waiting list for 13 years, I was <clears throat> finally notified. I also received assistance from a program called Money Follows the Person, which is funded by the D.C. Healthcare Finance, in getting my voucher. The social worker at United Medical put me in touch with Elizabeth McIntyre at Jubilee Housing, who just happened to have a two-bedroom accessible apartment. Ms. McIntyre had faith in me because she held the apartment for another six months until I finally had my voucher in my hand. Now, I'm telling my story because, <clears throat> excuse me, my point is affordable housing is needed desperately throughout the district, especially for seniors and persons with disabilities. We are people who have worked 20, 25, 30, even 40 years. We have taken pride in our neighborhoods and supported our cities, the city that we love, the city that is, some of us grew up in and raised our children. Just as monies have been allocated to assist in building new shopping centers, Walmarts, and Costco's, funds need to be allocated to a more important source, affordable housing and financial assistance to programs such as Money Follows the Person 
and Jubilee Housing to assist them in their endeavors to assist us in finding and maintaining safe, affordable housing. For your testimony, Ms. Green. Um, Ms. Martinez. Yes, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chairperson Borser and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Bill 20 604. My name is Maria Martinez. I purchased my, my first home in May 2013 in Ivy City. It was a dream come true. And I am a, I am so grateful for the for this opportunity. Before purchasing, I was living in one bedroom apartment, paying double of what I am paying now in a mortgage and condo fees. Um, it took me a while to work on my credit. Mana helped me to set up a plan to deal with all debts and pay my bills on time. They even helped me to send letters to credit agencies. Within, within about six, five or six months, I was ready to start the mortgage approval process. I wanted to purchase a, a home because I am a single mother. I want to have a stable place for me and my kids. I did not want to keep wasting my money on rent with home ownership. I have a future for my kids. I have two, two boys, a 16-year-old and 7-year-old. No one in my family had ever owned a home, and they were not able to assist me financially. Mana filled up the, um, the gaps and age pop help me be able to afford the place. At the beginning, I had some concerns about moving to Ivy City because I heard about prostitution, drugs, and people breaking into the, the homes. I decided to check out the area in different times of the day and did not have any issues walking in the street or speaking with the neighbors. So I felt more comfortable moving forward. And I do not know what the area will look like in five or 10 years. I hope to work with all my neighbors to make Ivy City a better place for all of us. I always wanted to have my own house. That, that was my dream. I was thinking about stability and growth. I knew about the 15 year restri restriction when I purchased and I wondered why it was so high. I am worried about not able to keep the home in the family if I die do during the 15 year period. The covenant on my unit does not allow me to simply the, the, the property to someone else in my family. Also, I would like to use my house to help my kids through school, but will not have any access to the equity in my home until the full, uh, the full 15 years has passed. My older son is, my son, my older son will be 30 by that time and my younger son will be 22. No one in my, hand, in my family has gone to university before. My older son wants to go to college and we start to look at options. This is a new process for us and I am worried that I won't be able to use my, ho my home to help him or even my younger son. When purchase my ho the home, I had hope that someone will help me. Is easy the restriction. I know that this bill only affects new units. I ask, I ask you to pass it for f future owners like me. Great. Thank you very much. Ms. McClanahan. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Bowser and committee members. And thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Bill 20-604. My name is Constance McClanahan, and I would like to talk about the importance of affordable ownership um, in the district and what it has meant for me and my daughter. I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania but moved here for a job in 1984. I was an information sp management specialist and did not make a ton of money. My daughter was born in 1987. As time went on, I knew I needed to do something for myself and her that would lead us to, to a stable living situation that I controlled. I knew that I wanted to purchase a home and set down some roots for us in the District of Columbia. This was home. For me, the process of getting mortgage, getting mortgage ready wasn't too difficult. I had some debt to pay off and I got my affairs in order fairly quickly. I learned more about equity when I went through home buyer classes and understood both the responsibility I was getting into and the investment I was making. I purchased an affordable home in Lee Joy Park in August of 1998. Truthfully, I had always wanted to be a homeowner. I never wanted 
to be to have a, I was never about a car but a home for my own of my own was absolutely essential I wanted a roof over my head that I control and <clears throat> and to not pay rent to someone every month at the time I purchased my daughter was in elementary school I had refinanced a couple of times to pay to pay off bills which was really important for me and my family Excuse me. now that I'm retired I plan to stay here until I can no longer walk up and down my steps my daughter is still with me she went to school for one thing and now she's looking into another field of study I hope that my daughter will keep the home it's a great stepping stone for her to go further professionally and in other ways than even I was when I purchased the Joy Park was a much rougher part of town I stayed participated and have no plans of going anywhere. In conclusion, I want to stress that having control of your home as a place to live and as an investment is important, no matter your income level. My understanding of this bill is that it is trying to balance return, trying to balance return to the city and equity excess investment to the owner. I support that. Thank you, Ms. McClanahan, for your testimony, and I, I think you capture um, what it means to, to own a home and build wealth for, for yourself and for your family, not just for now, but uh, for, for the next generation. And I mentioned earlier that um, I'm committed certainly to making sure that the city uh, is able to help people, first time home buyers and others, um, looking at what we're doing with HPAP, making it a more efficient program. Um, we've been able to expand the loan and increase the amount of money going into HPAP. Um, and also, um, and I know you live in Leroy Park, which is where my father was uh, raised. Okay. And But we, there's also in, in this budget that the council just approved um, a focus, and I know Reverend Jim is focused as well on this, on our Ward 7 and 8 communities and how we uh, have more uh, assistance in, in home buying preparation so that we can create uh, um, increased level of home ownership um, across all eight wards in the District of Columbia. So um, we will continue to stay focused on that. Let me turn now to Council Member Bonds to see if she has any questions. Thank you, Chairman um, Bowser. No, I do not, but very happy to, to hear, hear your stories, hear your side of it, because it is you who make this um, home um, ownership proposition possible. It is, and it is for you that we make it possible. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wells. Thank you, Chairman Bowser. I um, have no questions, but I really appreciated hearing your testimony. It's, it's very important that you came down here today, and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Green, I do have one quick question before I excuse you. Um, because you talked about a, a problem that uh, we are hearing more about, that is seniors who may have been in the hospital and are ready to be released, but they don't have an adequate place to go back to. Um, we especially hear that um, when accessibility is an issue. Um, now, tell me, was your when your voucher became available, did it become available through the housing authority wait, or um, was there another program that helped you get the voucher? Okay, actually what happened was I had received a, a letter Marquez, from the can you make sure Ms. Ms. Green's uh, microphone is on, please? It's not. I received a letter from the Housing Authority said that, uh, saying that uh, my name had, uh, re had come up and they wanted me to bring my son and, you know, update information like the birth certificate and so forth um, and that they were closing me out. I received a letter from, uh, another letter from housing from the Office of the Americans with Disabilities Act saying that they had reached my name too for public housing. So we had an issue about which way I was going supposed to go. Uh, am I taking the Section 8 voucher or going with the public housing voucher? Now, the um, uh, she told me with the public housing voucher, I did have the right to first refusal. Okay. Now, the Money Follows the Person program uh, finally came out. They um, have been promising to have a lottery uh, starting uh, in July, 
and and we actually didn't have the uh, um, the uh, lottery pull until October. Um, at that point, what it was, they had a lot on the lottery. They gave each nursing home in the in the Washington D.C. area two vouchers: a public housing voucher and a Section Eight voucher. Um, at the lottery, two names were pulled: one for the the Section Eight and one for the uh, public housing. Now, um, ironically, when they had the lottery, uh, I was the recipient of the Section Eight voucher. And I also had the Section 8 voucher coming in from, uh, from housing. The issue with all of that is um, it took like, uh, after I got all the paperwork done with both Money Follows the Person and with the Housing Authority, it still took almost another three months before the man from housing came over to go over all this paperwork with me about the do's and don'ts of having a voucher. And then he finally put the voucher in my hand. Okay, that's helpful to know because I just, I just kind of want to understand what tracks the vouchers are becoming available, especially for accessible housing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I say one last thing? Yes. yes. And that is the, uh, the system with the housing authority has to get better. You know, because as I said, um, everything went kind of down here with me. My husband got killed in um, November of 2001, right after 9-11. Um, he was a, a correctional officer at D.C. jail. And coming home one night, he ran into two of the inmates in front of the jail who he had had an altercation with. They tried to rob him, and he wouldn't be robbed. And they shot him five times and killed him. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, in November of the following year, I mean, excuse me, in uh, January of the following year, uh, I applied for housing at the Housing Authority. You know, as I said, it took 13 years, 13 years before I actually uh, got the voucher. And, and that's ridiculous. Yes. It really is. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank you for your story and sharing your story. And um, I'm, I'm sorry it took long, but I'm glad at, at the end um, it has worked out. And I think what you have shared will help us help other people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gwendolyn Johnson. Maria Laughinghouse. Laughinghouse. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, Susan Carter. Patricia Trim. Johnson. All right. Uh, thank you. I had good morning because I thought we were going to be first, but good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair uh, Bowser and the council members. Thank you so much for allowing one DC members to come before you to testify. My name is Gwendolyn Johnson and I'm a member of one DC. One DC is a dynamic, effective organization where accountability is essential for good leadership. We hold ourselves and others responsible to honor their commitments by developing and practicing creative solutions to the affordable housing crisis. One DC has led the road by walking. Our affordable housing victories include tenant-owned buildings and tenant-led efforts to keep buildings truly affordable for low-income and working families. One DC has won the city's first community benefit agreement that demands the, the developers give money to local community organizations, hire local residents, and produce housing that is affordable for households that is making less than thirty-five thousand a year. I'm going to skip over the part, and that's just a glance of what organized and conscious people's, people can create together. Uh, thank you for, for writing this piece of legislature, 20-708. Because yes, the Housing Production Trust does need $100 million and not the $29.4 million that's proposed by the outgoing Mayor Vincent Gray. But even though this proposed bill, Bill 20-708, it is still not enough. 
Bill 20-708, the Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Funding Act of 2014. This proposed legislation will amend Title 42 of the District of Columbia official code to require that the trust be minimum, fund, be minimum funded at $100 million. As you know, the, the trust fund is primarily funded uh, for housing production in this, direct, in, in this district. Again, $100 million may address the situation, but won't make the problem go away. We need, we need money, we need more money, and we need the money to target certain income level, levels better. The trust fund currently gives money to certain brackets based off the area of medium income, AMI. The current, the current brackets, down, uh, down is 40, 40, 20, reaching households that earn up to 80% 80, 80 AMI, which is close to 90,000 a household. Housing is up 13.2%. Homelessness is up 3.5%, and the AMI continues to rise. With your current proposed legislation, 100 million will be split across three brackets, but the greatest need is at the lowest bracket, those who earn less than 35,000 a year. Those of us who make minimum wage who earns no more than 13288 a year without a voucher or access to public housing, housing in the district is basically out of reach. Even though the council agreed to raise the minimum wage, the increase is gradual. By, by that time in 2016, the economy, AMI, and the cost of living is all going up. So how does that not bring us back to the poverty level? An estimated 13,205 homeless people, 3,246 of these people are children living in the district. What makes this city, the, which, which makes this city the fifth largest homeless population in the nation? While 14th Street and other areas continue their transformation with luxury condos and high rent buildings, the question becomes, what kind of law or policy can you take to the mayor that would help the homeless, poor, and low and moderate income people in the District of Columbia? We believe that you should revise the proposed Bill 20-708 to dedicate all of the $100 million to those who earn between $13,000 at to 35,000. This policy suggests may seem drastic to you, but to us, the, the thousands of, of DC residents living a paycheck away from the homelessness, this policy recommendation is way overdue. Remember, you, you council voted to invest 475 million to our tax dollars on a streetcar trolley, a service that doesn't even serve the entire district. Why is it that the council is on concern concerning investment? Concern, concerning investing on only a mere one million for people to stay in the District of Columbia, especially the need for affordable housing is so great with only 67,000 people waiting for a housing voucher. What can you do to address the city growing need for truly affordable houses? So please, help us to stop people from being put out on the street and eating out of, out of garbage cans by dedicating 100 million to help build build housing for those who earn less than the minimum wage and make under 35000 You will help house f uh, funds keep D.C. accessible to all, all families who deserve to live here, and many have lived here for generations. Thank you for my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Are you Miss Laughinghouse? No, she's. I'm sorry. What's your yeah, name? Yes, Carter. Susan Carter. All right, Miss Carter. Carter. Thank you, Miss Carter. Yes. Good. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chair and Councilman. I am representing Bill B twenty six oh four. But as I've heard and as I've read, this is a catch twenty two. Now, I wasn't. Uh, aware of it in 1966 because I wasn't living here at that time. But I am a senior citizen and I do see that only it's according to how much I can give back to the community based on the investment and how the property uh, housing prices raise according to my salary. So I see it as a catch-22, as I said, and as I said, my name is Susan Carter, and I have lived here all my life, and I've raised four children and it's an, and as a single parent. Blood, sweat, and tears to get to a crossroad of homelessness. I am 62 years old, 
I've moved in the last four, I've moved four times in the last year because of, of uh, slumlords and inappropriate being, uh, being able to afford on my limited income. Um, I lost my job because of an illness, and from that time on I've been disabled. I fall and I have a cracked back. I can't stand that long. And because of that, um, it, in this bill, it seems that um, the housing people are reluctant to invest in me because I, you don't see me as bringing a hundred thousand dollars to the bank account, or as a man, as Mr. Wells spoke earlier, Councilman Wells spoke earlier about equity. You don't see me as equity. You just see me as a 62-year-old woman. Yet, you have eight million dollars that you waste yearly on vacant buildings and blatant buildings. There, this house right here on Manor Place has been empty for three years, but the government will pay $385,000 to pay a, a company to come out and make sure that the windows are boarded up and the grass is cut, yet it eliminates the value of the property. And this is how I feel that the District of Columbia housing, when I got on the list, it closed down. I can't afford the apartments, not even an efficiency on my income. And I'm very upset about it. And, and I really voted for you, uh, uh, Ms. Bowser, because I thought that you were going to be a change on the board. You understand, even though I may be homeless, I still have power. And so do the homeless, homeless people that also that are over at 2nd and D Street. This is the District of Columbia. This is the capital of the United States. We talk about property. But we're not talking about anybody bringing D.C. to a statehood so that the greedy cannot sell me a house where I do not own my property, but I'm responsible to pay taxes on it. That doesn't sit right in my spirit at all, Mrs. Bowser, Mrs. Bonds, and uh, you two, a uh, constituents. It just doesn't. You know, and, and I, I applaud you for getting your house early and, and, and you didn't have the loopholes in this. Then I don't, you say that you understand and I've heard that as you, as you have listened to everybody, but I don't think you understand because I know that your mother is not homeless. I know that you have a deed to your house. You don't have your clothes in boxes. I don't, I have to, I, I, I'm under a stress every day. I'm waiting for the housing to call me. I'm looking for an apartment to live in. Uh, uh, just only by the grace of God that I keep my sanity. And because I'm 62 years old and because of the, 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 uh, what's important to the government is the building. Okay, I'm going to get to this, I'm going to close. Hmm. There are 600 vacant buildings in the District of Columbia, and that's not even part of that has been found. The government can give uh, um, builders free ground to build on, but not to put in housing for the uh, seniors. We have the children's building down on 8th Street that has been turned into condos. We have the Giant. We have Kaiser Permanente. We have every bar and grill on 8th Street. We have a Marriott that is coming up. The District of Columbia has bought the block from 4th Street to 5th Street, closing down Murray's, the storage place, and all the properties because they weren't selling liquor. Bought that out, and it's not going to be for the low income. It's going to be for Whole food. It's just bringing more money in because you want to turn Washington, D.C. into Hollywood. But what about the people such as myself and others that come before me that help build and pave the way for you? Okay, Ms. Carter, thank you. I'm going to have some questions for you, but let me turn to uh, yeah. Reverend Trim. We have one more person that should be testifying. Um, she can come in the next panel. Thank you. I prefer well, would you pre well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. I prefer Minister Trent. All right, Minister. Yes. Uh, Ms. Johnson, would you like me to bring up chairs on either side so you can testify together? Is, is yes, that I your would preference? Like for, yeah, I would okay. like for Nicole to. Well, we'll do that. Kate. I need you to, to be here. Thank you so very much. 
right. thank you. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Minister. I am Trim. Minister Patricia Trim, and I'm a longtime resident of the Shaw community. My testimony is in regard to no, Bill B2622, the Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Senior Act of 2013 mm -hmm. to 14. I actually am a little embarrassed because what I brought to you was my uh, rough draft because the secretary got the wrong information. So some of what I've written I'm going to just skip over. Others have already discussed part of it anyway. But I uh, was largely raised by a grandmother, so I have a heart for the seniors. And according to a dictionary, an elderly a senior citizen is an elderly person, usually more than 60 or 65, or people in the United States who are more than 60 years of age are commonly considered as seniors. Myself, I am 69, I'll be 69 years old this year, and I have a great concern for those that are both older and younger than myself. Why? You would ask me why, because I live in subsidized housing. I have rental assistance. I'm able to maintain a vehicle. I have an excellent health care plan with a sufficient heart deep prescription program. Many seniors though, and but let me add this, I'm not on food stamps, and many of the people at Westland make more money than I. So you ask how that happens? Only by the grace of God. But there are so many seniors that are struggling. When I worked in 1999 for senior programs under the D.C. Office on Aging, uh, I found that it was very difficult as an activity coordinator to send people home at the end of the day happy because many of them by the end of the day realize that they go back to the same struggles. What will I eat or can I have medication? Many of these people uh, have lived in their homes to the point where they are now displaced and are homeless and many die prematurely because of all of the stress. Many of them being, it's one thing to move because you want to, but it's another thing to be phased out because of economic issues. And I see a lot of that in the district, especially in the Shaw area. But I made a commitment to God and to myself that there may be many moved because of gentrification, but I will not be one of them. I'm not going anywhere. And I put that on record today. Um, I've read many articles concerning senior citizens, and uh, AARP has already spoken today, and many other organizations. But uh, I believe that the bill in its in itself is a good bill, but I believe that the age needs to be redefined. The lady that was just here that spoke about disabled persons and senior citizens, I don't know what the age is for an individual who is disabled, but I know that when I worked in a partnership with the DC Office on Aging and the uh, DC Energy Office, going door to door, filling out applications for seniors and disabled persons, there were many, many people. You say that this five million will cover 600 families? I can tell you in the, the year and a half, no, um, 13 months that I did that, I saw more than 600 people who needed assistance. Yes. Much more than 600. Let me so because I'm an, a generous person, I would like to redefine and at least pick up people from 60 years old and give them not five million, but unlimited, because that's how generous I am. Okay, and I appreciate your testimony. We actually did get um, a number that came over from the Housing Authority um, saying that there are 6,500 people who are currently on their waiting list that meet the um, criteria laid out in the bill. Um, that so they uh, reduced it to 62, you said? And I said 65? Six, no. They reduced it to 65? Let, let me get it out. Go ahead. Hold yeah. on. Let me, let me speak for a second. So the bill that we're talking about, the, the HAPIS bill that okay. has been referred to as that would um, provide a, a, house, a, a voucher for unsubsidized senior citizens. Um, and part of the definition is that the person is 62 years of okay. age 
pays more than 35% of their income. Okay. Um, and I don't have That's the, uh, the other one. I think it's 50% uh, of the AMI. I'll tell you in a second. I want to give you the exact uh, criteria. 62 years of DC resident, 62 years or older, earn no more um, than $43,000 for a one person household or 37 for a two person household yes, okay. and pay more than 35% of their income. So that's the definition. So the, the universe that, that we know about. Um, because I believe, as, as you say, Minister, that it's probably larger. These are the people that are actually already on the list, um, and it may be it may be others. So that gives you some um, sense of what five million dollars would actually support. Um, and so, as as we continue to consider it, that's that that's the context that we're working with. Um, let me turn to you, ma'am. And what's your name? Just. Makichi Feaster. Okay, Ms. Feaster, I'll hear from you now. Um, <clears throat> I have a saying. It's a matter of perception. Um, my perception is someone who began their career as an administrative assistant, gaining paralegal certification in 2001. Um, I worked as an administrative assistant for a total of 11 years, suffered three layoffs in four years, longest layoff being three years, got evicted. I'm an ex-resident of D.C. General. I was there for 11 months. While I was there, my son graduated as salutatorian, got a four-year scholarship to Michigan State, almost $200,000 total in scholarship money. I am currently being let go from the rapid rehousing program the day after the last day of my job. And I face eviction because the checks are not being paid. I have a credit. $2,600, more than $2,600 is owed on my rent by TCP. So my perception is of someone of the homeless, low income, working class, single mother. I have many different sides. Um, and I come to you to discuss the bill 20-713. Um, um, I'm glad to see there being a proposal to do something about the homeless crisis in the city. Affordable housing is a crisis in the city. You've heard from many different perceptions. Um, those of disabled individuals, seniors, those who are homeowners. So this is just another perception. Um, and after reading the bill, I would like to point some things out, address some things, and ask for clarity on other things. One. One of the most popular questions is, will tax breaks continue to be given to developers who do not mm -hmm. consider the low-income communities? If they are continued to be given priority over long-term residents, then we fear that this crisis will not end in even 10 years. Two, renovations will cost about $2.3 billion, and there is no mention of where that money will come from, nor how the $1 billion that is mentioned will be funded. Renovations are mentioned, but will that include preserving existing units as well as the creation of new ones because we believe it should. Also regarding renovations, will it mean an increase in rent for the existing units that receive them? Three, we see that 20, 25 million a year will be allocated for targeted communities. Since this term is not defined, we would hope that it includes long-term residents since many are facing the decision to leave a home that they can no longer afford and returning citizens since so many have already had to leave the city and wish to return home. Four, please make sure that the development of any existing units will not mean that tenant qualifications will change and that current residents who move into these units remain eligible to do so. Five, with the authorization on the issuance of bonds to refinance the reconstruction, renovation, and emergency maintenance of affordable housing facilities. We believe that this should include residents currently on Section 8, 8 and in public housing as well. Finally, we ask for an inclusion to this bill. It's already been mentioned that there are over 70,000 people on the waiting list to be housed. Why can't we get $2.3 billion for those individuals included somewhere in this proposed bill? 
Um, again, we are glad to see council making strides to address this issue in the city, and we hope that these things can be considered and included. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to thank you all for your testimony and putting your issues and questions um, on the record for the council to further consider. Councilmember Bonds. Thank you all very much. And as you have said, and as um, witnesses before you have said, this is very tough. Um, there's only so much money and it is the taxpayers money and um, as a result we we try to spread it around as much as possible and to be creative in the utilization of it and trying very hard to address some of your concerns uh, you have been enlightening to be very honest um, and I think put before us the real critical issues that people who are looking for housing who are in limited housing situations face and I think I thank you very much for for sharing that and I believe that um, this team of individuals in the council and with the um, I'll say this mayor elect and that um, things will will be better that's 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 how I'm looking at it and um, you have my commitment to do everything that we can to um, improve the housing situation soon as opposed to later later okay excellent while you're here while you're here well, okay. thank, you. Thank, you. thank you and you are going to be thank you thank you <laughs> thank you 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 thank Billy Hart, Alex DeLorme, Phyllis Eddy, Okay, Ms. Peter. Yes. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Peter on behalf of the DC Association of Realtors, DCAR, representing approximately 2,400 realtors and other real estate professionals licensed in the district. Today's testimony aims to express our support of the goals of the Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Act of 2014, namely stabilizing funding for the HPTF from a source other than real estate deed recordation and transfer taxes, or home ownership taxes. Realtors know the value of home ownership and how affordable housing can make a difference in the lives of families and communities. Since the inception of the HPTF, Thousands of affordable housing units have been acquired, constructed, or preserved. Bill 2708 even acknowledges, that, even acknowledges it as the premier tool for producing and preserving affordable housing in the district. Unfortunately, the portion of funding for HPTF from RNT taxes has fluctuated in past years depending on the status of the housing market. This puts critically needed affordable housing potentially on hold. DCAR commends Chairman Bowser for recognizing in Bill 2708 that relying on a portion of taxes levied on real estate transactions to fund HPTF makes the district's ability to produce and preserve affordable housing susceptible to market movements. As so, realtors understand the need for baseline funding for the HPTF due to the invaluable role it can have in producing affordable housing. We do have some concerns with how $100 million dedication could impact the overall budget and strongly caution against any proposal which could lead to another increase in home ownership taxes. We reiterate, the efficient transfer of real property is at the heart of the district's real estate community. DC's current excessive RT taxes are already amongst the highest in the nation, negatively impact housing purchases, and should not have a place in DC's revenue stream. Additionally, DC's exorbitantly high RT taxes undermine the very goals of the HPTF, as they may have unintended negative consequences. 
if people cannot move up from their starter homes, there will be less affordable housing stock available. Those who have the ability to move from older properties may also hesitate because of the costs associated, stifling improvement of these properties. And in a market where lending is still extremely stringent, even a few thousand dollars of R&T taxes, particularly for those of more moderate means, can truly make a difference. DCAR cannot stress enough how strongly we urge the council to significantly lower home ownership taxes along with any proposal to find other sources of funding for HPTF. Because DC already has one of the highest R&T taxes in the country, any more could be crippling, particularly for those in need of affordable housing. These taxes increase upfront payments and the time needed for a family to accumulate enough funds to purchase a home, a barrier to home ownership. We also maintain the responsibility to fund housing production shouldn't fall exclusively on homeowners. Let's find a solution that does not counteract what the trust fund is trying to achieve, more affordable housing. This should be coupled with careful reflection on how this initiative fits into the overall budget to prevent district residents from paying even more in home ownership taxes. Particularly, if the council can find ways through cost savings of existing programs that could possibly be reprogrammed towards the trust fund, we would be more than happy to help in those efforts. Finally, we continue to carefully review the other pieces of affordable housing legislation before the Council, such as the Affordable Housing Preservation and Equity Act, the disposition of district land for affordable housing, as all the bills under consideration today are quite ambitious and thoughtful in more unique approaches to improving opportunities for affordable housing. Realtors would like to learn more about these details through today from the hearing, as well as continued con conversations with the esteemed council members. We thank you for consideration of DCAR's views and we look forward to continuing to work together on these critical issues. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Hart? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Billy Hart and uh, I'm in uh, support of uh, the Bill 2604. Uh, I too uh, own a home. I've been in my house since uh, 2001, and I got it through something like the way you went through uh, Ms. Bowser, uh, Councilwoman Bowser from, uh, I went through Manor, went through, uh, I got a loan from HPAP, and I like to say that I'd have paid that loan off. Uh, uh, I'm not boasting about it, but my mortgage, uh, that's paid up until September. Your car always try to keep it three or four months in advance. You understand what I'm saying? I ain't never been late with a payment, none of that. You know what I'm saying? And all that thing about flipping, the only flipping I'm going to do is when I flip from this earthly house to my heavenly house. That's the only flipping I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think, and, and uh, when I addressed it, I addressed it wrong, but uh, I meant to address you as Mayor Bowser and Assistant, Assistant Deputy Mayor McDuffie and the Secretary of State, Mrs. Anita Barnes. <laughs> so I got everything wrong, so I got it right this time, didn't I? <laughs> but yeah, I just, and, and I was talking to Ms. Barnes, I think that y'all, it's the first time I've been in a committee that I think people really feel what people are saying, you know what I'm saying? And, and my hat is off to you, and I think y'all are doing a wonderful job, and I think uh, that y'all give this bill a lot of consideration, so I ain't got a whole lot to say. I didn't say what I had to say, so. Oh yeah, I'm going to say this about the, the equity thing. It is very important because of the fact that I got grandchildren I can leave to, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and, and it's a safety net for me. You know, I ain't, they never own nothing and they kind of own something, you know. That it, it, it's a pride, but it's not a boastful pride. You know what I'm saying? When dudes ask me, Nancy, uh, Jack, where you live at? I don't say I live in the hood. I say I live in my neighborhood. So thank you all for letting me share that. Well, thank you. And you also live in uh, one of the neighborhoods where we see home values going up yes. very steeply. And um, it sounds like you were able to buy at an affordable time mm -hmm. and, and maintain your home and stay in your home and yes. have an eye towards keeping your home and your right. own family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, that's something to be commended. So thank, thank you for you. coming thank down. Uh, Ms. Eddie? Ms. Edie? Ms. Edie? Yeah. Good afternoon, Chairman Bowser and committee members. My name is Phyllis Eady. I have been a proud owner of an affordable home in Detroit Park since 1998, 16 years to date. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of affordable home, home ownership 
and Bill 20-604. Like others in this room, I am a born and bred Washingtonian. Growing up around Dunbar High School at 200 End Street, I moved back into the Shore neighborhood later in life, raising two boys in a rental home and living not far from my mother. Community work was my life passion. Board meetings, picnics, neighborhood cleanups. My boys did it with me, did it with me too. While doing community work, I noticed that many of the many of the most involved residents were homeowners, and I started to yearn for a place of my own. Mm -hmm. As a renter, I had gotten to the point where I didn't where it didn't make sense to fix up my place anymore. I wasn't motivated to do anything more with it. I looked for the right place to purchase for seven years and finally found my beautiful home with Matt through Manor. Mm -hmm. I was happy it was just a couple streets over from Shaw, a neighborhood that had become my dear, had become very dear to my heart. My mother passed from cancer soon after I purchased. I hope she knew that I had successfully become a homeowner, something she would have been so proud of. Mm -hmm. It took me a while to get back into the, to, into the community work after my mother passed, but I con connected with my um, neighbors in Detroit Park, some who have lived here for a long time and slowly got reconnected. As a homeowner, I feel a responsibility to the, to the neighborhood and for and a stake in what has happened here. Truly only my home is important to me. I finance wants to remodel the entire downstairs and I am staying here during my retirement. My home location is very convenient. Everything I need is close is close by. I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I hope that this home can be for my youngest son. I have insurance so that when I pass, the home is paid for. I know that since I have purchased my home, policy of affordable home ownership has changed. I ask that the city council focus on creating home ownership opportunities for folks like me who qualify for and pay their mortgages, pay back their HPAP loans, contribute to their neighborhood, and use their homes for the betterment of themselves and their families. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Edie. Um, I don't have any additional questions. Ms. Bonds, do you have questions? No, I do not. I just want to thank you all very, very much. Um, thank you for your thank testimony. You. Thank you. We'll be submitting our written chopped it okay. up since the beginning of the <laughs> year. <laughs> thank you. We'll keep the record open. Um, Mr. Pol Pullman, Danielle Burrs, Jim Knight. Okay. Okay, and then I have David Moyayo and Stephen Michael Seed. Are they here? Are, are those channels? Okay, and so you'll be in the next one. Okay, Mr. Coleman, we'll hear from you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser and Councilmember Bonds and staff. My name is Robert Paul and I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. I'm going to testify on three bills today. I'm going to skip to the second page of my testimony in the interest of time. Uh, regarding Bill 20-604, Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act, CNHED's Ownership Housing Working Group has worked for the past several years on developing a bifurcated approach to addressing resale requirements on affordable home ownership projects that utilize funds from the Housing Production Trust Fund. This group, including MANA, Mikasa, DC Habitat, and others, use the experience of housing developers in the Ivy City neighborhood to inform the principles that we have incorporated into this bill. They found that prospective home buyers were unwilling to take the risk inherent in home ownership and purchase in a distressed neighborhood if they could not reap the normal benefits of home ownership when it came to selling and refinancing their homes. Buyers of affordable homes in the district are not at all likely to sell unless they absolutely have to. 
But should circumstances arise, such as the need for additional space to accommodate a growing family, they want to be able to do so without concerns about finding another qualified low-income buyer to purchase their home in a neighborhood where home purchase is still not the norm. More importantly, homeowners want to be able to refinance their homes to help send a child to college, as was mentioned uh, earlier today, or to use as a safety valve should there be a major unexpected expense that occurs. Having a cover on the property that requires resale at a greatly reduced price can often eliminate their ability to refinance the property. Thus, the risk of purchasing in a distressed neighborhood often outweigh the restricted benefits. CMHD is supporting the East of the River Home Ownership Campaign to encourage low and moderate income residents to purchase, while they still can, in Ward 7 and 8. A key element of encouraging them to do so is to provide an alternative to the current restriction on resale for 15 years. As others have testified, the proposed bill will reduce that requirement to five years in high poverty neighborhoods. There's been much discussion about the fact that this provision would affect a few census tracts, not entire neighborhoods, as has been uh, stated in a very misleading fashion, uh, in transitional neighborhoods. Unfortunately, there's not a perfect metric that can be applied that everyone will be satisfied with to determine which neighborhoods should be considered distressed. But the reality is that it's very unlikely we'd use the trust fund in some of these transitioning neighborhoods because of the high land costs. I'm going to comment on Bill 20-708, Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Funding Act of 2014. We're pleased, Council Member Bowser, that you introduced this bill, and we'd like to see it passed. But as you know, without providing the funding in the budget to make the $100 million per year a reality, the bill will have no effect. The most certain way to make this happen is to appropriate ongoing revenue to support the trust fund. The council in its actions yesterday appropriated a 50 million from increased revenue if projected by the CFO in his revised June 2014 revenue estimate. This is the opportunity, we think, to direct ongoing revenue to the trust fund, and CNHD urges you to lead this committee and the council in designating roughly half of that amount, 25 million from an increased revenue to reach the $100 million funding level for this year and beyond. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Burrs? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Bowser, uh, Councilmember Bonds, and staff. My name is Danielle Burrs, and I'm the Policy Officer at the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development. My testimony today will focus on Bill 2604, the Affordable Homeownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Act, Amendment Act of 2013. The purpose of this legislation is to balance two distinct goals that can both be served through the same mechanism. The mechanism is subsidized homeownership. The goals are, one, to preserve affordable units into the future for areas of the district that have high housing costs, and two, to maximize equity, uh, equity appreciation for homeowners who purchase units in distressed neighborhoods that already have low housing costs. As with all public policy goals, some organizations and individuals value one aim over another. CMHED believes it's crucially important to support both goals and that they will uh, uplift each other and enhance each other and help lift up areas of the district that haven't yet benefited from the current wave of public and private investment. The bill would preserve the current 15-year affordability restriction for most census tracts and introduce a five-year affordability option for distressed areas. It's important to note that while legislation would limit the district's affordability restriction to five years in some areas, it explicitly allows additional limits from developers. Nonprofit affordable housing developers in the district use a variety of models to provide quality homeownership uh, opportunities. Some of those models would never contemplate using a five-year affordability term, as you've heard today. Others say that having the flexibility to use a five-year affordability restriction is essential to their, their continued work. CNHD members have discussed this issue for years, and despite the diversity of individual programs, they decided to support other practitioners in providing a variety of successful homeownership programs, rather than only promote their own individual programs. While some witnesses today have taken theoretical positions, CNHD stance is based on a practical assessment of the problem by on-the-ground practitioners. Especially over the past year, CNHD and its ownership housing working group have reached out to other stakeholders, some of whom you've heard from today. It's been a long, complicated conversation. We've called in help from HUD, OTR, national level public policy groups, and others. Because of the limitations of available data, we are unable to create a truly perfect measure. 
the organizations that would be affected by this legislation are doing good work and they need a shorter affordability restriction in distressed areas to continue that good work. They can't afford to do projects in high cost areas, so even if those were included as distressed in the annual assessment, there would not be units developed there with a five year affordability term. In the real world, this legislation would work as intended and the current definition of distressed would work as intended. Given that reality, CNHUD has decided to include more census tracts rather than exclude some areas that truly need investment. At this time, I'd like to emphasize that the unit of measure in this bill is census tracts. It's not neighborhoods. So when you hear that some of the included census tracts are Columbia Heights or Brightwood, that's not accurate. As anyone who lives in DC knows, neighborhoods change starkly from block to block. One of the best investments we can make is to create affordable housing in a lower cost area adjacent to a more successful area to take advantage of that stability and the resources there. Furthermore, the bill includes an opportunity for anyone to testify about what census tract should be included via the DHCD uh, Consolidated Action Plan. As others have mentioned, this bill is a compromise. It addresses an urgent problem that we need to resolve. We need to create housing that works for low-income buyers. After years of discussion with a wide group of stakeholders, we believe that this is a sound compromise and that it's time to move forward. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Knight. Thank you, Chairwoman. I am uh, grateful for this opportunity to be in front of you and the committee. My name is Jim Knight. I'm the Executive Director of Jubilee Housing. We're a nonprofit uh, developer and manager and service provider of affordable rental housing where we are active in Adams Morgan and Columbia Heights. Uh, I also currently serve on the Housing Production Trust Fund Advisory Board. Uh, since our work at Jubilee is primary is exclusively on rental housing, uh, I want to provide context on where my viewpoint on, on this matter is coming from. And I am speaking primarily to Bill 2604. Uh, first, it's grounded in four decades of experience of walking with low-income families as they work to overcome the obstacles and limitations associated with multi-generation poverty. In this time, we have witnessed countless families use affordable rental housing as a platform for gathering the experience and resources needed to purchase a home. For most of these families, that purchase is the first one in the family's history. And in almost every case, it leads to a new trajectory for subsequent generations and subsidized housing is not needed again. Stories like this make it clear that uh, investment in affordable home ownership is a, a good use, a powerful use of city resources. The, the second point of context that I bring to this particular issue is having served as uh, president of the Coalition uh, for Nonprofit Economic Development as well as having served on a committee that looked exactly at the issue of how do we balance the goals of long-term affordability with the ability to appreciate equity. I'm going to summarize some longer comments by saying uh, one of the key learnings in that process was that we don't need a one-size-fits-all approach. We need multiple models that allow for different forms of home ownership to be provided. Among those must be the type that allow people to accumulate equity. What I leave in the comments here for a second, what I feel like we've heard a lot of today is, a, is the beginning of a presumptive position that, that shared equity is the only way to do responsible public policy. And I think that is a huge mistake. I think that shared equity has its place and it should be one of the tools that's used uh, by the city uh, to promote affordability over the long haul as well as opportunities for low and moderate income people. But it almost feels like the, the context of this discussion has begun to assume that's the way and that if you don't support that way only, you're somehow misusing public resources. And I just think that is a bad characterization. I'm not attributing it to anybody in particular, but it is the tenor of, of some of the comments today. Uh, I, I will summarize that I think in the time of serving on that committee, uh, we saw the balance point between length of covenants, how long. Uh, property is affordable, whether or not there are resale conditions in that term period, whether or not equity can be accumulated by the owner, and whether or not the subsidy is recaptured. Uh, this bill will recapture all subsidy at resale so that that money can be used to promote affordable housing in the future, and it has a balanced approach to terms on affordability. I think the key here is balance, balance, balance that allows for multiple models to be at work in our city. I'll conclude my comments on that bill there, and I'd like to just say uh, 20 seconds on uh, Bill 2708. Uh, you and other council members, virtually all council members, uh, have continued to 
talk about how important the Housing Production Trust Fund is as our primary production tool in the city. And yet, uh, the budget did not reach uh, the $100 million a year mark that has been advocated for so fiercely and supported in so many ways uh, by the uh, task force a few months ago, by the advisory board now. Uh, as Bob just laid out in his testimony, there is a mechanism available to you this year uh, to make part of the surplus available to go into the budget now in a way that will recur, recur in future years. This is an opportunity that we believe you have to take to strengthen this important tool. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and open to questions if you have them. And, and thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Palmer, can, uh, or any of you can explain, uh, in your testimony you talk about um, why, in fact, a homeowner can't tap into his equity because of these restrictions. Right. Um, and and it's, that's not a restriction in the restrictions. It is what the mortgage companies, um, they, they won't lend. Is that, is that the case? Well, um, you know, I, mortgage company would need to look at what the, they would look at the value of the house. Let's say it's worth $300,000. But if there's a covenant on it that says you must sell to a home buyer at the same income level that you bought it at, that would be at a lower level, say $200,000. So you can't you can't refinance against the three hundred. You have to refinance against that very low level, that very low resale level. Otherwise, you'd be violating the covenant. Uh, if you can't sell at that higher level, then you can't refinance at that higher level. And now, what about the gap between what you bought at and what you're able to sell at? That would depend on what the terms and conditions of the agreement are. Um, Okay. It would, you know, I don't, I don't know what each specific, uh, I don't know what the covenants would be there, but I do know on a resale covenant that um, you'd have to stick with the, the resale value as the maximum amount of value that you could possibly refinance against. And it obviously would have to be, you could only refinance against the difference between that and your first mortgage. Right. And I, I, I am... Am I understanding correctly that I might have, in that the scenario that you meant, just mentioned, I could have bought at 175. Is that right? Uh, or, or given that 200 is, is the ban that you talk about selling to some, um, my ability to sell somebody to somebody in a similar um, income ban. Mm -hmm. I mean that similar income ban would be redefined each year. It's. Um, based on AMI. So if AMI goes up 10% over several years, then uh, the selling price, uh, assuming that the, it was the same AMI level, 50% of AMI, uh, the selling price would go up 10%. Okay. So it was your testimony not to adjust um, the bill as presented at all? You're, you're fine with the definitions of distressed and the the period, the rollback period. The right. Period. Okay. Is that the testimony of everybody at the table? So there um, were some suggestions that we already shared with Councilmember Bond's office that we would like to see, um, which are slightly different than the bill as introduced. Um, and I think Cheryl Court spoke to those earlier. Um, I can run through them. And how, and, well, I recall Cheryl's testimony and I'm changing the definitions not to be the percent of poverty, but um, the difference between what was that? Um, no, yeah, not that's not the part that we that's not the part that, <laughs> that we come endorsed. together on. Okay, um, is it in your testimony, Ms. Burrs? The measure? Yes. No, it's not. Okay. Um, so I can walk through that right now. Um, so we uh, came to consensus internally. Um, that we should, uh, if you're looking at the original legislation, it's A1EA. Um, when determining whether a census tract shall be deemed a distressed neighborhood, the mayor shall consider, in addition to the poverty rate, whether the median home price is above or below the district's median home price. All data may be reviewed as three-year rolling averages. If a census tract's median home price for the last year of available data is above the district's median home price, it will not be considered distressed. 
The mayor shall make the determination of distressed neighborhoods on an annual basis, and a map identifying all distressed neighborhoods shall be included in the annual consolidated action plan, which is the annual plan associated with the five-year consolidated plan. Uh, this would give stakeholders an opportunity to testify about any needed changes in a given year. So there would be that original measure and then testimony on which census tracts might be outliers. Are you concerned that that's too complicated? It has too many moving parts? It's a lot less complicated than where we started, to be honest. Okay. Um, it would be great if we could simplify it more. Certainly, developers, the more straightforward it is, the better they can plan ahead. So certainly... The better they can plan and the better we can enforce. Right. Okay, yeah. so the more complicated this is, and already my, you know, it was rolling around in my head a little bit. Um, and, you know, I, it, it all makes sense when I, when I heard it described a little bit earlier. But uh, it does concern me that it's the measure is so complicated and it changes so frequently. So but If I yeah. could comment, uh -huh. I, I just, you know, the basics is 20% 20, 20 right. of uh, poverty. Okay. Anything beyond that has been a result of long drawn out, negotiations and trying to reach agreement among all the parties uh, because some of the neighborhoods it was felt that there were some neighborhoods that shouldn't be included that's when we came up with well let's look at uh, selling so, price some, uh, something else and okay we could add that on but you're absolutely right as soon as you add on something else now you've got two layers that you have to track so you know our basic position that we set forth and that the board approved is anything above 20 percent of, it, of uh, poverty right okay um, so we uh, and, and I know that a lot of people have been working on this a long and hard time and we recognize the need for changes I will say um, my way of thinking about this is has been uh, influenced by um, your hard work uh, as well um, and so we will we'll try to get something moving just as soon as possible miss miss bonds Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to ditto um, your comments. Um, the goal is not to make it more complicated, but to simplify it for the people of the District of Columbia. And so if, if we can have one measure, a measure that works uh, for those who will be purchasers and those who will be suppliers of the housing, I think it, it works better for the District of Columbia. I'm, I'm encouraged to hear your comments on um, the record because that's so very important. You've been doing this, uh, providing housing for 40 years. And if you don't know how to do this and, and what the measure might be, then I don't know who we can look to to really help us come up with a conclusion, a good way to spend taxpayers' money. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Ogunsanya and Mr. Seed. Mr. Ogasanya, have your testimony. You may proceed. Um, yeah. okay. <coughs> uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present, uh, provide my testimony on behalf of City First Homes today. Um, City First Homes is a DC nonprofit whose mission is to create permanently affordable and well-stewarded homes in Washington, DC for now and for future generations. We accomplished this mission by using a shared appreciation model to calculate the fair share that homeowners receive when they sell their homes. This simply means that the homeowners share a portion of their appreciation of, of, the, uh, of their home with the next purchaser. As a program manager for City First Homes, I work with current homeowners who have purchased our permanently affordable homes in the, di in the district. One of my primary responsibilities is to assist homeowners during their period of ownership by providing them with stewardship services and also ensuring that their homes are being well maintained. I also assist homeowners when they decide to sell their homes to calculate their appreciation, the equity they do receive back, and the sales price to the next purchaser. Um, this process ensures the affordability of the home to the next low 
to moderate income purchaser that comes through our program. Although we are a young program, we've had uh, one resale and are currently going through the process of a second. Um, the first resale we had was listed and went on the contract within a week, and this property is with a permanent uh, restriction that does not come off at any point in time. Um, the second resale that we currently have on the market was listed and went on the contract within two weeks. Both of these homes are located in the Columbia Heights neighborhood, which is a very um, high price neighborhood, as you all know. Um, this is a prime example that properties with resale restrictions do sell in the district. Um, the most important thing is that these homeowners are able to build wealth after selling their homes and move on to another home without requiring additional subsidy. Um, we have also had a homeowner refinance their home during the time that we have been established. Um, and as I'm running out of time, um, I'll just wait until the end if you have any questions, and I'll let my colleague uh, Stephen Seed speak a little bit. Okay, Mr. Seed. Thank you for this opportunity today. Um, I'll be coming regarding uh, Bill 20. Is your microphone four. on? Okay, if you Hello? could just sit towards yeah. it a little bit, that might help. I don't think it's on. Hello? Oh. I'll move over. Okay. okay that's much better. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my name is Stephen Seed. Um, I am a program manager at City First Homes. So thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of City First Homes on the critical issue of affordable home ownership in Washington, D.C. As a program manager for City First Homes, I work directly with individuals and families who are tirelessly seeking homes affordable to their income, but have found themselves priced out of the housing market. So City First Homes is a nonprofit housing organization that works with households to lead the cycle of renting and achieve a stable, affordable home ownership. Uh, since 2010, City First Homes has created over 120 permanently affordable homes and has a pipeline projection to achieve over 200 permanently affordable homes by the end of the year. And so we are especially committed to the long-term success of each and every homeowner. Uh, following industry best practices, we provide ongoing stewardship services that support the homeowners for the life that they're in the home. Uh, the key difference between City First Homes and other traditional home ownership programs is the shared equity model to create permanent affordability in housing. So long-term affordable home ownership programs are more cost efficient than traditional homeownership programs. They magnify the social impact of the public's investment and serve more people. By investing in a home and limiting a portion of the appreciation at resale, they ensure that the homeowners build wealth and the home can be sold again and again to low and moderate income households. A fundamental cornerstone of City First Homes and other shared equity home ownership models is the creation of wealth. Shared equity home homeowners build substantial wealth through principal mortgage payments, a portion of appreciation, and the tax benefits. In some circumstances, our homeowners are able to own a home and build wealth for less than they would previously renting. Long-term affordable ownership programs are an attractive proposition for many low and moderate income home buyers. A report from the Champlain Housing Trust uh, the nation's largest community development land trust found that for shared equity homeowners who sold their home five years after purchase, 67.4% had built enough wealth to transition to a market rate non-appreciation sharing home. Shared equity homeownership is a viable strategy for building long-term wealth and maximizing public investment. We have several concerns about this bill which would reduce future opportunities to help more D.C. families become home, homeowners and rapidly lose affordable homes in neighborhoods that are rising in value. Uh, we believe that long-term affordable shared equity approach to home ownership should be eligible for funding through the Housing Production Trust Fund. The current bill would terminate affordability terms at five and 15 years. So we appreciate that our colleagues at CNHED um, they did not intend to exclude longer-term home ownership approaches and have agreed to those amendments. 
Uh, in addition, we believe that the bill should be more careful and have a, a more a technically sound approach to distressing, uh, dis defining distressed neighborhoods. Like David mentioned, we had two resales. Both of those homes were located on Sherman Avenue in Columbia Heights, and so this is an example that homes with covenants do resell, not just with five or 15, but also with permanent affordability restrictions. Um, and so they were able to build wealth and purchase uh, their other home. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of City First Homes, and I hope this was uh, helpful to provide clarity on the many benefits of shared equity home ownership. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to continue the discussion and what my colleagues from Cornerstone Partnership and Urban Institute said uh, today. There's lots of data and research out there about shared equity home ownership, and we're happy to share that information with you. Okay, thank you, Mr. C. Let me uh, kind of put to you the, the question I made earlier about just kind of describe to me all the steps that you've gone through to, um, to purchase here or where the city's been involved, what subsidies, if any, that, that you tapped into marketing to homeowners, um, their decisions to, to buy and as such. So I don't know how many properties you're talking about. What, yeah. what have you been involved in? So what City First Homes has done from its inception, um, it was started through funding from uh, D.C. government. And so that initial model provided second mortgages at a fixed rate of $75,000. They were low interest and deferred uh, payments. So homeowners were able to uh, take that uh, second mortgage and select a property and purchase it and so that reduced the cost um, to own a home doing that they signed permanent affordability covenants um, that t that describe their resale uh, restrictions we have a very robust pre and post purchase program that talks them through um, the resale restrictions we sit down with them they go through home buyer education and are fully informed about resales refinances our covenants allow refinancing it allows them to pull out equity up to the equity that they have uh, got through their appreciation in their home so tell me this what type of DC government funding are you tapping into so it was initially a grant from a grant. Um, yeah it was through the uh, was the legislation was in 2006 so it came out of um, the comprehensive housing strategy task force that there needed to be a workforce housing trust in and what was DC. the size of the grant it was so the initial commitment was 10 million dollars uh, that commitment was then reduced substantially um, and I'm not sure the final amount that we were able to uh, hold on to from that, but is there still money there? Have you have you allocated yeah. it at all? So we are continually going, uh, working with developers, um, Bruno Benito from Dante's Partners, Mankiti Group. We have a lot of uh, projects that we've worked with throughout uh, the city, and so our model now is providing uh, financing uh, to developers. Uh, that are in partnership with the property he was talking about, the Metropolitan Overlook. The, uh, DHED is involved in that. They had 15 res year restrictions. We worked with them to make those restrictions permanent, um, affordability so restrictions. So you're using the monies that you have to invest in affordable housing development, or are you using it for second mortgages for people so, who have already identified housing? Yeah, so uh, there were uh, the first couple years, we did about 40 second mortgages. Uh, for homeowners and then uh, we saw that we were able to actually create more units by working with developers and leverage that money even further um, because that second mortgage amount was a fixed rate and so if we're able to work with developers we potentially we could create uh, permanent affordable units for anywhere around twenty to twenty five thousand dollars instead of the seventy five thousand dollars so we're able actually to leverage that that money and create more units okay so you you've moved on from making the set the second mortgage loan currently yes okay um, and in the second in the case of the second mortgage loans those forty or so units those have a permanent covenant correct those have a permanent affordability covenant on them and so there's an appreciation chair um, that's there. Um, there's many ways that organizations around the country do their resale restrictions. It could be a fixed rate appreciation based on uh, if you're looking at the market and what the average is, you can do a fixed rate that's lower than that. You can 
based on the market by doing So tell me, let me ask you this. Tell me how your model is different from the status quo. Not what's proposed in this bill, but the status yeah, quo. Yeah, so how City First Homes works is that there is a 25-75% appreciation uh, share. So uh, at the time the homeowners in the home, when they're ready to sell, they retain 25% of the appreciation in value of the home. They receive 100% of the equity that they built from paying down the principal of their mortgage, just like any homeowner. Um, you're paying down your mortgage, so you retain all of that. We have a clause that if there are any improvements in the home, they, we give them a credit for the improvements that they're, they've made in the home and the annual tax benefits. So um, it's a 75-25% split. That 75% um, that's retained stays, stays in the home. So for the next home buyer, instead of the home appreciating at 100%, it's actually for the next home buyer only appreciated at 75%. So we maintain affordability over time by keeping the subsidy with the unit instead of letting that go away with the homeowner. So ju just to follow up on what Steven said, the 75% actually goes back into the home with the original subsidy to maintain the affordability. So instead of just repaying back the original subsidy and pro possibly losing that unit, you're leaving it in there and adding um, the additional subsidy from the market appreciation. And that home will not require any additional subsidy from any other source apart from what it has created through market forces. And our uh, model is based on the Champlain Housing Trust, which is actually the oldest and largest uh, community land trust um, in the nation. When we first got started, we flew all the council members out to see that, um, see the Champlain Housing uh, Trust, and learn about community land trust because they are a shared equity home ownership model. So you have or have not been involved in this um, coalition that's been meeting around this issue? Yes, yeah, so we have been involved with, um, in addition to other advocates, um, talking about uh, City First Homes and shared equity. I personally have not been in all the, the meetings. We are a small staff at City First Homes and have not been involved in all the meetings, but we have had some representatives at the table. Okay. So it seems, though, that you're suggesting some changes to the proposed bill, but you're not opposing the proposed bill. Yeah, so those changes, ideally, our model is permanent affordability, but we understand there's a continuum of housing uh, in the city and home ownership options. So we uh, would want these changes, uh, amendments made, so they don't limit limited equity co-ops, which were mentioned earlier, the way it was originally made, this would eliminate uh, Community land trusts, similar to City First Homes, limited equity co-ops. So we didn't want those excluded. So that's an amendment that we would want made. And we would recommend revisiting this calculation of distressed neighborhoods. Uh, just in particular, it's, it's so much of uh, the city that we think that calculation should be further examined. Okay. Those are my questions. Council Member Bonds. Thank you very much, um, Chairman um, Bowser. Um, I just had a quick thought as you were talking about elimination of these. Wondering if the idea was that um, this bill was blanket covering the entire city, what would you think about that? And not limited to distressed um, areas. Just curious as to your thinking. So if that. all affordability restrictions were five years in the city? Five years, uh-huh. And yeah. it was all over the city, every census tract. So I think we'd be fundamentally opposed uh, to five-year affordability restrictions. Just looking at public investment, what we're putting into the city, and also looking at the limited resources that is from uh, the government to subsidize units, in addition to the, the availability of land. Uh, looking at neighborhoods and ones that are rapidly changing with five-year restrictions, your neighborhood, look how quickly Columbia Heights has changed, or Trinidad is changing now. With those five-year restrictions, you're putting more and more subsidy every year to move further and further out of these neighborhoods, and people are being priced out. So it's important to have a stock of affordable homes, so not just one family benefits from being close to uh, restaurants and grocery stores and neighborhood amenities, but that can be generational and go on to other members as well. Uh, I think it would be, yeah, it, I don't think it would be a wise policy decision to have shorter affordability 
restrictions. Okay, well, I guess I'm really asking more about um, the opportunity for affordability across the city and not limited to any particular census tract. If you could, I, I don't think I'm completely understanding. Uh, okay, right now the, the bill as written and as you and others have been working on, it is limited to these areas that we call distressed yes. areas. And that seems to be a big issue as to yes. what what do really defines distress. Yes. Some want it to be dollar value, others want it to be something else, you know, sell, saleability, mm -hmm. uh, recent sales, 10 houses in the last two months, whatever. So my question is, if the issue is where and what defines distressed areas, if that were not an issue, in order for your company mm -hmm. and other companies and other organizations that help create affordable housing across the city, what if it were available across the city? Even in Georgetown, if, it, if by some way you could find such a, a location. If I some way you can find a location in Georgetown, yeah. I, w I would want that secured for a longer time of affordability because Georgetown is going to be eliminated. I, I think that um, a shared equity home ownership is one option in this continuum, and I don't think anyone is trying to make this the policy agenda uh, moving forward. I think that this has been brought forward because of the issue of reducing affordability restrictions in a city that's facing an affordable housing crisis. All right, well, thank you. Um, can I just ask um, your organization, um, what income bracket do you generally serve? Yeah, so from um, our legislation from the D.C. government, we have to be in an average of 80% area median income. Um, our homes are affordable to an uh, area median income of 60% at the moment. And we are additionally working more and more with uh, cooperatives, so include limited equity cooperatives who have a lower um, AMI level anywhere that could be 30% uh, percent area median income. For and cooperatives? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and also we've um, assisted homeowners within all different income ranges. Even we assisted a homeowner to purchase an inclusionary zoning home. Um, and um, I believe it was in Adams Morgan or somewhere, I can't remember. And so, and that, that, that homeowner was a, at a lower income band. So we're not just um, focused on 100 to 120 or 80 to 60. We're, um, we, we try to make sure that our homes are affordable to a wide income band of uh, potential homeowners. Okay, may, may I then ask, um, as you are doing your work, um, uh, have you um, any, are any of your clients purchasers of homes, let's say, in census tracts which would fall in Ward 7 or 8? We, we currently don't have any homeowners in Ward 8. We do have in Ward 7. We do. Uh, do you know how many in Ward 7? Um, we I, did I, I think of maybe two or three. Uh, this is of your 40? Yes. I believe uh, two of our homeowners purchased in Wards, two or three of them just in Ward 7. Um, we have um, a majority of them in uh, Ward, uh, I believe, 4 or 5, and we have a couple in 2. Okay. We have mentioned continuously, you know, like Columbia Heights, Adams Morgan. I think that's more Ward 1 census tracts. So I was just curious. And, yeah, just and 1 as well, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, but, but we're, and Sherman, yes. Sherman is also Ward 1. Yes, but we're... we're open to you know creating permanently affordable homes in any ward in the district um, we're always looking for partnerships with developers to create um, permanently affordable homes uh, within their projects um, it all depends on accessibility to those developers and what their interests are are you developing um, homes now we are not developers, we partner we with, partner with developers, partner. Yeah. yeah, like BUA. Do you create joint ventures? Um, no, we mostly f um, okay. finance, and um, they, you know, we let the developers do what they do. We just finance the, the uh, development in return for uh, affordable units. Okay. I just have one, one other question. Um, let's see. 
does this bill with the changes that we're proposing and you've been a part of the work groups to some extent allow your company's model to remain intact if the, uh, the changes that are made to uh, that don't eliminate it at um, 5 to, to uh, 15 years if 5 or 15 years are minimum in the bill then yes, okay. not not the maximum. Okay, now if I'm if I'm correct in understanding what we what we're talking about now, the bill was proposing five years, and I think the work group came up. You guys came up with an idea that we would not limit it to five. Mm -hmm. That we would also permit um, your organization yes. to add additional covenant. Correct. So, um, yes, there's been agreement uh, working with the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development for the change that it would allow um, City First Homes, Community Land Trusts, Limited Equity Cooperatives to receive Housing Production Trust Fund uh, funds because uh, that five years would not be a maximum, it would be the minimum. All right. Thank you very much. Right on time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You. Uh, we'll now hear from the government. Uh, the government is uh, represented by Victor Hoskins and Jeffrey Barnett and John Ross. Yeah. Did you want us to come up after no, Mr. I Hoskins? Come up as I called you. Okay. Is Mr. Hoskins not here? He's not here. Okay. Mr. Ross, please have a seat. And uh, Andrew Trueblood, my deputy chief of staff. He may not sit. One of you may sit. Okay. <coughs> what what bills are you testifying about, sir? All of them. All of them. And Mr. Ross, are you testifying about all of them? No, ma'am. Just the. Uh, can you turn on your microphone? Just the disposition. Disposition. Mr. Barnett. Just the disposition. The uh, 2713 Affordable Housing Act of 2014. So basically, the the bond financing. Okay. I'm scanning through um, Mr. Hoskins' uh, testimony, and um, I don't normally allow people who are not signed up. And I, so you're prepared to answer questions? Yes. With, with my deputy chief of staff, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we'll hear from you, but if I could ask you uh, to turn to uh, your page three where you start talking about your positions on the legislation, um, that would be helpful. That's where you want me to begin? Okay. Okay, okay good afternoon. I'm Chairman of Bowser, members and staff of the Committee of Economic Development. For the record, my name is uh, Rich Nichols, and I'm the Chief of Staff uh, for the Deputy Mayor of Planning and Economic Development. And. Uh, with regard to the uh, legislation about which we're testifying, first, the disposition, the disposition uh, of District Land and Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013 proposes a fixed percentage requirement of affordable units in proposed housing developments. The, the, the uh, aforementioned Deputy Mayor just passed this. Um, is, is he planning to come? Uh, okay, you may want to, I'll wait while you, you wait? let okay. him know that we're ready for him. Uh, Mr. Ross, why don't we turn to you? 
you want to do that? Who's going to somebody going to do that? Thanks. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Bowser and <coughs> members of the Committee on Economic Development. My name is John Ross, Senior Advisor and Director of Economic Development Finance for the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. I am pleased to testify for the Office of the Chief Financial Officer on the disposition of district land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013. This bill sets forth new requirements for the proposed disposition of district-owned properties that are intended to be used for residential purposes and include 10 or more units. Under the bill, developers of, the, developers of such property would be required to set aside 10, uh, 20 to 30 percent of the residential units as affordable housing units unless the Chief Financial Officer certifies that the value of the property to be disposed of is insufficient to support the affordable housing requirements. Such CFO certification would need to take into account all available local and federal sources of funding for, for affordable housing. Further, the certification is required to demonstrate that the terms and conditions of the proposed disposition maximize the intent to which the bill's affordable housing requirements can be realized. If the Council desires to adopt the legislation, the OCFO can perform the necessary analysis and deliver the certifications required under the bill. In order to complete our analysis and certification, the OCFO will request certain information about the property in question and about the proposed residential projects. Such information may include the developer's construction cost estimates, financing commitments, and project cash flows. Upon enactment of the legislation, the OCFO will inform the Mayor's Office of the exact information requirements and publish such requirements on our website. Current district law requiring inclusionary zoning compliance allows developers to apply to build affordable units required in an alternative off-site location. Council may want to consider clarifying the disposition legislation to specify how the OCFO's analysis should treat any developer product of affordable units in an off-site location. Finally, to clarify our understanding of the legislation as drafted, the bill would not require the OCFO to analyze any disposition agreements that did not include building residential units. Also, the legislation only affects proposed land dis disposition agreements submitted by the mayor for council approval. The OCFO would not analyze any developer responses to dis disposition RFPs not selected by the mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. This concludes my testimony. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, um, and welcome uh, Deputy Mayor Hoskins. Thank you. Um, we've heard one of the CFO's um, set of remarks. Why don't I turn to the second set of remarks, and then um, we'll turn to you. Okay. Mr. Barnett. Yeah. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Bowser and Council Member Bonds and members of the committee. I am Jeffrey Barnett, Deputy Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer of the District of Columbia. I am pleased to testify on Bill 2713, the District of Columbia Affordable Housing Act of 2014. As you know, the bill's purpose is to promote affordable housing through the development of a 10-year, $1 billion plan that provides for $100 million a year to increase, build, and modernize affordable housing in the district. The bill provides authority to issue bonds to finance the reconstruction, renovation, and emergency maintenance of affordable housing facilities. The source of funding to support this bond financing would be net revenues generated by the Lottery and Charitable Games Board. The first item to address is the impact on the general fund. Currently, the lottery annually transfers to the general fund all amounts not used to meet lottery operating costs. Over the past 10 years, this has averaged to be about $69.3 million each year. Starting with fiscal year 2014 and ending in fiscal year 2018, the projected average annual transfer amount is $66.7 million. Thus, if the lottery revenues are shifted from the general fund, it will be necessary to reduce the operating budget by an equal amount. The proposed new bonds will also impact the district's 12% debt cap. As you know, there is currently very little flexibility for new debt under the debt cap. The Capital Improvement Plan, also known as the CIP, has utilized almost all available borrowing capacity under the debt cap. So in addition to the reduction to the operating budget, any additional borrowing outside the current CIP will require reduction 
to the amounts borrowed to fund other district capital projects. <clears throat> Another matter of concern, of concern is the overall size of the proposed borrowing. Based on our analysis, the lottery revenues are insufficient to support the planned $1 billion bonds even over a 10-year period. The current projected lottery revenues would likely produce a borrowing capacity of approximately $300 million during the next 10 years. Furthermore, due to the uncertain and fluctuating nature of lottery revenues, generally rating agencies impose very conservative rating tests to determine the amount that may be borrowed based on lottery revenues. Because lottery-based bonds generally do not have strong bond debt service coverage levels, the lottery-based bonds tend to have ratings in the low single A category. Our borrowing capacity analysis assumed debt service coverage of three times the maximum annual debt service, which is typical of a single A rating. So in order to receive a triple A rating, we would have to have debt service coverage of at least four times, and to get this coverage, we would have had to decrease the overall program issuance to below $300 million. As you know, current borrowing for the CIP plan uses general obligation or income tax secured bonds, both of which have much higher rated ratings than single A bonds. Higher rated bonds have lower interest costs, so using lower rated lottery based bonds would result in a higher overall debt service interest cost for the district. The lottery bond interest payments for $300 million of bonds would be approximately $25.5 million more than, we issue, than if we issued general obligation bonds and would be $33.9 million more than if we issued income tax bonds over the same life of the bonds. This bill also may impact the district's general obligation bond rating because we could potentially be diverting funds otherwise available to pay general obligation debt. We fully support the affordable housing initiative. However, given the fact that this bond structure has a negative impact on the operating budget, creates a violation of the debt cap, and is more expensive than other forms of financing, we would oppose the bill in its current form. This concludes my remarks. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bar <coughs> Mr. Barnett. Um, Deputy Mayor Hoskins, I have your testimony. Um, Mr. Nichols, I, I think, only got through a little bit of it. Okay. So he started on page three, which I think is where, um, at my request, um, which is where you start with um, the recommendations. Report. I the think the report. recommendations on the legislation. So feel free to do the same. Where, where was I looking at? On um, the land disposition uh, for affordable housing. Is that the is that the only? Oh, you. I'm sorry. I just I don't think I understood your headings. Okay. I think you're testifying on. Um, you're discussing all of the bills. Yes. Yeah, so okay. My okay. apologies. That's okay. That's okay. I'll, I'll just start. I'll just start. Yeah. I misread your head, your headings. My <laughs> apologies, Mr. Nichols. So I should really be apologizing. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Bowser, Council Member Bonds, and members of the staff. Uh, for my for the record, my name is Victor Hoskins. I am the Deputy Mayor of Planning and Economic Development for the District of Columbia. I am pleased to present testimony regarding the following bills. B20-594, Disposition of District Land for Affordable Land Amendment Act of 2013. B20-713, District of Columbia Affordable Housing Act of 2014. B20-604, Affordable Housing Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act of 2013. B20-708, Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Act of 2014. B20-713, District of Columbia Affordable Housing Act 2014. B20-622, Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Senior Act of 2013. When, the, when Mayor Gray took office in January 2011, the housing landscape in the District of Columbia was cha changing dramatically. The lower income residents and wage earners experienced cha challenges in identifying and securing housing they could afford. In response to this need, Mayor Gray appointed a comprehensive housing task force comprised of 32 housing professionals, service providers, and government leaders with the mission of helping district officials create the mechanisms required to satisfy the demand of affordable housing and to ensure the sustainability of an economically diverse community. In March 2013, the task force delivered to the mayor their report providing a framework for addressing these complex challenges. 
The task force report became the roadmap for Mayor Gray's effort to ensure continued affordability of the District of Columbia. Most notably, the Mayor's Affordable Housing Initiative, a product of the task force, seeks to produce and preserve 10,000 units of affordable housing by 2020. To date, we are 60% of the way toward realizing that goal. 5,971 units of affordable housing have been delivered or under construction, and another 6,024 units are in the pipeline. The mayor has worked hard, as mayor worked hard to commit unprecedented amounts of district funding to affordable housing, leverage numerous public and private sources of capital to finance affordable housing, and streamline the administrative processes and data sharing across the 15 agencies required to develop and ultimately fund affordable housing. Over the last year, the mayor has committed almost $200 million, an unprecedented amount, towards the creation and preservation of affordable housing in the District of Columbia. In February of 2013, the mayor made a commitment of $100 million for affordable housing. Last November, the mayor followed through on this financial commitment by announcing a pipeline of over 3,000 units. This represents $187 million of investment and a total of $600 million of affordable housing developments. And because the mayor's dedication to affordable housing in the district, we are already seeing results. With the current completion of more than 5,900 units of affordable housing to date, we're almost halfway to the goal of 10,000 units. And we still have six years and more than $200 million uh, to develop affordable housing. Many of these units have been produced through DEMPED's real estate projects, where 30% of the housing we have produced to date has been affordable. Broadly, um, these actions put the district at, at the top um, uh, the top city in the country for dedication uh, to affordable housing. Just a few months ago, an Urban Institute analysis of housing affordability at the county level shows D.C. is the second best county in the country for matching affordable housing supply with demand. Housing Production Trust Fund. Many of the bills being discussed today involve the use of funds from the Housing Production Trust Fund, a mechanism uh, to develop um, affordable housing. HPTF was established as a permanent revolving uh, special revenue fund providing financial assistance to eligible nonprofit and for-profit developers to facilitate the creation of affordable housing and related activities for district residents. Over the past three and a half years, in order to effectively address these ch the challenges faced with the administration of HPTF, DEMPED and the Department of Housing and Community Development have partnered with other housing agencies to restructure the process by which projects receive funding. I would like to take a minute to discuss some of the enhancements we have recently instituted. Beginning in 2013, DHCD implemented an interagency approach to improve allocation of HPTF funds. As a result, district's process of providing funding to support affordable housing was streamlined and the HPTF funds were utilized in ways that expanded eligibility. Working together with DHCD, the Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Human Services, D.C. Housing Finance Agency, and the D.C. Housing Authority coordinated investments in housing through the issuance of a joint notification of funding availability, a SUPANOFA. This, this interagency initiative facilitated the coordination of capital, operating, and support service funds to be used for the development of projects specifically targeting 0 to 30 percent area, uh, area median income households. The initiatives have created housing opportunities for low and moderate income residents and permanent supportive housing units for special needs populations. Eighteen projects received conditional letters of commitment um, from the last year's SUPANOFA. It is projected that these projects will yield a total of 938 affordable housing units, of which 430 will provide housing to special needs populations. In FY 2014, DHCD continued efforts to streamline and improve the SUPANOFA process. First, DHCD held workshops for potential housing developers, general contractors, architect and community -based, architects and community-based organizations in an effort to clarify and assist with with eligibility and compliance application requirements. Second, DHCD implemented a national best practices requiring 5% of all units be permanent supportive housing. Additionally, DHCD um, segmented the SUPANOFA into a two-tiered application process. Tier 1 projects are developments that are shovel-ready, can be fast-tracked through the underwriting and close on the financing within the calendar year. Tier 2 projects are developments still in the planning phase. Because of the tiering process, projects are moving significantly faster through the DHCD pipeline. Positions on the legislation. That said, affordable housing is not without its challenges, and this administration is eager to work with the council to come up with creative solutions. We applaud the council's effort to address the affordable housing, but have some concerns. First, the disposition of district land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act of 2013 
proposes a fixed percentage requirement of affordable units in proposed housing developments. While it is a commendable notion that, that would ensure affordable housing units, it would in fact discourage housing development in the district. Real estate development is a for-profit endeavor and builders must create a development, pl development plans that make financial sense to investors and lending institutions. If, if a developer is legislatively compelled to build a fixed number uh, or percentage of affordable units, it is probable that given the per unit cost that such a mandate may render the project financially unattractive to lenders and investors. Developers then would not be able to secure the financing required to build their projects. As I mentioned earlier, almost one-third of the housing produced by DEMPED is already affordable. This approach would intentionally chill the housing development marketplace in the district. It could actually result in fewer affordable housing units. Second, the District of Columbia Affordable Housing Act of 2014 proposes that the district issues $100 million bonds annually for 10 years to provide continual financing for affordable housing. While it would ensure a consistent revenue stream, it would harm other city services that require financing. But more importantly, a billion dollar bond issue would have a negative impact on a district's debt cap, providing to be um, potentially to be financially disastrous. The administration believes that a vibrant district uh, economy will continue to generate the revenue necessary to finance affordable housing. Third, the Affordable Affordable Home Ownership Preservation Equity Accumulation Amendment Act of 2013 proposes substantive changes to how sale units are resold. We are concerned that the legislation provides initial purchasers of affordable units a government subsidized windfall or return on investment. The legislation as written would allow both the initial purchaser to accept the district subsidy to help finance their purchase of their affordable unit and reduces the time for which the unit must remain affordable from 10 to 15 years to a five-year period. After five, year, after five years, once the affordable unit is sold, the unit is no longer required to re remain affordable. The initial purchaser who utilize a district subsidy to buy the unit would be allowed to keep whatever profit they made on the sale. As a result, an affordable unit is lost and a district subsidy was used to generate a profit for an individual, for, for the initial, initial buyer or owner. By shortening the affordability period, the district will get fewer years of affordability per subsidy dollar invested, which over time will result in a net loss of affordable units. Fourth, the Housing Production Trust Fund Baseline Act of 2014 proposes $100 million to the Housing Production Trust Fund each year for affordable housing, and we believe that is not the most fiscally sound approach to securing funding for the program. The mayor has developed over $200 million, over the, uh, dedicated over uh, $200 million over the last two years for affordable housing. The administration was able to do this by weighing the district's existing and projected revenues and expenditures and other district funding priorities and making a um, comprehensive financial analysis. By evaluating the economic needs of the district, every year we are able to avoid disrupting funding of other existing services and in this case allowed us to secure more district dollars for affordable housing. Finally. Housing Assistance Program for Unsubsidized Seniors Act of 2013 creates a $5 million fund to subsidize low-income seniors that are occupying housing absorbing more than 35% of their income. We believe that this is a matter that should be addressed by DCHA. In closing, we appreciate the Council's commitment and attention to the continued development of affordable housing, and DEMPED looks forward to assisting Council with legislation in any way we can. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, your testimony, and thank you all for your testimony. Let me start with you, Mr. Ross. Um, you basically provide some suggestions that would make uh, the bill about the, uh, especially the CFO's role in evaluating um, projects um, in the, the disposition of district land for affordable housing amendment act. Uh, specific, specifically saying um, that the council should should speak to the off-site question um, as as is your analysis with inclusionary zoning is that correct okay and uh, just make sure it's um, we're clear on if it applies to buildings that have residential units only that's correct is that right okay yes. 
Um, and I think we hear you loud and clear on the lottery uh, bond question, Mr. Barnett, and we uh, uh, appreciate your um, testimony on that. And those are those are really my questions. Do you have any questions for the CFO staff? Um, no, thank you. Thank you very much. The remainder of my questions will be for the deputy mayor. So if you have to take off, I'll feel free to do so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so first of all, let me just, um, we've had this conversation before probably in some of your oversight hearings uh, regarding a, a mandate for percentage of units of affordable housing on district land. Um, and I don't have to tell you, it is an issue that comes up with every single uh, surplus and disposition action uh, that the council takes uh, and how much uh, affordability is, is in the project. Um, I recently kind of talked about one that the council actually hasn't received yet, but it, it put me in the mind of what a lot of district residents are thinking about when we talk about McMillan, for example. I know you've been working uh, for some time on that. Um, and the, the iterations of the proposal have, uh, have changed over time. Uh, but in one case, they come and they have no parks. Next time they come back, they have six acres of parks. One iteration no. is no senior building. Uh, then there is a senior building. And some in the community don't care about a senior building. They care about parks. And other people care about uh, historic preservation. So in all of this, um, we, we have um, decisions to make about the best use of the, that land. It's our land. Um, we want it to be developed um, in, its, in its best use. And we want all manner of our um, goals as a city uh, to, be, to be met by that one land disposition. Um, and so what this bill um, says is because uh, quite a lot of people and members of the council said to me, there's no way that that land can be disposed of with 10% affordability or even 20% affordability. Um, so how do, how do we get to a, a level of affordability um, that will be in the best interest of the District of Columbia? So that's one project. Uh, then you'll go to another project and a, a whole different set of um, considerations or community um, questions um, will be asked. So what this bill proposes is to say no matter what those can, other questions are about park space or historic preservation or retail, whatever the case may be, um, that if the district is to uh, dispose of its land, then at least 30% uh, in the case of um, a district land near Metro stations and 20% in other cases will be allocated for affordable housing. And your testimony is that that will just chill, not in fact um, create more affordable housing. Tell, tell me why, um, if you say uh, that we have um, produced in, in most of our projects those levels of, affordal, of affordability. And indeed we have. Yes. So if that's true, why would it be chilling to say that we must? Because it varies from site to site. Okay. Market conditions vary from site to site. Values vary from site to site. Every one of those market conditions affects the pro forma. The, the rents that you can get on one piece of property in Northwest differ very differently from a, a parcel in Southeast. It's, 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 it's almost that simple. What, what we find is that, I mean, the way that we view our job is we're fiduciaries. And it, you've, you've given us a charge uh, through the laws and through the regulations to maximize um, these benefits to the community. And in, um, in our effort to do that, you know, we've been very fortunate in that we've been able to, you know, generate in 30 plus percent, um, you know, over, over the portfolio that we currently have, producer under construction. That's pretty amazing. Um, but it's because we are able to adjust to the market conditions. Um, what this does is it really removes that flexibility. Um, and I'll let Jeff speak to him, you know, more specifically on how it could affect the pro forma, how it could affect the net operating income, what that does to your ability to finance the project. Um, and that, that really is what's at the end of this, is that your ability to finance it uh, by a financial institution. Um, and, be, and because of these varying conditions, we have some projects that are 60% affordable. We have some projects that are 10% affordable. Uh, but on the average, we have fallen in the range of 30%. What you know, if you if you did want to do something like this, I, I think that the 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 more the more flexible approach and one that would be market responsive would 
would would be to maybe if 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 you felt like you absolutely had to set a number really to, to set it on an annual basis for the whole portfolio and what we do as opposed to one site because when we do it to one site you totally you totally disregard the market and unfortunately in the United States or fortunately or however you want to look at it we're a market-based economy and that's that's how we function that's how we produce everything so do you not think it's in the best interest of the city to have affordability at every site? Uh, absolutely not. That is not what I said. I, no, I, I, I'm I, asking. I, I yeah. wasn't. Yeah, no, no, was absolutely. No, we believe, that, look, we believe that affordable houses is absolutely essential for the District of Columbia. That's why we're number two in the country. No, I mean per site. Per site. Some affordability? Yes. Yes, on every site. Yeah, I okay. do believe that's true. Okay. I mean, there's, there's affordability at, at city center. That's got to be like the nicest location that you can be in in the city if you have an affordable unit. Um, so we, yes, we absolutely believe that, but we believe it should vary by site, but on a on a on an aggregate basis. Give us an aggregate parameter. Say on an annual basis, Dimpit, this is your job to produce thirty percent affordable across your portfolio, and then we're working to a goal, and we're able to work with the markets. If we if we if we say every parcel, that's going to totally change how we get our work done and it's going to change the market conditions and it's going to create some situations where you it's not feasible to do it I don't think you could have done 30 percent affordable at City Center how many percent affordable do we have at City Center? what's the percentage of Metroid no. <laughs> how, okay, just remind me of the total number of units also. Um, it's it's 20 percent of the apartments are affordable uh, approximately 92 units. There are 92 total units? Uh, no, 92 affordable units. What are the, okay, so about 456. 456 total. units. Yeah. And, that, and that ranging from what percent? 60 and 80. 60 and 80 Half percent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. At 20%. So actually, that would meet the requirements of the bill. At 20%? Well, well no, that, because that's close no, to a metro. So, yeah, but, it um, well, yeah, almost. You said 30%. Well, that's close to metro, but the, the the other part, the lower end of the, uh -huh. the scale, would be twenty percent um, in non-metro state or tra uh, what does the bill say? TO TODs metro Trans metro <laughs> metro station areas. Okay. Um, so we're not; it's not that far off, actually. Yeah, if, that's if a great site. That's a great site. Okay. Yeah. What are the not great sites for affordable oh, housing? <laughs> I can't do that. Then I'll be talking about parts of the city, and people will be offended. <laughs> Well, let me ask this way, because and there was a, another example that was raised a little bit earlier where um, you selected a developer to build at Fifth and I, mm -hmm. yes. and I think that proposal includes affordable housing, mm -hmm. just not at Fifth and I. Mm -hmm. So the, that, in, in, using that example, it would meet your criteria of producing affordable units on an aggregate basis over your portfolio. Um, it wouldn't, however, I think, uh, meet some other principles that were imp important to us about how we mix incomes across the city. Mm -hmm. So it's, what is the case with, with, that, with that selection, um, <laughs> that there will be affordability on the site or um, where it would be someplace else? The, the affordability will be off the site and unlike city center, which was a nice big site, and where you could maximize returns to the city and you could do a nice, you know, 20% affordable on the site. This is a very small site. And in order to maximize the yield from the site, to provide the funding for parks in the community, some, some park renovations in the community that people have asked for, um, and actually to really respond to the market um, for, um, for, for condos in that area. Um, these are the, all the factors that come into play um, in that transaction. But that's why you can't just have a blanket answer for, for, each, for every site in the city. But, but, but for clarity, the, the developer that, uh, that we have chosen had the largest number of absolute units of affordability proposed, even though they are off-site. And I think this also speaks to the Deputy Mayor's um, point about um, having a chilling effect. Of the four proposals that we shortlisted on that site, two were residential proposals which had some, which had some affordable housing on site, one was an office proposal, and one was a hotel proposal. And I raise that because not every, if you start having affordability being the primary objective, you'll start getting alternative uses 
on the sites, like an office building, which, which in that in the case of the office proposer, did have some money dedicated to HTPF, um, HPTF, excuse me, um, but again, did not have affordable housing on site. So, in in your view, is is it just as good to get those units someplace else as it is to have the the affordability mixed across the city? Well, you, our goal is to our goal is to utilize the site in a way that it would respond to community needs. That's really what we focus on. I mean, each site is, I mean, to develop a s site in Shaw is very different from developing a site um, at Minnesota Benning. It, it just is, and, and, and we all know that. And every community asks for different things, and what we try to do is respond to the things that they're asking for. If they are looking for retail services, um, like there's a site we're working on right now, they're, they're looking for retail services, and they want affordable housing. So we have a mix of retail services and affordable housing. So what, what we try to do is respond to the market as much as possible. But our overall goal is to produce as much as we can with the dollars that we have and the land value that we have. And that's what we are constantly working with in our transactions. So your, your opposition is not really a, with the, the number. Um, it's no. with having a mandate at all. N no, mandate at a site. At a site. That's at all. the problem. Okay. It not the number. It's a, it's obviously a reachable goal. We're reaching it right now, and this is probably. I hope it doesn't get any tougher than this to develop affordable housing. I know some of the guys behind me and from the, um, you know, from the uh, the task force, you know, know how hard it is now. If it gets harder, it's going to be, uh, you know, very difficult going forward. But you know, we're producing over thirty percent now, and we believe we can do that across the portfolio across the city. But when you put it on every site across the city, it changes the, the dynamics in a, in a big way. So when you say you're producing over 30% now, over what period of time um, are, do, are the projects you're including in that, in that number? Yeah. Um, so the... So they're currently... Um, either completed or under construction since January 2011, 5,971 units of affordable housing. Okay, so since that, since 2011, 30% mm -hmm. of those units are affordable at 80%, I'm assuming, or less. No, the, all these, all, these are all affordable? Yeah. Yeah, these are all affordable. Yeah. These are all affordable units we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. yeah, these are all affordable units. The only numbers I gave you were affordable units. My apologies. I got it. Our, 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 our aggregate number is actually much higher. Okay. So I, I guess the sense that I'm trying to get is when did the government dispose or invest in, in these in these units? Over what period of time? Just to give For the last, you know. th these that I'm talking about in this 5,971, this is over the last... Um, Three, three and a half years. Yeah. Three and a half 40, 42 years. Okay. Months. 42 months. And so your suggestion um, is to look at a year's worth, which goes up and down of how many yeah, units right. will, well, not really units now. What we'd be talking about is how many agreements would be made um, from year to year. Um, you, yeah. The, you know, the way you could do it is you can do it by what's under construction and what's in the pipeline. Because what's in a pipeline, and I, the, I didn't talk about the pipeline. There's about 6,000 pipeline units in the affordable pipeline. That's, that's, those are the ones that are coming. That first group, 5,900 plus, that's completed or under construction in the last 42 months. The 6,000 going forward, that's, that'll probably happen over the next 36 to 48 months. So those are all affordable. Those okay. 10, yeah, those 10,000 that we're trying to do by 2020. Okay, so let me um, move on to talk about, um, I, I think, your comments about the baseline and the affordable housing um, production trust fund um, issues were, um, were self-explanatory. And I'm going to turn to you in a second in response. Um, let's talk about the Affordable Home Ownership Preservation and Equity Accumulation Amendment Act of 2013. Um, and I think you are aware of, of the problems that um, have been described here. 
in uh, the ability for the subsidized units and uh, the, the hard time that um, many people are having in selling those units because of the restrictions. Um, if you don't support that change, how, how do you think we can uh, make it easier to make those units um, appealing to people in those distressed, uh, so-called distressed areas? I have not sat down and figured out a solution, but that is something we would love to work on. Um, we'd love to work on that with the advocates um, so that we could come up with something that actually meets all of our needs. Um, the city has a goal of maintaining as much affordability as possible for as long as possible. You know, they talk about five years and 15 years. You know, we have some covenants on property for 30 years plus. I mean, we, you know, we're the city. We have to think of the long term. Um, and, you know, those time frames, those five-year time frames are, <laughs> are very short and, are, and, and erode our ability to produce what you've asked us to produce. So, but I'd love to sit down with them and talk about a program design that would actually function. I know they have one in Maryland um, that has functioned for years. I helped design it back in the, you know, early uh, 2000s. Um, they have one in Baltimore City um, that works very effectively. So we could just look at what they've done and use those. Their as covenants best practices. on them for yeah. long-term covenants. No, they're they're not long-term covenants. Actually, mm -hmm. they're shorter than ours. Mm -hmm. um, but. But they're different. They, they've they've designed. They use different money. <laughs> I mean, because you know, a lot of this has to do with the source of capital and then how you use that capital. Okay. And has the, has DHCD been participating in this with the with uh, the housing? Um, have you? With the housing task force. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and so this is a, we'll continue to have this, I mean, I think when I started this conversation, um, I didn't, I, it, I hadn't been convinced that any changes were needed. Mm -hmm. But I think listening to a lot that we've heard from people who are trying to sell these units in various places, um, but they're not moving, then we have to figure out why and how we can make some adjustments mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to those programs. Um, let me turn to you for a second, Ms. I mean, for your round, Ms. Bonds, and I'll have some other questions. Thank you very much. I guess I was listening to intensely, so uh, <laughs> trying to keep up. I'm concerned about this equity accumulation amendment, but okay. Um, I guess you, 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 um, Mr. Hopkins, you mentioned that since. 2011, the number of affordable units that have been created, 5,971. Oh, under construction. Com uh, under construction, or under construction. Is an additional six. No, 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 that's in the pipeline. Okay, I see, so yeah. the 5,971 are not completed units, they're in construction. They're completed or under construction. We could give you oh, the exact okay. count of the split if you'd like. Okay, all right. Okay. And then the rest are in the pipeline. Okay. It's a pipeline business. That's uh, okay, I guess what I really wanted to get to is one of the issues that concerns me the most, and that is the, uh, again, a number. Mm -hmm. The number that are 30% below AMI, 30%. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you have a approximate number of this 5,971. We could actually give you that number, sure. That would be very you know, helpful. So we'll send you the split between completed yeah. and, and under construction, right. and we'll send you the specific numbers on 30% below MAMI. Okay, that would be very helpful sure. because, again, the one of the biggest issues is what's happening to that population. And mm -hmm. we're trying very hard to keep as many people from the homeless status Agreed. Um, and trying to move them up. Um, not to say that those who um, have subsidy at the 80% AMI aren't needed. Definitely they are needed. But just trying to figure out what that number is that we have to The most vulnerable with. is what we're talking about. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, I, I guess that's really more of where I was. Um, and I, I hear what you're saying about instead of setting the affordable um, rate based on uh, uh, a number that we need to look at it on an annual basis, as opposed to saying that the affordability has to be 
10 percent of all production that it should be on an annual basis. I, I, mm -hmm. I think I understand that. Across but the I, whole portfolio. Okay, yeah. across the portfolio. Well, okay. I, I did want to ask about Fifth and I Northwest. I know that it's the hotel. Mm -hmm. It's a hotel site. Okay. Now, in this hotel site, um, and this is sort of a creative way of using the requirement of, of having that type of having the zoning and having the requirement for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, foresee that this is going to be used on a regular basis? And I'm asking because it seems to me if I were a developer and there was a prime piece of land and I wanted to develop it and talk about affordability, I would develop the land and I would continue to create my affordable housing over, let's say, as the mayor calls it, east side or east of east the river. river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, just wondered, do you see this as a new way for us in the city? No. Um, I just think this is a unique solution. And we have people coming up with creative solutions all the time for projects. Um, and I think that the demand for land in downtown um, kind of forces this discussion because the, the highest the highest yielding land use in downtown is probably office with some retail. Um, and that use is not the most desirable. So what we do is we use our land to leverage to get other things out of that land. Um, Northwest One, um, which is where uh, quite a bit of uh, affordable housing will be developed, um, is, is slated uh, primarily um, for um, affordable housing. So it won't matter what the developer is thinking in that case because that's what we're going to do there. That's the new community's land, so we're going to use it that way. So some places are already, you know, there's a, it, they couldn't even offer that kind of solution. This just happens to be one where, you know, they could. You you mentioned it. I it's a very small site it. too. You you mentioned Northwest One. Yes. And you mentioned um, you know Fifth and K. Fifth and I. Directly. Yes. Fifth and I. And um, I just wanted to ask a question because I've gotten this. From I didn't mention Fifth and K. Fifth, I know, fifth and but. I. You know, K I. You thought of you know, K. It's well, right you there. thought of K when it's I said right I. It's right there. It's right there. How about J? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know we would rather talk about J, but K is the issue. Just for my edification, I, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know: um, Are we thinking um, when we think about the moving Pepco? Of course, mm -hmm. it'll be three years, according to years. them, yeah. four years. But we also are saying we're developing. Uh, those 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 plots down there mm -hmm. into um, housing mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. and yeah. if, have we thought about what that may seem like and what people are talking about that live there now who want to live there and what it will be like uh, later um, the issue of uh, Pepco and the wires and the power and the effects it might have on families and young children just wondering if you've gotten that kind of feedback. I'm getting emails like that, so I wondered if you had gotten that, that isn't the feedback I've gotten. Not about that site. All right. No, that's not, this that's is where the garden, we're talking about the garden. It's yeah. now called the garden. Yeah. yeah. So you haven't received no, any I haven't received any no feedback complaints. like that. No, I haven't received that. No, I receive complaints all the time. <laughs> I haven't received that comment. All right. Yeah. All right, we'll go back to um, affordable housing and the bills that we have. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. McDuffie. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, for being here, uh, as well as your team. I appreciate all the work you all are doing, and I understand. I haven't read any articles yet, but I understand we, uh, we'll be losing you at some point uh, soon. Yes. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, I do want to chat, and I was, I was in my office in a meeting, and uh, it was hard for me to focus because you were on the television, and I wanted to hear what you were saying. So I caught just the tail end of your testimony, but I wanted to turn your attention to the uh, Bill 20-594, Disposition of District Land for Affordable Housing Amendment Act. And I, and I heard you mention that you didn't have a problem with the goals necessarily. You had a problem with the mandate to do it at certain on locations? A, on, a, on a piece on every site. Okay. Can that, you just expand upon that? Just, and if yeah, you're that, repeating that, yourself, I apologize yeah, to my that, colleagues. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so b basically, like right now, our, our if you look at our whole development portfolio and you look at the res residential units that we're producing, we're producing over 30 percent 
um, of those units are affordable units right now. Okay. Okay. And um, that's because we have flexibility. That's because we can do 20% of this site, we can do 60% of that site, we can do 30% of that site. And those, those um, really are market dynamics at play um, when we are able to do that. If you say you have to do it on every site, you change the dynamic on that site specifically. And you get kind of two responses. One, people avoid the use in total. They go to, as, as Jeff was pointing out earlier, they go to office use, they go to a retail use, they go to some other use that doesn't require residential on the site. And then, um, or um, you get people that just don't even bid on it because they know they can't finance it. And all of this has to do with financing because the net operating income drives the amount of financing that you can get out of any transaction. It's, it's, it's the number that all banks and everybody looks at. It looks, it's, it's what the, the institutions look at when they're buying property. They, they, they run it off of NOI and that's how they value it. Um, so that net operating income becomes an extremely important number. And what you're saying is that you're going to force that on every a, a certain um, kind of restraint on every site. But to look across the whole portfolio makes a lot of sense because you get all the dynamics of all the markets in the city and you allow us to do the negotiating and allow flexibility in the community to get the things that they want because the community doesn't always want a lot of affordable housing. Actually, we have some very interesting comments about yeah, affordable you're housing. You're probably right, but I think that's where the, sort of the leadership in, in, in the role of government comes in. Though. Perhaps there are some communities that don't want affordable housing, but mm -hmm. perhaps it's, it's important to make sure even in those cases that uh, we have affordable housing where it's 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 important to have it throughout the city. I guess my mm -hmm. concern is well, I'm agree with that. is that if we are producing the numbers of affordable housing, which I'm sure we are that you state, uh, I'd be interested to know where we're producing it. Like we're parts we, of the city. We can see it on map. It's all over the city. It's wonderful. We're just talking about the city center. I'm going to hold you to that. Can we get yeah. a map before? That's easily. Before that, that's easy? easily done. That'd be awesome. Uh, that's easily I'd done. Love to see that because it's, I mean, I like to be able to look at people and say, look, the deputy mayor says we produce more than thirty percent, which is phenomenal, and here, and here are, are the locations of it. Yeah, uh, because that's important. I tell you what raises concerns to me though when we say sure. that. In a, in a parcel district on land, we're not going to do any affordable housing on this site. We're going to do it off-site. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do it perhaps somewhere that's not even closely related to a site where well, a site that's changing rapidly in the city. And I think that raises concerns. And I think, I think even at the mayor's uh, citywide town hall a couple of years ago, affordable housing was the number one concern that was raised mm -hmm. by residents. Yeah. And I think our efforts with some of these bills is to try to address that. Now, obviously, you all are real estate experts, which is why we want to make sure that we understand what you're saying uh, and that we don't try to legislate something that's going to be impractical. I will say that we had a number of uh, great witnesses who testified today, uh, one of whom was, um, I think his name is Jim Campbell, and he asked an important question in his testimony. He said, the key question is whether the set-aside percentages and income targeting required are economically feasible. And I think that's an important question. That's what we're talking about here. So, so if it's feasible, then we should be able to do it. Um, and he said in his testimony, in certain cases, unique site costs, location, or other factors might make it infeasible. Mm -hmm. of course. But he also went on to say those situations can easily uh, can be easily demonstrated, enabling the CFO to certify that it is not feasible to comply in the manner to waive the requirement. Why, why is the waiver requirement not enough to accommodate the concerns that you're raising about the economics of these deals? Uh, it's probably because it goes by deal by deal basis. You know, if anyone's ever sat across the table from bankers and investors as they're looking at your numbers, you know, the first thing they're looking at is you know, what's your net operating income? Are you going to be able to? To pay the debt service, if we provide you the dollars required to build this, to build this development, and if if we mandate that on every site there's going to be 30 percent affordable housing, it, it may not pencil out on every site. And, and I think the operative word though is may not pencil out. So in the deals where it pencils out, let's move forward. In the deals where it doesn't, we have a provision in here that allows the CFO to certify that it's, it's not practical, but also that we're perhaps getting as much affordability out of the project as possible. Right, which is why we operate on on a 30% affordable housing quote-unquote mandate citywide as opposed to site per site per site per site. And the, the example you used about the affordable housing being built somewhere other than at 5th and I, it was because the, 
the goal was to get some affordable housing built out of this development project. And mm -hmm. it didn't pencil out at Fifth and I, but it penciled out somewhere else so that the financiers and the investors said we can do that. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what we did. So I guess then, then, then the question that that begs is, is it more important to get the most affordable housing possible at a site somewhere else, where perhaps it's probably a little bit more affordable already? Or is it more affordable to get less affordable housing at a site where it's least well, I think less I, affordable. I think the question is, do you want affordable housing? If, if, if getting well, you get both. That's not the question. You get both on yeah, both yeah. sides. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so you get both on both sides. You yeah. get more at one site where, quite frankly, it's probably already more affordable. And then you get, you know, with another proposal, perhaps you get less at the site, but you get it at a place where it's it's rapidly becoming unaffordable. So, I, mean, I think that's the question I'm grappling with. And I think, it's, I think it's interesting because you've, you've, you've struck upon one of the complexities of what we do. <laughs> um, and we, we, have, we, have, we had a menu of four responses, and each was very different. And we had to um, evaluate the totality of those responses. And we weren't just looking at the affordable housing. We were looking at the use as well. We were looking at the compensation of the city, the overall return to the city on all of them. And, um, and so we had to look at it beyond just that one parameter. Um, I think Macmillan is an ex excellent example that you and I are both acquainted with. Sure, sure. Um, which is we want to provide affordable housing, but we have community members who want a significant historic, historic preservation sure, absolutely, absolutely. investment, a specific uh, a park investment, a rec center investment. And so those are sort of the balancing acts and the healthy tension we play so that um, affordable housing isn't the only parameter we, we, um, we can use as, as, a, as a metric for making these decisions. And I guess what I'm trying to get at with, with the bill, though, is that what we're saying build affordable housing at, at 20% on district uh, owned land and 30% where it's uh, you know, close to a metro. Uh, and we're saying if the economics don't work, there is a provision that would afford a waiver. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to really, at a practical level, figure out why that's not sufficient to address the concerns that you all had about the economics of affordable housing deals. In some cases, you know, what is it that they're looking at? They're looking at the return, net the operating, net operating, net operating uh, uh, cost, expensive income. Yeah. Um, the net operating income is such and such, just not going to work if we've got to finance it at this rate. Well, there's this waiver provision, which means that you don't have to do it at, at this rate because the deal wouldn't get done. Why can't we just utilize that where the deal is? <laughs> you know, I can't think of a, a, a request for proposal that we've put out where we haven't said we would like you to maximize the affordable housing <laughs> on the site. Um, and you know, we tell them we can't, we're not going to invest any additional district dollars, but certainly to the, to the extent that there is land value that can go against that, uh, that affordable housing to, to create more, we are, we are open to that and we encourage that. Uh, and then we review those, those, um, uh, those responses and the economics of those responses. As I think we are the real estate experts within the district. I mean, we love the OCFO and we think they're terrific, but I think that we're the ones who, who make the decisions based on the totality of the, uh, of the and, and to the extent that we're certifying that, then I think that, that our, our judgment uh, is probably is, is the most accurate. And perhaps you're right. There. I mean, perhaps that's something we can look at in, in, in the legislation. I just don't want to jettison, which I think is a, a great piece of legislation, which, which uh, you know, speaks to a very... Uh, important concern and problem that we have citywide. We've got a city that, that is, is becoming increasingly unaffordable. We know mm -hmm. that's a fact. I mean, we know that housing costs are skyrocketing. At least right now they are. They're skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. And incomes are not keeping pace mm -hmm. with the rising cost of housing. You know that you're building affordable housing yes. uh, at 30% across the board. But, you know, why not do something that essentially suggests that you continue to do that and where it's not feasible, we, we address it with, uh, with the waiver provision. Uh, there might also be an optics issue with, with a developer. Let's say you had a developer who was outside of uh, D.C. and didn't really understand that there's a waiver provision there, and they see a 30% mandate per site, they may just say, you know, we're not even going to participate. So, but, if there's, but if that mandate is not there per site and it's, it's that the district has a 30% overall affordable housing mandate that we try to get out of each project, then at least the developer is going to I'm going to give it a look and 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 and, and produce some performance. And I, you know, I think it'd be helpful when I when I and I, when I, and I take you all at your word, obviously. But but I want to see that map because I want to make sure that that we aren't just saying we're going to build something in this one plot of land and we'll do affordable housing over here, mm -hmm. where it's. I, it's, I understand that. You know what I mean? I'm concerned about that. That too. would be a problem too, right? right. I mean, yeah. I think from from that an outcome from me. <laughs> uh, yeah. and so that that's the issue that I, I, I want to make sure that we're not. Um, sort of headed down that road where it's okay to do 
our market rate uh, on, a, on a, a really expensive piece of land that the district owns if we do more affordable housing at a, at a less expensive place around the corner. Well, and I'm not well, suggesting that you all are well, doing listen, that. I, I tell you, it's interesting because one, one of the projects that I've, I've really enjoyed working on is the, um, is the Oak Street Market project. And one of the reasons why I, I like it so much is that it mixes in generations, it mixes uses in a very creative way. And it's because of the development capacity that they got on a site. If we, if, if we had some kind of trade-off on development capacity at sites, it would, it would create the value where we could probably easily reach, particularly on the high value sites, the, the, you know, this 30% number. But you have to trade value this is this is like a it's, it, it's like when you when you give them that development capacity is actually you're transferring value money mm -hmm. to them so that they can do something actually it's cre it's an extreme way of creating money um, that site it, it, it was done so creatively um, that they were able to build a fully affordable um, I mean the senior senior. Uh, senior housing project that frankly I would just love to live in it's just gorgeous not yet and it <laughs> still. but it sits right on top of a giant right. um, it's a beautiful it's, giant it's, by the isn't way. it beautiful yeah. 75,000 square foot giant dead center of the city it's really fantastic they're completing um, market rate units right across the courtyard from the from the senior project and then they have a hotel on the site it is like the greatest blend, but it's because they got that density. Now, if there could be some density flexibility that goes along with this mandate, it's almost like what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a flexible, what, what I'm talking about right now is not, see, see to me, the world is, is, just, is just not black and white. Actually, my whole life, it's been gray. It's been, it's been between, you know, two lines. So that working with this kind of a dynamic, my first suggestion is how we're doing it right now is across the city. But if you're going to put a mandate on like that, then give it some flexibility. Say, okay, you get additional development capacity. Now, I don't know how that's going to fly with my people that office of planning. And I don't know how well, that's going to fly with some of the, the community members. And I'm well over it's my a time. value exchange. I'm well over my time. But th those are the types of creative um, things that I like to be able to explore as opposed to saying this is, this is not going to work. I'm not suggesting that you no, I haven't read your, no, no, I haven't read your testimony yeah. yet. And I only heard a piece of it. But... Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want people to look at this legislation and say because it has a mandate, it's not workable, it's not feasible, and we can't do it. I want to say we can do it, and if we can't get here with the exact language as is expressly enumerated in the bill, then there's some tweaks we can make to, to, to get to the heart of what we're trying to accomplish here. And that's yeah. to produce more affordable housing on district-owned land, which I think is a worthy goal that we should be able to accomplish. So uh, I, I thank you for indulging me, uh, Madam Chair. No, of course, and um, I thank you. And it, it's, a, it's a kind of a, 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 a kind of it was a policy question posed that I think is important uh, to be real clear about. Uh, the the statement was made: Do we care about affordability, or do we yes. care about affordability everywhere? Yes. Um, and I think, from from my point of view, and I can speak for myself, um, I don't think it's okay that our policy is we're going to have high end, you know, housing here and all of the affordable housing. Agreed. There. Absolutely. Um, with you on and that. so, if I don't think anybody on this that, panel disagrees with you on that. Okay, good. Nobody um, here disagrees except, with that. <laughs> you know, we've you know we've accepted some projects that will do exactly that. You no, know, well, we've accepted some complexities in our market. Okay, and so, but we still have the opportunity, I think, before it comes over to the council to really look at um, if that makes sense. Absolutely, uh, saying that we're gonna we're gonna build this <laughs> here and uh, uh, some other units someplace else. Absolutely, because that would only just start a, a train mm -hmm. of. You believe Other. it'll start a train, yes. Yeah. Do I believe it'll start a train? Yeah. Yes, and you believe it will start a train. I don't think it would. A train of what? Did you know what I was going to say? Yeah, a train of maybe some of these projects happening in other places. Okay, so why don't you believe that? If one developer can say, I'm going to build here um, and do all of the affordable someplace else, what do you think would preclude another person from making that suggestion? I don't think it works on every site. Okay. As a solution. It just happened to work on this site as a solution. So, um, 
Yeah, and I think other people will think it will work, and those are the type of proposals that we'll, we'll get. Now, maybe we accept them, maybe we don't. Maybe we would consider them responsive, maybe we wouldn't. Um, um, it's all in, I guess, how we, how we ask the question. But I, I don't think that's what people have in mind, and um, we are, I, I especially uh, want to present when we're using our land and our investments um, to have it mixed in crumbs across the whole city, mm -hmm. so that's what we will want to do. Um, those are my questions. Do you have any further questions? Yes. Ms. I Bonds, we'll go for another round. Give Ms. Bonds. Thank you very much. I just, I really think we have to continue this because this is a policy issue. Um, I personally am not upset with what you have done because you've explained it as flexibility. I'm not upset, but I am upset. And what I'm upset about is that I don't know the finances, um, and I don't need to know the finances. And when I say I'm upset, it just seems to me that when we um, institute what I would consider a waiver in this situation, um, we're talking now not Fifth and J, uh, we're back to Fifth and I, okay? <laughs> so at Fifth and I, you know, you get this, this arrangement, and, and I'm very sure a hotel there is a great idea, no problem. Um, but in the District of Columbia, almost all of our land is exciting, extraordinary. I don't have the mayor's little card that tells me how many things that we're first in. I think it's like two-sided now. So we're first in everything. Everybody wants to be here. It just seems to me while we have this, you know, this peculiarity in our economy that we should and could mandate certain things. And if we mandate as a policy that we're going to require housing, maybe housing slash community amenities might work, I don't know. And maybe if you, the developer, choose community amenities, it really ends up costing you a little more so that providing affordable housing becomes exciting and you figure out how you can do that. Now, I'm, I'm old enough to have um, been in um, uh, Southwest when um, I think it was Bressler and Reiner uh, put up their buildings and, uh, as developers, and they were very smart. We thought that they were going to um, put up buildings that, and it was required then that they have housing in the buildings. You know what they did? They put um, a unit, a uh, uh, a how, housing unit in each building with a kitchen and the bathroom and what have you and the rest were office building that was many 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 years wow. ago okay and um, uh huh yeah that's what they did and that was when 4th street was closed from you know M up to I okay so they, they, they figured out how to use the law then the law then was broken and my point is uh, I think there's a way for us to implement this policy. And while we have excitement with being in the District of Columbia, I just wish you would look at it from that perspective. And it would be interesting, if you're willing to do that, to come back with some scenarios, some ways in which you think we can do this. Because I agree with my colleagues. This would be very important, very significant to the future growth of the District of Columbia and for our people. Appreciate that. Thank you, and I'm sure the deputy mayor is wishing us good luck in these discussions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, I forgot. <laughs> the best of luck to you. Right, but I know his heart will, um, will be with us and uh, in the deputy mayor's staff um, who will help us um, with, with all of these um, issues. And in, in that, um, if the reports are true, you won't be far. Um, the things That's that right. we do here will affect you where you're going. Yes, they will. Um, <laughs> it will be important. Yes, they will. Uh, that we yeah, have to do this. <laughs> we need to do it, right? Okay. And, and be uh, kind to us. That's the key. Be kind to us. Yeah, I, 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 I work with a lot of Prince George's County officials, and so I, I, I know what they're saying uh, right now. Um, so that being said, um, we've had a very full day of testimony. I want to thank all the public witnesses who really committed a good part of their day um, in coming down to listen to some very um, important affordable housing bills. Um, the committee will turn its attention um, to moving on a number of these bills that, that we've had in 
Building Committee. Um, it sounds, and we got some very good testimony actually today mm -hmm. about things that weren't exactly right or needed some tweaking. Um, and I invite, uh, continue to invite um, that participation um, as we focus on those bills. Uh, so it is now 536 and we're adjourned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.